are recording. I want to welcome, I want to welcome uh, all the board members, staff, and uh, what, whoever in the public is joining us today at uh, our Open Space Board of Trustees annual retreat. We are meeting at the Foothills Nature Center and are looking forward to good conversations throughout the day as well as um, a bit of a walk around uh, to talk about some management issues uh, close by. So with that, um, we look forward to all of our all of your participation and I will return it to Dan and Michelle to run through the agenda. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, just a brief reminder, uh, the trustees appointed uh, Michelle and Brady as a subcommittee to work with me and uh, uh, developing a content for today's retreat. And we've met several times over the course of the past five or six weeks. We reached out to all of you via email several times. And what has developed from that is today's agenda. Um, I'll just do a quick run through. Michelle, uh, please add anything, and then we'll, we're going to turn it oh, over to Dave to do a, a brief icebreaker. And Dave, if you want to just give the board a sense of the question you'll be asking them uh, after we go through the agenda, so maybe people have a few minutes to kind of think about it. Great, thanks. Um, so as a way to kind of begin uh, today's deliberations and meeting, I thought it would be nice if each of us shared a defining experience um, to, uh, that we had uh, a, a memory, uh, a story, or a mentor that influenced um, our view of nature and um, our relationship with the natural environment and, and human communities that resulted uh, or influential on your uh, participation as in the or on the Open Space Board of Trustees. So I thought um, each of us would have three to five minutes uh, to do that. And uh, that will give us kind of, a, I think, a, a nice uh, foundation and then segue into the morning's conversations. So if you haven't uh, thought about it uh, before, um, Please give it a little thought, and once we run through the agenda, we'll we'll do that to set the stage for the rest of the day. Thanks. Great. And the agenda is before you, so we won't go through it in detail. But we have um, several different just topic discussions. So we're going to start off with budget and uh, uh, the role of the board in budget development, and how the board can have a more meaningful, impactful voice in budget development. Uh, that is going to be led by Brady. Michelle will be the facilitator for the second uh, morning session, which will be looking at uh, planning, uh, how the uh, department has traditionally uh, done uh, planning and maybe the future of planning and some different approaches or some things to think about uh, when we think about our planning framework, how we can make our plans more dynamic, um, uh, more of a scalpel approach rather than uh, a, a big comprehensive approach every time. So talk a little bit about some of those uh, those ideas. Uh, we'll get into the rules of procedure, uh, which we do every year um, later this morning. And then we're gonna have a working lunch and we'll talk about the 2024 look ahead. Uh, you all have in your packet a sense from the staff of things we already know are gonna come before the board in some form or fashion. And uh, uh, um, uh, John, Jeff and Janelle, uh, will lead us through that whiteboard sort of brainstorming exercise and prioritization. We're going to do a walk and talk. We're going to get out and walk the uh, uh, trail here where we can look at a wildland urban interface and talk about fuel mitigation uh, and vegetation management in the context of the WUI, that first what 100 feet of private property uh, where we transition from wildland. Uh, and Brian Anaker uh, is going to help to lead that. Um, walk and talk, and then in the afternoon, we're going to get a little bit more, you know, philosophical on you, right? We're going to talk to just a general discussion on a couple of different subtopics. Uh, Herman will facilitate the first one, which will be looking at values and outcomes uh, that are in various documents that we pulled together and see which ones of these resonate with you, which ones are, are of concern for you, looking out. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. And then Dave will wrap it up with uh, we're uh, sort of uh, open discussion on 
on uh, conditions and issues and emerging issues that are that could impact or are impacting open space that need to be adaptive and resilient and just a free flowing conversation that Dave will help us lead through there. And then we're gonna wrap it up. So that's what you have in, we have in store for you today. And with that, I think we'll get back to the, uh, oh, Michelle, did you wanna add anything to that? Um, yeah, just a question about um, the walk and talk. So the entire meeting today is gonna to be on webinar, Zoom webinar is gonna be recorded except for that particular portion. So that um, members of the public are aware of that. Yes, that's a good. That's a good point. And that is scheduled for, uh, is that 105, 105 to 145 that will be offline. Yes, yes, good point. <laughs> and you can stay muted on that computer. Oh, I can? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm live? You're live. <laughs> okay, I feel alive. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I also wanted to add my thanks uh, to Michelle Brady and Dan um, as the subcommittee who uh, crafted today's meeting agenda. I, I think it's ex an excellent agenda and I'm looking forward to uh, some good conversations uh, throughout the day. So uh, thanks again. Uh, we really appreciate the work that uh, you did uh, to, to uh, get this meeting situated. Uh, so again, um, I'm going to start with Michelle, if that's okay. Um, I, what I'd like to talk about is just, you know, kind of give us a little insight to, you know, kind of uh, what, what in your life uh, really was influential as far as uh, your interest in uh, uh, matters like the open space program and what what influenced you as far as uh, wanting to serve on the open space board. So with that, Michelle, you have the distinct honor of leading us off. Um, thanks, Dave, um, for making me go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and then my phone starts ringing, I'm sorry. I thought it was background music. Right? Yeah, me too. Yeah, right. She had more time cool. to prepare. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't fair. <laughs> oh boy. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I moved to the United States um, when I was four years old. And so, you know, as an immigrant um, and, you know, coming from an, you know, uh, an underrepresented population and, um, and you know, also so socioeconomically disadvantaged when I started my life, I feel like I can, um, you know, that my connection with nature and environment didn't happen until so much later. And, and I think that's common for folks who don't have the privilege to, to, um, to recreate, you know, at leisure and enjoy the environment. And so, because a lot of folks who come from the background like mine or, or, or like that, you know, we are heavily focused on the day-to-day -day survival um, and, um, and, and, and recreating is not a top priority. But later in life, I um, it was, you know, went to college, also the first person um, in my family to, to graduate from college. And during that time, I got to explore um, the environment and it all came from something kind of cheesy, you know, being at REI and watching a climbing video and I was like, hey, I could do that. <laughs> and so I signed up for some climbing classes and, um, you know, at a climbing gym in Virginia, I met some um, people who ultimately became my mentors and brought me outside, spent some time in West Virginia, Seneca Rocks and New River Gorge, learning to climb and, and really learn to connect with um, the environment in that way. So climbing was my avenue to becoming, um, an advocate for the environment and um, learning how to, you know, just being outdoors and just appreciating it. And then ultimately learning how to be a steward of the environment. Um, and, you know, that kind of launched me into where I am today, um, 25 years later <laughs> and I'm no spring chicken. Um, but yeah, so I, I think um, during that, period of my life, I, I really started to, to get involved and um, living in, here in Boulder, I feel like, gosh, we have such a privilege um, of just having this amazing open space um, 
you know, and access to it. And, and I just uh, felt like uh, applying to the Open Space Board was a good move for me and a, a way to kind of uh, contribute to this community that we have. Um, in my sort of unique perspective, I, I don't think it's that unique, but um, in uh, the demographics of Boulder, maybe it is. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I really find it to be an honor to serve on this board. And um, and I, I really hope that I'm doing the community a service by representing a certain part of um, the community. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. And we, we appreciate your being on the board as well. Uh, John, do you want to jump in? And... Sure. Happy to jump in. So, uh, some of you may not know about me. I, I was a longtime Boy Scout. I'm actually an Eagle Scout. Um, so I grew up doing a lot of camping with the Boy Scouts, and that was where I first kind of learned to really appreciate nature um, and just being out in it. Um, you know, a lot of what the Boy Scouts teaches is around, you know, valuing nature and respecting it. And uh, it wasn't until I really got to go to Philmont Scout Ranch in New Mexico. It's 140,000 acres of wilderness um that you backpack across for like 10 days um just out in the middle of nowhere um that I really uh gained an appreciation for you know how amazing it could be to you know maintain these natural areas to go out and be among um I'm constantly reminded of it um you know whenever I'm hiking out on the open space trails I think back to my time um in Philmont you know hiking through the mountains of New Mexico um, and it always takes me back. So that, that's kind of my route in terms of uh, having an appreciation for open space and nature. So sorry, I know that was probably like 45 seconds. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a man of few words, Dave. Yeah. Well, I'm Get this back on the agenda. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll make a Q and A, shall we? Yeah. I was going to say I'm going to ask you a question. So uh, you still have a little more time. So how old were you when you were at Film High? Uh, I think I was 16. Yeah, so I was 16 when I went to Philmont. So, so that was a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> a couple. A couple years ago. A couple right. years ago. Five years ago. Well, well good. Uh, I think uh, I've actually been there as well. And I, I think that uh, that has served uh, a, a lot of people um, in creating both an understanding and appreciation of the natural world, um, mainly in the, uh, the masculine uh, part of the population, but also I, I do think the, uh, the uh, Girl Scouts uh, have an equally important programs um, and opportunities as well. So uh, it's been a real uh, a positive experience for many, many people throughout the years. Brady, uh, yes. you're next. Okay, should I turn my camera on for this? Yes, please. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, I've had a lot of great mentors through my life. I've been super lucky. And, um, but I'm gonna choose one uh, to talk about today. Uh, Charles Wilkinson, he, his memorial service at the Environmental Law Center, which is named after him, uh, was this weekend. And uh, one of the great honors of my career was getting to work with Charles on uh, Bears Ears National Monument in the death of the, the proclamation there. And so I learned a few things. Well, I learned a lot from Charles. Um, at the time, I was working on climate issues and historic, and he was working with the Intertribal Coalition. And historically, there had been conflict between the two entities, the two groups, um, these sovereign nations, and a bunch of yahoos who wanted to use public <laughs> lands, basically. And um, he just he developed a relationship with me. I was running the Access Fund at the time. We had lunch. I brought climbing gear to the lunch. He was really kind and open, and he ended up uh, setting up a meeting between the climbing community and the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition outside of um, Moab. And we all sat down and we ate together and we talked. And I'm used to when when working on policy issues, I'm used to like yeah, okay, you know, bullets, and we're going to have um, action items, and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And at the end of the whole thing, he's like, Brady, you know what I think we should do? I was like, no, what, what, Charles? He's like, I think we should both write a letter to the Secretary of Interior and just say nice things about each other. And that was it. That was the action item from the whole thing. And initially, I was like kind of disappointed and astounded. And we did our best in the climbing community to say nice things about the Travel Coalition and our support of their agenda. 
And the letter that they produced under his guidance, I have no doubt, was one of the most beautiful moving pieces of writing I've ever been party to. And, uh, and I think it had an impact on the overall outcome of the proclamation. And one of Charles's beliefs was that uh, beauty and great writing has a place in, in environmentalism and management, and in, even in legal documents. That in the Wilderness Act of 1964 was this beautiful piece of writing. And he was uh, heavily involved in Grand Staircase Escalante, which is also a beautiful piece of writing. But a lot of environmental documents are mind-numbingly boring. And, and he actually thought that was a problem. And so he tried to bring humanity to his work and beauty, even to crafting policy. And I thought that was just such a beautiful approach. And I had just that little overlap with him. That was one of the great honors of my career. Thank you very much. Um, would you be able to share that letter with the Open Space Board? Of course, yeah. I think uh, we would all benefit from uh, from seeing that. And and I just want to echo what Brady said as far as uh, the importance of Charles Wilkinson, who lived here wor uh, for a long time and worked, uh, obviously, at the uh, University of Colorado Boulder Law School. But uh, he was an icon, uh, uh, one of the one of the great spokespeople and writers of the environmental movement. Um, published uh, several important books, uh, was instrumental working with the Native Americans on uh, issues of concern uh, to them. And uh, as Brady said, was, was just a great guy. And uh, we, we are saddened by uh, his passing and uh, it's a great loss uh, to both the environmental community and, and to the country. So thanks again. Carmen, uh, luckily you're up. Okay. <laughs> well, before I, I talk about um, a different person, I, I was toying with um, talking about Charles too. He, um, I took two classes with Charles in law school and we uh, became really good friends. And uh, he was a great mentor to me too. And I remember uh, sitting in his office, I'd often go to his office to, just chat and kind of bask in his care um, and his his appreciation and his mentorship and he's just such a great guy and and uh, I always called him Professor Wilkinson and he said Harmon, it's time to start calling me Charles, which was while well, he still had one of you know a class with me in it and a grade to dispense, um, you know so that was he came from a different time, and uh, and I I always appreciated that, so I I really miss. Him a lot too. Um, but I'll pick a different mentor for me. Uh, when I was in planning school at the University of Pennsylvania, um, the old man of, of the department um, was a guy named Ian McHarg. Mm -hmm. And Ian McHarg had um, founded the field of ecological planning and helped to start the first Earth Day in 1970. And at a time when public intellectuals were actually um, valued. And, uh, and famous and had a platform. He had a television show on CBS in primetime called Man in the Environment, um, in which he interviewed important people, um, important thinkers, and talked to them about environmentalism, which in 1966, you know, wasn't exactly on a lot of people's minds. So it really helped change people's consciousness. And in 1968, he wrote the book Design with Nature, mm -hmm. which, um, which changed the, created the field of ecological planning and changed the world from a planners and landscape architects perspective. And it didn't hurt that he was six foot four and he looked and sounded exactly like Sean Connery um, <laughs> and uh, been a you know, decorated soldier for you know, the army in, in England in World War II. Um, he was a huge personality and he, he was also a, uh, more than just an academic, he founded Wallace McCarg Roberts and Todd, which was a landscape architecture and planning firm that did big projects like Inner Harbor in Baltimore um, that you know people all over the world have seen, and um, and for various reasons he run afoul of the university um, and uh, and kind of went off into the wilderness for about fifteen years. And then when he came back, he taught this class that was like story time with Uncle Ian. It wasn't really a difficult class. It was really just him, you know, mm -hmm. helping people understand what. Um, you know, what he'd been trying to teach the world for his whole life. 
and, uh, and somehow, uh, 23 years old or whatever, I became the teacher's pet. And we would go to have, we'd go to La Terrasse, this French restaurant after class, and he would order a bottle of Chardonnay and a, a hanger steak and some fries. So it was a steak frites kind of um, French meal. And we would just sit there talking about the future of, of ecological planning together. I've been interested in, in nature and the environment, um, but I've always all mentors and I wanted to remember Dave McCarthy today. Thank you very much, Harmon. I, I'm going to echo that as well. Dave McCarthy uh, was a lion in the environmental movement and um, for us to uh, have an association with him and, and people like Charles Wilkinson and others, uh, I think is not only a testament to each of us individually, but also to the, the community of Boulder that um, there, there are a lot of uh, really um, important people that uh, are living here or have lived here. Um, that's, that speaks well to this place and to what we're trying to do. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, another um, lion of the environmental movement, and that's Oliver Leopold. Um, and just as a little background, uh, he, he wrote a seminal book, uh, the San County Almanac, that was published in 1948. Um, and he died, actually, before this book was published, uh, fighting uh, a fire on uh, his neighbor's, it was a grass fire on his neighbor's farm. Um, it had been a control burn and they got out of control and uh, he didn't, he didn't, he was not burned in the cause of his death. He, uh, people think he had a heart attack and the fire kind of moved over him. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, he died before this book actually was published. But in 1948, actually, that's when I was born. And so uh, he worked at the University of Wisconsin, set, uh, set up the wildlife ecology or wildlife management program, um, was, a, was a prominent, preeminent uh, ecologist and writer. And uh, my dad worked there as well and actually knew Leopold, um, although not worked with him. But when I was a kid, I saw this book on my parents' bookshelf. And when I was 12 years old in 1960, I remember picking up and starting to read a Sand County Almanac. And I really related to it because it was all about places that I was very familiar with and actually lived in, which is central Wisconsin. And I couldn't believe a person, you know, would write about things like that that so resonated with me. And so that's kind of the, the beginning of my interest and actually love uh, for the environment. And there's an essay in here that I'm going to read part of as, as part of my contribution today um, that has uh, really resonated with me and has also uh, spawned a, a number of books titled that and, and numerous essays. And um, I, I think as my uh, tenure on this earth is coming to a close, uh, it it makes uh, this actually come full circle and uh, it's important to me and I think um, uh, all of you would appreciate it as well. Um, and in 1966, the book, this, the San County Almanac was uh, republished and his son, um, Luna Leopold, who is a prominent a hydrologist that works, worked for the United States Geological Survey, actually um, was the person that uh, handled the, the uh, republication. But in the introduction to the republication, I just want to read a couple of sentences because it, I just read them yesterday. It's like, whoa. So here's what Luna Leopold said as an introduction to Aldo Leopold's book. Of all the causes that attract the attention of these young people, Oh no, let me begin. The generation of all Leopold's grandchildren is rebelling on college campuses, demonstrating and working for social causes and fighting on foreign soil. Now this was 1966. So the fighting on foreign soil was Vietnam. This same youth is maturing at the moment of time, which is pivotal in the struggle to preserve things wild and free that all Leopold understood so wisely and expressed so eloquently. 
Of all the causes that attract the attention of these young people, the play of nature is one which may be truly a last call. Things wild and free are being destroyed by the impersonality of our attitude toward the land. What better way to fight the destruction of nature than to place in the hands of the young this powerful plea for a land ethic? It struck me that, you know, we're in a similar period uh, today as well. And those words um, mean a lot uh, to us uh, today. The essay I'm going to read just a part of just for a couple minutes is called Thinking Like a Mountain. And uh, it uh, was written around in the 1920s, so it's over 100 years old. Uh, this book was published in 1948, so it's 75 years old. And I venture to say that it could have been written today. A deep chesty ball, ball, that means cry, not ball. <laughs> Echoes from rimrock to rimrock, rolls down the mountain and fades into the far blackness of the night. In an outburst of def wild defiant sorrow and of contempt for all the adversities of the world, every living thing and perhaps many a dead one as well pays heed to that call. To the deer it is a reminder of the way of all flesh, to the pine a forecast of midnight scuffles and of blood upon the snow, to the coyote, a promise of gleanings to come. To the cowman, a threat of red ink at the bank. To the hunter, a challenge of fang against bullet. Yet behind these obvious and immediate hopes and fears, there lies a deeper meaning, known only to the mountain itself. Only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of a wolf. Those unable to decipher the hidden meanings know nevertheless that it is there, for it is felt in all wolf country and distinguishes that country from all other land. It tangles in the spine of all who hear wolves by night or who can scan their tracks by day. Even without sight or sound of wolf, it is implicit in a hundred small events. The midnight whinny of a pack horse, the rattle of rolling rocks, the bound of a fleeing deer, the way shadows lie under the spruces. Only the uneducable Tyro can fail to sense the presence or absence of wolves or the fact that mountains have a secret opinion about them. My own conviction on this score dates from the day I saw a wolf die. We are eating lunch on a high rim rock at the foot of which is a turbulent river, which a turbulent river, river <laughs> elbowed its way. We saw what we thought was a doe fording the tor torrent, her breast awash in white water. When she climbed the bank toward us and shook out her tail, we realized our air, it was a wolf. A half dozen others, evidently grown pups, sprang from the willows and all joined in a welcoming, welcoming melee of wagging tails and playful mullings. What was literally a pile of wolves wreathed and tumbled in the scent, writhed and tumbled in the center of an open flat at the foot of our rim rock. In those days, we had never heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim a steep downhill shot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into impassable slide rocks. So this is this next paragraph is really what uh, I think is important. We reached that old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. So thank you all. Uh, appreciate uh, all of those insights and uh, what a great way to start. So. Um, Dan and Michelle and Brady, I'm going to turn it back to you and we'll begin. Yeah. Our, oh, go ahead. You it's want hard to hard transition. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about the budget. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, I just also want to say, Dave, uh, you look healthy as a horse. I think you got a few years left. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hopefully that's true. <laughs> Our first uh, topic is the agenda, and Brady, you're going to facilitate yeah. this next session, and we have a, a short presentation to lead off, but Brady, if you want to maybe well, yeah. open it up. Uh, it, I think it does. I, I, well, I just thank you for that, Dave. I think it's it's nice 
to connect with some art and beauty and to get us kind of centered. And so I appreciate that reading very much. And um, yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, the, the agenda kind of speaks for itself. The purpose of this session is to try to get a little, some clarity between the board and the staff and, and, and maybe reflect on, we may not solve everything today, but maybe reflect on it, figure out what we can agree on and, and maybe come up with some action items. Uh, related to how this board can have a more meaningful and influential input and feedback on the staff's budget proposal. And I think a big part of that is like, what is our right and proper role? Uh, this is my first public board. Um, I've been on a lot of nonprofit boards and been around uh, for profit boards. And uh, I'm used to being a fiduciary, and I don't think that's quite the role that I have now. And so it's, I think, you know, hopefully this is more than just my own education. But, but getting really clear about what our responsibility is and how we can best execute that. Um, and then I think another thing, and this is something that uh, is, you know, what's the, the six year vision for our capital expenditure, so called CFP? Um, we'll see if we get there. Yes. So. Great. Well, I think we have a short presentation. About half of it will, Lauren will work, uh, and Sam, maybe a supporting role, will uh, work us through, and then Brady's. Uh, uh, going to wrap up uh, the second half of the uh, presentation of some slides he put together. So with that, I'll have Lauren sort of kick us off just for some ground setting. We'll leave most of it today for this hour for conversation. But. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and my name is Lauren Coyne for anybody online, uh, Deputy Director of Central Services. Sam McQueen is here as well as our Budget Senior Manager. Um, and, and that's a great introduction for you. Thanks. So you know, this is a very general guidance um, that we get in our charter language in section 175, which says the board's not going to do anything except these things and gives a very long list of those things. But the budget language that we that we have, which is very broad and open to interpretation, is shall review the city manager's proposed budget as it relates to open space matters. <clears throat> yes. Um, could we just pause? I think yes. you're presenting this is uh, a different so. view. Oh, 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 it might just be for, I think it's frozen. Yeah, you might um, try that to just work. I can, I can share mine. Stop and start mine. again. Do this again. Good catch. So. <laughs> well, I can see, you know, keeping it on. We're still it's doing that, but, oh yeah, now we're going. It's just, yeah. Yeah. There's a little delay. Oh, and it's and then it's uh, not a uh, presentation or an honor. All right. It's showing the long screen. Yeah. We're going to stop and start again. And this is not a, Tech friendly room, so I appreciate the team support oh, yeah. on this. Um, I think we can't make it point into the wrong one. Just go, just go to presentation. Just, yeah, 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 now just switch. Yeah, now just switch to presentation. Yep. And just give it a few minutes. <clears throat> Let's see. It always takes time. Yeah. Oh, it's no, still it's wrong with the show. Yeah. 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 It's not, I can share hmm. it on the Zoom. Here. I mean, it's if you don't mind seeing yeah. the slide preview on the left, we can also proceed. But is it doable? Yeah, I think that's fine. It's, okay, yeah, it is doable. Okay. It's because of the projector, Warren. Yeah. Right. You're, are you plugged in? I'm direct plugged in. But that's why. Oh, uh, okay. I'll share my plug from that. Yeah, I'm going to share with him. Oh. Or or one of us can share. share. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Okay. Here, I'll stop. I'll just follow what you All right, back. Um, so, it, it, and so this is just the, the budget language that we have, right? So you'll review the city manager, the proposed budget as it relates to open space matters and submit any of your recommendations about the budget to council. Um, I've been here eight years now and what that has meant has changed and will continue to evolve. And that's wonderful. I think it's based on the interest and skill set of the board. It's based on where we're at as a department. Um, and for context, the year that I started was uh, right before the budget was due and the board saw it once and it was the night you voted on it. And that's not a judgment at all. That's that there's a reason that it existed that way. Um, and, and just the types of engagement were different than the actual review of the budget documents, right? So there was one touch. When we came in, we were started, we had just finished West TSA, North TSA was on the horizon. We were starting the master plan and we really wanted to start to expand um, what was presented and what was reviewed by the board and build a different series of touches. And we started to review budget five times a year. So 
the focus at that time was based on the CIP pr predominantly. So we did share the operating budget, but at the time we had just onboarded a new financial system called Munis. And the reporting capability of that system was really around project chartering and project management of capital projects. So you got a packet of 40, 60 pieces of paper that had you know, a project justification, the deliverables, the phasing, the timing, the funding per year. And our ask was really for you to be looking at that project list. That was very useful. I think it was a step towards better budget transparency. And um, you know that's that's a very small percentage of the overall budget and did not take into account CSOs and temps and staffing and ongoing services and all these other things that we wanted to share. So with the adoption of the master plan, bringing on a new work planning system, new financial reporting, we've tried to up level even from that uh, what we're presenting to this group every year when we come to talk about the budget. So um, we try to slice things in many different ways based on the focus areas, the strategies, the tiered investment in the master plan, the citywide um, capital categories, which are enhancement, maintenance, um, new infrastructure acquisition, et cetera. And to really give you the, the broader look at how this policy guidance in the master plan is reflected in the budget. So we still are showing CIP. We're still doing three touches on the CIP compared to two on the operating, um, but we wanted to sort of expand and provide better data and reports to you as you, as you think about what your role in the budget is. So. Um, in the past, guiding questions as we brought the budget to you are things like, do we have the right balance of investments across master plan focus areas? Are we balancing appropriately across the tiered strategies in the master plan? Are there upcoming policy or public engagement plans that inform out your work planning and budgeting? So that has looked um, like the, your, your master plan engagement as we built the CIP section of the master plan talking about how we were gonna invest money um, prairie dogs, um, some specific topic areas that the previous boards have been interested in that have that guided out your planning. And then we've asked, you know, is the OSBT supportive of the proposed project list where we're still giving you that CIP list and asking if you have any um, feedback on that. Can we define out your planning? That's, that's planning that happens outside of regular planning processes, is that what that is? It's really, so the, the goal with the budget is we submit a six year CIP and a one year operating budget. And so when we, as we've worked on our, our work planning, we've tried to get to a place of having a two to three year work plan as a department and showing like a six year projection of our budget spend and our capital projects. So our out year planning is really, um, and I'll talk about strategic enhancements in a minute. It's we have this 10 year master plan vision, but within that, how do we wanna divide our work into these two or three year sprints or how do we wanna organize ourselves in like a five year, six year medium term for the CIP to make sure that we're addressing on the ground the priorities that the board and the public have. So out year means not this year, not this year. Years. Yeah, and in the city, every budget is appropriated annually. So anything out year is like outside of the year that the council has approved the funding. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and so this is, these are, this is just one slide, but this is something we, we kind of slice and show in a lot of different ways through the budget process where we have tier one, but then we also have focus areas and then we've got investment across. So these are the types of things that we're at, we're typically looking at and asking when we come, we show generally like investment by master plan tier, just as an example of something we would show you during the process. Um, and what we've introduced to the board in 2024 for the 2024 process that we just finished, which is something we've done internally for many, many years is look at our annual strategic enhancements. So within that 10 year vision we're identifying, before we had a master plan, we were still doing this. I remember my first year, 2015, it was like flood recovery number one, finish the North TSA number two. And it was it's an internal communication and organization tool, right? To say, everybody's work is important, but these are the things that we need to get done in the next couple of years. And this is where we're gonna prioritize our, our energy. So we now do that in a slightly different way because it's not you know emergency response for the most part where we're saying strategically, these are the places that we want to accelerate our work. And that's something that we shared with the board for the first time this past year, leading into 2024. Um, enhancements look a lot of different ways. It could be staff capacity. It could be uh, non-personnel money, CIP. It could also just be, we're going to be initiating a major planning effort. We're going to be developing policy. So we've been looking at adaptive management framework recently. We've had major um, subject matters that we've been exploring with you. So those are all ways that we're investing in uh, these, these areas that we're gonna be focusing on. So 
on your question of the six year CIP, there is a link to uh, the six year work plan in the budget book. So we have in, in the munis years, we would give you six years of projects. Which years? Uh, the, our, our old financial system munis. We had the ability to report out on six years of capital projects. So we would give you the stack of projects. We last year shifted to a system called OpenGov. And in its pilot year, we did not have custom reports built out or anything like that. So we were giving you, hey, here's the project for the next year. And then we would pull things from our work plan to kind of hint to you at what the next couple of years looks like. They've been able to make some off cycle improvements to that system. And so now there is a chart at, in this link of what our six year projects are as they're reflected in the budget. And so these are tools that are just now becoming available to us to get again. And so our intention is to make sure as we go into the 2025 budget that we're giving you uh, more information and more detail about those out year projects. Um, I'm not gonna linger on this a ton, but just to give you a, a little um, context before I hand it off, what our strategic priorities were for 2024's budget, build ongoing capacity for wildfire re resilience, accelerate efforts in sci science and climate resilience, accelerate work that supports presence on the land. And then these two are continuations from previous years on the bottom to operationalize funding for ag management and undesignated trails and to make additional investments in equity programming. So that doesn't mean we're done doing that work, but it, we over the last two to three years, as those have been our strategic priorities, we've added staffing and funding and capital dollars and gotten ourselves to a place where we're operationalizing that work. So the work will continue, um, but it, it, these are unlikely to show up in like the 2025 strategic enhancement list because we've made the enhancements that we wanna make and now we'll continue to do that work um, ongoing with, uh, as we go into the 2025 budget. And so Laura, I wasn't here for that. So how, how did these get, how were these uh, identified as being 2024 budget priorities? Yeah, there, it's a good question. So we have a, we do this work internal um, on the director's team and we're looking at what's on the council priority list, what's on the upcoming board agendas, uh, what are gonna be the, the major priorities for the city um, and then you know what's gonna be on our work plan for the next few years. So climate and wildland fire as an example, we were, we were working on a cross-functional city team. We we're getting ready for the climate tax. We also had a lot of goals around fire mitigation and suppression. We were on the heels of NCAR and Marshall. And so we knew that we would be doing all of this work in a very um, enhanced, accelerated way over these upcoming few years. So that's something that as we look at the work plan and how we prioritize our work, we kind of galvanized around that being, a, these have always been internal in my eight years. Yeah, this is um, director led with the director's team. And then we put it out to staff saying, you have a lot of guiding policies, plans that you work with but please pay extra attention to these areas. This is what the director's team has come up with is focus in on that because if it's, let's not treat it as business as usual. Let's actually say, hey, let's try to enhance this area. So giving staff the quote unquote permission to think out of the box and say, okay, let's enhance these areas. So it's sort of a, a, a direction that the director's team gives our staff of saying, if you're developing your program work and then the budget that's needed for that, you know, these are the areas we're encouraging you to uh, yeah. think a little bit in an enhanced way. And, and the board traditionally has not had. Uh, we we daylighted this to you this year. This year, yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. and really before that, it was through, um, the board was heavily involved in how we tiered the master plan strategy. So that would have been the, mm -hmm. the so we were doing workshops and sessions with the board around which things are gonna be tier one, Here's what it means to be tier one. Here's those, those are the things that are going to get funded at an accelerated level. Those are the things we're going to be sprinting on. But that's all that, that's a long list of tier ones. So within that, how do we make sure we're holding ourselves accountable to getting that work done? And sprinting on these topic areas has been a, a useful tool internally for accomplishing yeah. that. Yeah. But so yeah, it'd probably been when was that 2019? Yeah. So it had been, yeah, three, four years. Yeah. And I would say the strategic enhancements was something. <laughs> that's always been there, but it used to just be a laundry list of a lot of things we did. And we've been working as a director's team is how can we make these more meaningful? Because now we have the tiers, the three tiers of the master plan, which is obviously we want to enhance tier one. So uh, this is what we, it's a new iteration of, of trying to be more focused. We used to just have 10 or 15 things on our list. It's like, let's choose five at the most. 
uh, because we already have tiered, tiered strategies within the master plan. So uh, we, we're, we're continuing to evolve our focus on what these are too. And so enhancements means spend more money. No, it, it, it may. It may mean spend more money. It may be add some staff capacity, but it, it could just be, hey, we have five different groups on presence of the land. Why don't you guys talk a little bit more strategically? Like, where are you and when and what time? And and so it could and often does mean strategic yeah. enhancements of money and time. But it also could just be, let's just think about things differently and enhance your strategy involved in that. So I would say, for the most part, Brady, it probably does translate into enhancements, but it does and not uh, from a budget standpoint, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those have been through reallocations too. So I've got a couple examples on the climate and wildland fire resilience. So we spun up a new work group. We had a business analyst position of my team that we repurposed into a, a climate policy program manager that works with Brian. So, um, you know, a lot of this has been in order to invest at these strategic opportunities when there's attrition or when there's a skill match or something, how do we, how do we make sure we're investing time and energy into those things? So we've accomplished a lot up till now through through some reallocations. Um, I'm not going to read each of these. I just want to highlight a couple examples just so you get a sense of that of that question actually. So what does it mean to, to enhance? So in something like wildfire resilience, yes, we did increase forestry crew from eight employees to 13. We did operationalize funding for that step. We, we made that ongoing through this last budget cycle. It's also training. So we completed red card firefighter certification for 25 rangers to make sure we have folks ready on the ground if something like that happens, um, deploying education outreach employees during fires. So how are we supporting trail closure? So these are staff we already have, but we're gonna use them in a different way. They have that knowledge training to be ready to support in times uh, of emergency. Um, documentation and planning. There's a lot of examples here around building fuel mitigation plans, um, prescriptive uh, grazing plans, fire plans. So making sure that there's an increased level of readiness. So that, you know, enhancement can mean a lot of different things. Same thing on the equity example. So we have temporary capacity, but can we make it ongoing? So that's, you know, not really a, it's a very marginal cost increase, but we wanna make sure that we're maintaining that capacity, partnering in a different way, building contracts with Spanish speaking partners and folks with uh, community relationships in the Latinx community. Um, increased hiring of bilingual junior rangers has been a focus. So again, within that current budget, within the same number of overall uh, temporary seasonal staff in that program, how do we make sure that we're living out our values and, and that our you know, staffing is more reflective of the community? So these are just examples to, to show what we mean by enhanced uh, yeah. or strategic enhancements. Um, and, and this has been a place where it's like, okay, beyond having the board look at an annual list of projects, how do we make sure that the board is weighing in on these strategic enhancements, the places we're going to go to work over the next two to three years. So, and again, that's new. That was something we did for the first time this year. I think before that we were trying to say like, how can we use the master plan as, as the place where the board is engaging in the budget with this balance across focus area strategy. So I think there's a lot of openness on the team to, to what the right level of, of engagement is and what the appropriate type of engagement is from the board. Uh, but this has been sort of where we've come from and how we've tried to evolve that over the last eight years. So with that, I will hand it off to you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Lauren, thank you for the context. Sure, yeah. I, I don't want to linger to, I'll just say, I can't remember who's advancing the slides, but I just wanted to do, a, um, as, as we go forward, I just want to do a quick little review of, because, I mean, it was my first few meetings, and so it's a little bit of a, of a fuzzy for me of like all the different budget touches. But let's just review what we did and um and then we can kind of talk about what we want to do in the future so this was the these were the touches that you all um uh designed for us and now i understand the eight-year trajectory that got us here so sure. thank you for that we can go to the next slide um and these are the milestones and so we're still kind of in this right we've got um the the, the 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 budget isn't approved yet. The, the council is going to be doing some meetings. So the, the, this was how our the, the bolded ones were the ones that were our meetings. Um, and so you can go to the next slide. And so I just I put a few again to kind of jog our memory. Um, there's a few. Um, yeah, next slide. Uh, here's here's just a few screen grabs of, of our of our packet. So this is where you all. This was when we you broke out. 
the, the CIP, that is to say the capital expenditures based on our master plan focus area, right? And so we had that. Um, and then you broke down into the specific, are these specific projects or these are specific sub focus areas of the? These are the strategies. Yeah, these are the master strategies. plan strategy. Okay. And then underneath those are the projects. And then the projects that go to each strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So we did that. That was that was in May. And then in June, uh, this one was like uh, for, for the uninitiated, the number the number of acronyms per square inch was very high. <laughs> yes. Hard for me to discern. Doesn't mean maybe it just means I need to do more homework. But this was a uh, initially an inscrutable table. <laughs> <laughs> um and we can go to the next one. And so then in, in June, we reviewed, and the, could someone remind us what is NPE and NSPE? Non-personnel expense and non-standard personnel, seasonal and temporary money. And that is not operating. It, that is a subset of is, operating, it but operating. it is an all-inclusive of operating. That is a subset of operating. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. focused on this in June because... Yeah, um, so staffing, standard staffing is the piece that's excluded from this operating snapshot, uh, because for the, for the most part, unless somebody is uh, leaving, there's turnover, there's a new position, those are things that stay pretty um, the same year to year. And so what we- Oh, these, are, very, these are more variable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So these are like, you know, our ongoing service programs or our seasonal and temporary staffing. So you would see for example, we're going to hire 13 forestry crew members, and those folks are working in support of uh, climate crisis here and now and some other strategies. So we've gotten to a place where for our 220-ish seasonals and temps, we're able to allocate their salaries to the master plan. We have yet to do that for our standard staff. So for example, my position, how would I go about allocating that work um, across the master plan strategy? So these are the things that were trackable to the master plan. And represented, we used to just show CIP investment in the master plan. So it was to say, well, CIP is six, seven million of a $35 million budget. How do we work towards this being more holistic? So we got to a place of, I don't know, 20 million uh, or something like that. We're, we're tracking everything but our standard PE right now to uh, master plan strategies with an intention to onboard the standard personnel dollars. Um, into this process in the next year or so. And that will happen through your software and there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be allocations of effort and yep. then the salary will be split up by those percentages. Yes. Okay, and so Lauren, was, what's the tracking software? Is that? Yeah, we have a, a system called Clarizan. It's a work planning project portfolio management system. Um, and so we, you know, do project charters and then our director's team is saying yes or no to projects on our work plan. We're then asking managers to allocate staff time to projects, which is more work planning, right? So, uh, but then we're able to link it to the budget in a number of ways. So we have every project manager um, indicate which master plan strategies their project is in support of. We um, do an, a good amount of like auditing and cleanup and making sure that everything, you know, we're all looking at this in a consistent way to do those reports. And then the financial system is, is open gov and those two things don't talk to each other <laughs> right now. And so then it's really like, okay, how do we, how do we start to assign budget dollars to, right. to these things? In some places that's very straightforward. You're gonna ask for $300,000 for a capital project that tracks one-to-one -one in open gov In other places that's more challenging. Like so the, how are we gonna do that? On the standard staff side? Right. Oh, that's a very stats driven question. So we've been, um, Cole, who's our senior accountant, has, has brought us a couple different models. Um, one of those is actually more resource driven, like we would really go in and be updating projects and one is more assumption driven. So um, at this level of the organization, we can use, I don't know, Sam or my position, X and that we're gonna assume that a percentage of time is gonna be driven towards financial sustainability and development of the budget. That's not a clean, so the financial sustainability strategies are things like budgeting for resilience in the face of disaster and like uh, pursuing diverse revenue sources. So that's not a clean one-to-one. -one. Like I spend, I don't know, a third of my year doing budget work, but regular ongoing financial management. That's not something that's captured in financial sustainability. So we're working on that right now. Like what is what are the right assumptions that we wanna make on staff time? So 
the director team is going to be reviewing that in November, December to sort of adopt a model in time for what you all will see for 2025. So is the idea not to exempt any percentage of anyone's time to try to allocate 100% of everybody's time into a master plan strategy? It or probably have, will not be possible. So like your example about just, you know, the budget work that you're doing, that may just have to go in a different bucket. Yeah. And in the work plan, we capture that as general management and emergent and unplanned work. Like we have that built out in our work planning system mm -hmm. that just doesn't exist in budgeting or in. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things we introduced to you all in this budget process for the first time was the concept of administrative um, costing. And that's something across the city that we're trying to get more consistent on. So and, and actually you had a lot of questions about that in the budget packet mm -hmm. where we were talking about we have director's team, central services, you're going to start to see that reflected as administrative overhead. Mm -hmm. That's a really uncomfortable thing to think that there's dollars going to things that aren't tied to master plan strategies specifically, but it's a way to start to capture um, that nuance. And that's just kind of the way of the world. It's just yeah, I'm okay yes, with that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you know, but I think over time, as we've talked with this board, like it has, it has very much depended on the board and who's on it, like what the perceptions are of that. We've had very heated conversations in previous years about cost allocation, which is another like okay. as we talk to our partners, it's like this is the way we do or like, this is the way we run business. So, but I think like the the intention is beautiful. It's how do we maximize the dollars in support of the land and the people who are using the land. So that's always our intention, right? Is to make sure that we're managing that in a responsible way. And it just has been an uncomfortable thing to call it administrative costs. Up till now, and okay. now we get to yeah. envision what it looks like. Moving right. forward. I think the English language <laughs> fails us in that regard, yeah. but you know, you gotta, yeah. you gotta choose a word, yeah. I, administrative cost is like triggering something, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but okay. yeah, in our work yeah. plan, we capture that as general management, so okay. those are things that are not reflected in, in these graphs that you're showing. Got it, got yeah. it. Okay, let's let's take a quick tour of July, Great. and then, um. So in July, the packet had uh, more comprehensive over overarching budget that, that includes, and what is the total ops, 32? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's close, like 36. 36, 36 yeah. and that does not oh, include my. CIP. Yeah, okay. That so does that, include CIP. That does include CIP. So ops and CIP is 36. So we got the, we got the, the big view of that next slide we got what what I'm used to seeing is like a financial statement. And so I started feeling like, oh, now I'm going to do my hmm. job because that's what I'm used to. Yeah. Um, and so we got this in the packet, next slide. And then we got a, a nice study that had um, a little bit confusing because the variance wasn't necessarily tied to FTEs. Because I was trying, and if you did the math, you're like, wait a second, did, yeah. are we hiring this person for $452,000? I don't <laughs> think so. But anyways, but this is a nice depiction of, okay, this is the number of FTEs. That, how much we've been spending, what the, what the variance is going to be. And again, for me, you've been used to reading more traditional financial statement. It tells me, oh, this is where we're putting more energy. This is where we're putting less. Again, I felt like I was in familiar territory. Mm -hmm. We had a public hearing and we voted on it in July. And then that's it. That was our touch, right? That, that, that was it. And so a few other just sort of impressions. Next slide. One of the questions I had, and this is my first exposure to base versus enha enhancements, was this concept that the board, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we gave we had a fair amount of visibility and scrutiny on the enhancements. There's going to be an extra FTE and ag lands for prairie dog issues and some other stuff. We went very deep into that. And then there's this $32 million, whatever, the 30 something million dollar base, which enhancements are absorbed into each year. And then this board doesn't really, unless, unless you give us a very specific report or we very intentionally peek in there, it's a big black box. And my presumption isn't that there's anything scary and terrible in the black box, we're just not looking at it. Uh, and every year the enhancements go in there. And then you may use reallocations to do other things. And so things change over time, but we really, in my initial view, don't have a systematic way to kind of look in and see how what happened to the enhancements of yesterday. So that was one question I had coming in. Next slide. I asked the city council um, for a, a, few, a few city council members for their input. I'm gonna read these out loud. We appreciate each board working with its respective staff and developing the department's budget so that we can have confidence that the budget has received community vetting. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Another board member. It's definitely helpful when you all review, weigh in on, recommend the budget as you're closer to it. I find it very helpful to know what the pain points were. 
If there was disagreement between staff and OSBT on a line item or strenuous debate among trustees over something within the budget, OSBT sending council a letter highlighting those pain points would be useful. No, that's a council. These are city um, council members. You said board, but it's a council. These are these are council. These are council members. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, again, I just because I again I was you know, I'm curious to know what's useful to you as staff, what's useful to council, how can we be adding value to this whole process? Um, so that's that's it. I just those are my slides. I just wanted to highlight a, a few things to kind of frame our discussion, and then you all, um, I'll hand it back over to you on this is a good final slide. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, we wanted to make sure that you were getting out of this too, what, what you wanted in terms of, you know, we're, we're, we'll, we are already in the 2025 development process through budget, but we'll start talking about the 2025 process with you all in, in a very a few short months. So as you think about what your role is or should be, or maybe in the future, what you know what would that look like to you so how can the board provide more meaningful and timely input into budget planning our focus areas and strategies the right level of engagement our strategic enhancements and effective area of engagement for you um, and when and how does engagement best occur so these are very broad <laughs> questions but i think we want to make sure that before we bring you 2025 materials where we understand you know how you want to engage and we're bringing materials that reflect that I'm going to interject one more thing and I'll stop it. it Dan, you and I talked about this over, over lunch when we were discussing this retreat. And we said, well, great, maybe there needs to be some touch points in fall when there's more of an ability for the board mm -hmm. to weigh in on which, which direction things are flowing. Can you speak to that? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, you mentioned that in, in July, you received the sort of the final city figures and estimates. We give you a, 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 a lot of detailed reports, and then an hour later, you're expected to write a recommendation. And I've always said, even in my uh, my six years of kind of working this, is like July is probably not the most effective time to give us your meaningful input. Like we're really diving into 2025 budget development right now as a staff. And so, if you have some overall guidance and enhancements area, and like are we investing more in this program area or less in this program area than maybe we should be? Asking those questions right around now is probably a more appropriate time than an hour before you all are expected to make a recommendation on the budget. So my my point was that at a little bit of this higher level now is if, if you all have a uh, an enhancement area, even a program area or a focus area or a strategy that you have questions about, about are we investing enough in that area? If you can ask us now, that is time for us to provide you the information and then maybe even react so then this spring, we could say, you asked about this, you were encouraging us to look into this, here's how we have gone through our work planning process and brought that to fruition and bring that to you in spring. So that's that's what I meant by a fall touch of some sort, and maybe it's the retreat, maybe you know, it's a perfect area to do that. In, so. Well, I think that is extremely important. Uh, the, the whole timing issue, I think, uh, is paramount. And so I think that's a good observation that you know, the fall, as you're starting to develop the next year's budget, is an appropriate time to at least sit down with the board and, and kind of review, okay, um, and I was going to just add one thing. Um, it strikes me, and Lauren, you mentioned this, as far, as far as the strategic enhancements are concerned, that in order to inform the board's conversation, Dan, on, okay, how, how do we do, or, you know, kind of what what do you think we ought to, you know, pay attention to this coming year? Uh, if, if in the timing on this might be a little funky, but it would be good to kind of review the strategic enhancement status of the current year, you know, and say, okay, you know, here's kind of where we're at as far as what we decided, you know, were the priorities or the emphases, um, you know, for this year. And then that would give the board kind of a context or basis for saying, okay, well, you know, that sounds good. What about this or that? Or, um, you know, maybe we need to kind of circle back and, and um, you know, pay some more attention to whatever it is. And so I think that whole timing uh, thing is uh, real important. And then I think if you can give the board, the staff can give the board some, you know, at least initial preliminary uh context for saying, okay, um, you know, what about taking a look at, you know, such and such for the coming year? And that would give us 
I think a little more focus on you know kind of what the what the situation is and what we might want to uh, focus on then for the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in the mid and and uh, so the way I the way I view the world is like the one the two year outlook like that strategic enhancements like those are things like you know the emerging issues what's coming on that maybe like wildfire over the last couple of years okay that's that that uh, three to six year is is our master plan strategies you know that's when you can look a little bit more out and then you know beyond six years you're looking at our focus series our vision statements our you know our outcome statements within the master plan so those can, and then other there's other guiding plans for the boulder valley comp plan and the city's going to come up with a citywide strategic plan so there's those contexts but yeah the uh, sort of the enhancements are you know if there's an area or two you think we ought to get to work on and soon let's look at the enhancement areas the master plan strategies to me are still I think are a great way to look over that sort of that one to six year time horizon and then of course then you start getting a little bit more in the visioning and the value statements and the outcomes and that sort of thing so yeah we'd be happy to do a fall report out on in fact we kind of did that here. We ran through it real quick. Yeah. But each of these hands, we had a list of what we've done this year, and we could provide that in a written memo form, for instance, and give that to you in a in a board packet this fall. Say, here's our report out on what we've done with the enhancements this year, and even start to wet the whistle on the director's team's thinking that right. two of them are going to stay, but we think we ought to add a, another one in that's new for 2025, and we can even start to daylight what we're thinking for. I think that would be great. Yeah, I think it'd be really helpful. For, for the board's, you know, well, for the board's understanding and contribution and for the, the you know, the staff's, uh, you know, um, kind of knowledge of what, where the board's coming from. Okay. And we can, um, I highlighted two examples, but in my back pocket slides, I have a slide for each of the five. So we could even <laughs> just make sure we share the back pockets too, mm -hmm. you know, after coming out today and mm -hmm. build that into some written materials. So Lauren, I was gonna ask, um, as far as software, can you speak briefly to kind of prior to your arrival uh, to work with the department, what was your sense of how the budget was developed and the role of the board kind of in, in that whole process? Well, you can uh, add to this <laughs> observation <laughs> since you were there. Question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a lot of respect for my predecessor. Um, in fact, his his daughter uh, worked in finance for a number of years up until very recently when she moved on. And so I think we've sort of maintained some connections with that, that history. Um, we didn't overlap, um, Mike and I, but it was very spreadsheet driven. Um, right. Right. And it seemed to be very... Well, I guess base budgets would continue, um, would be my observation of practice. And there wasn't necessarily, because, you know, it wasn't software, it wasn't openly shared, you know, it was each work group kind of developing spreadsheets. This is not a judgment. This is just the way things no, are. Um, bringing those things to the director to make decisions without maybe necessarily a ton of cross communication, right? And so I think one of the things that software has enabled is um, I can run a report on any program in the department and understand what's on their list and I'm getting tagged like I get physical notifications like <laughs> or email notifications like hey you've been tagged on this technology project this like how many hours is it going to take you and it's a it's a collaborative building process right so one of the things we did when I first got here is a zero-based budgeting process so it was looking at okay let's uh, budget to actual spend uh, what are the places where we have unspent money? At that time, uh, we were spending 82% of our operating budget in any given year. So when we, my first year, when I put through budget requests, the first thing I got asked in executive budget team was why are you asking us for more money when you have $5 million on the table from last year? So that again, it, like, it sounds judgmental. It's not, it's just a, an evolution of city practice, right? Those aren't things that they were looking at at EBT uh, before that time. So it was really focused on uh, reallocate your money, do a zero-based budgeting process, make sure that folks have what they need when they need it, but we're not going to stockpile, um, or we're not going to hold money year to year. So I think um, it, it works. <laughs> the, the department got a lot of really amazing work done in those years, but adding these systems has really, I mean, we're spending 100% of our operating budget every year for four years now, and we have some work to do still on CIP, 
So, and a lot of that has to do with permitting delays and, you know, like planning processes and how long things take to be able to go physically do construction. So we're, we're not done on the CIP side of that, but it's a lot more like just in time or um, informed by the last three years of actuals and, and everybody in the department can see it. So I'm not saying we're perfect. I think, you know, business management is going to continue to evolve and will evolve with it. Right now, the city's focus is on how do we get out of department silos and into tracking at the citywide level. So we have the sustainability, equity, and resilience framework where we're talking about how as a community do we know if we're healthy and socially thriving? Well, I can tell you what we're doing at Open Space, but I can't see community vitality or parks and rec or anything like that. So all of the work that we've done internally, we're now gonna mirror on, this, on the city level to, to track to things like um, climate, that's a, gonna be a SARE objective or already is, uh, public safety, uh, health, community health. So so we've actually been in workshops recently as we're helping to develop what the update to that SARE framework is going to be for the city. So I think that's where I see us going. Great. Yeah, I just think this is extraordinary budgeting, you know, to tie it all back to the master plan strategies. And it's it's a way to make the master plan a living document like I've never seen before. Now I come from a more planning uh, based world where you know, the, as you know, the Boulder Planning Department doesn't build trails and stuff like that. They review projects, and so they don't have money in there. But they can't take comp plan policies and show how those policies are met in the budget in the same way that, that you guys can. But I, and I don't know if this is unusual or unique in the world of, of uh, planning for open space, but it's spectacular and new to me, and, um, and I think it's, it's amazing. I, you know, definitely caution you on it, you're already there to, you know, not try to fit every second of everybody's yeah. work, you know, into a category, you know, organizations need people who grease skids and, you know, fix relationships and do all kinds of things that don't meet any of the master plan strategies. Um, that said, I think the idea of having a, um, having a check-in with us in the fall, um, I'm imagining this and tell me or if you think this is the way you imagine it, but you know, I'm imagining it and you show us what, you know, we're, we've spent money on over the last few years, particularly, you know, where the master plan strategies have, have uh, landed in terms of dollars spent last year. And then we talk about what are our priorities for this year. And I say hypothetically, well, I'm really a big proponent of CCDI one. I think we ought to spend a little bit more than we did last year and welcoming the first backgrounds. Um, to open space and, in, you know, in my orientation, you know, we looked at the numbers and there isn't much being spent on that right now. And I think we should spend more on it. And then, you know, everybody agrees and you agree. And, and Dan walks into Janelle's office and says, what would you do if I gave you another $100,000? And Janelle goes, well, I've been thinking about piloting this program in, you know, local public schools, you know, K to fives. Um, Good, you can do that now. You know, is that kind of the mm -hmm. the way you imagine yeah. Yeah, this that's going? That's, yeah. that's what we we do internally, and bringing your voice into that makes it would be it'd be fairly easy to do. Well, that sounds great. To that'd me. be great, and I'd have a lot more confidence in what I'm voting on in July. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the one thing that uh, because a lot of the things don't get expressed through a number, like you see a number, you're like. I, don't know what that number means, mm -hmm. $380,000. Like if you said, I don't think we're doing enough in climate and we weren't daylighting this, we would say, well, actually first, let's show you everything we are doing in climate. You're like, oh, wow, okay. No. Right. Like it could be just answering some questions as well, like where you maybe weren't realizing all the work that was being done in this certain area. Right. You know, we could bring enhanced information on areas you're interested in, which may translate into enhancement, but it may not. You, yeah, and I think, you know, your ability to contextualize those things for us. So, you know, if, if we've got $388,000 in, you know, DEI work, and that's like, the you know, that's more than what five FTEs can, can administer. And then we've got, you know, $10 million in these physical projects. It looks like we're spending all our money on physical projects, but physical projects are more expensive than running school programs. And so we need to understand you know, we're at capacity in this area. It's not a big number, but we can't really do much more here. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and that's what we realized in 2019. We actually thought when we were putting numbers together for like CCI, FBI, like we thought it would use a little bit more 
proportional monies in CIP, but what we turned out is like a lot of that work is not CIP related, mm -hmm. like, but yet uh, uh, replacing a whole residential structure to move agricultural tenants and well, that's 2 million bucks. Yeah. And that's one project. CCAI right. is doing 25 projects, but not even coming close to spending that exactly. amount of money. So, yeah. So, yeah, that context for us would be awesome. Yeah. John, did you have something to say? No. Uh, not a ton. I would just echo what uh, everyone else has said. I think, uh, you know, don't be afraid to have things that don't fall into those buckets. Mm -hmm. Administrative, you know, buckets aren't scary to me. Um, I think a check-in in the fall would be great. Um, it feels like we have a pretty exhaustive process in the spring and summer that we currently run. Um, and my, my hope would be if we checked in in the fall, maybe we could make that uh, a little bit more of an efficient process if we've already seen some of it and you know have, have talked through it in the fall, maybe we can spend less time on it um, when we're doing that kind of final review to sign off on it. Can I chime in? Well, Michelle, you are the financial <laughs> professional. Um, <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I, I am in your seat a lot of the yeah. time, so I, I can really empathize with um, what you've been through over the year, but not to this degree. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> it's pretty similar. Yeah, it's, it's very exhaustive. And so, uh, you know, I've, so I've been through the, the OSBT cycle three times now. And then um, <clears throat> on Parks and Rec, I went through it five times. So I have a little bit more comfort and like a, an appreciation for how far you've come. Mm -hmm. and, um, and and seriously, how how well you all do um, with, with open space. And I think that um, the, the focus on the master plan strategies is amazing. Like mm -hmm. that is just like the cut above anything that I've seen to be able to tie your work to this this um this master plan that the community has developed as the priorities, and at first I was like, you know, is this just you know playing with numbers and and actually can see like when that there's um, a real mindfulness when you do when you allocate money to how is this meeting our master plan goals, and um, that's just a cut above anything I've seen within the city in uh, in my eight years almost eight years of serving on city boards. Um, so, you know, big kudos to you for, for doing that. I think that's the right approach. Um, as an OSB team member, I don't want to be in every single line. I do like, um, you know, I, I, I want to see just high level, how is that meeting our goal and, and, and what enhancements look like. Um, my big question was really around the CIP and, and the outlook and like how much influence we have all of that because it felt like um, not very much. Um, but there wasn't very much. And this link that you put in there for the six year um, planning process for CIP, and I know that's new to introducing that, is amazing. Like, mm -hmm. um, I haven't dived too deeply into it yet, but I'm looking at it now. Um, and we can see, um, you know, what you think the next six years looks like by project. And, um, and, you know, I think it answers some questions that I had is like, okay, if there's a line in here for Marshall Mesa Trailhead rest Restoration, $800,000, which is something that we just talked about in the last, mm -hmm. the last board meeting. Um, and then in the out years of like 2028, would we have another $300,000 each year scheduled? And I just have some questions about that. I mean, I know that you're doing like some sort of, in your project management software, a 60% 60 probability of the um everything being aligned to be able to do that work and also um the the cost estimates so you're you're, you're doing a lot of things um behind the scenes that bring you to these out your estimates and um and i think i would like to just get more familiar with these i know when mm -hmm. i was on prav one thing that we were able to do is um, allocate funds for the bill bauer park and that was something that was like, we owned the land, but we never had the money to actually build it out. And I think it, it, that was, um, gosh, it was such a, a critical time for me when I was actually, I felt like I actually had the ability to um, bring money forward and actually make that park happen. Mm -hmm. And and I, I can go by that park and my kids can play there. I'm like, man, this is something that I really had influence in making happen. Um, I didn't feel like we had that level of influence here 
on, on OSDT. Having visibility into the out years, I think, is helpful in that. And, then, and just understanding what these dollars mean. So I think that might be something for a future date to maybe um, just have um, have some more like understanding of what, what these things mean. Not grand detail, but just for example, we have um, Flagstaff site plan, visitor management and EOF implementation. I don't know what EOF means. Um, We're character limited education outreach framework. Oh, <laughs> <imagine that. laughs> interpretive signage and interpret, yeah, yeah, programming. Yeah, yeah. interpretive programming. Yeah. Gotcha. So that doesn't probably include any of the issues that we've been talking about with the crime in, in on Flagstaff. Is, is that right? Do you want to? Like in executing on, 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 you know, potentially like additional security. I mean, we've talked about like that probably would show up in a CIP. That that would probably show up in a yeah. ranger operating budget or something like that. Okay. So yeah, it'd just be good to understand what what those things are. The, it, 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 yeah, the the other issues that we've been talking about with black staff are not going to be addressed here then. So it'll be something else. But I think just more familiarity with what what these all mean. Um, I don't need to know um, what. Fish passage, although, yeah, I mean, it looks like you want to do a design of fish passage and new dry, dry creek, and that's going to approximately cost $400,000. I don't need to know like all the details of yeah. every dollar that's going to spend. Well, no, and that's it. You're pointing out so many great, I'm very grateful for the feedback, and I think we can incorporate more of the six year look in the budget process. There's a few things you're pointing to is like one is how do we lump and split, right? So, in any given year, we're going to do, I don't know, 15 trail projects. That are small dollar. Do we combine that and say, hey, we're going to go do capital trail maintenance, or do we get really specific about, hey, this year is good cute fish passage, next year's, you know, wherever the location is. So, um, and something with the site planning too, like what level of detail. So you'll see one on that list, which is NF 53 and 54, Foothills Trail permitting. That's much more specific than local food farm site improvements, right? So that's something we're looking at every year is like, what is the right level of detail to provide in any one of these projects? So I think uh, being able to engage with you more on, hey, here's what the longer term looks like. Here's how we're kind of organizing our work. Does this make sense? Like, I, I think we, we're very open to that. Mm -hmm. Great. I'll just make mention that Heather's team will provide a wild uh, life uh, update in November. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we could bring some of these projects forward just to sort of you know, let you, because that's another thing is we do program updates for you all. And sometimes it might, might seem, well, that was interesting, but what was that meaningful? Like the reason we do program updates is those programs, for instance, trailheads, there's big ticket trailhead items, up, yeah. but we provided you updates saying, hey, we had an assessment done. We're really lagging behind on trailhead maintenance, kind of telling you in the future, we're going to be investing more in that. So even our program updates are heavily tied the, to the budget. The budgetary maybe, foreshadowing. Yes. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. maybe we should be more explicit at the times like, okay, just, uh, we do have several yeah. CIP items coming down the road related to uh, the trailhead maintenance program area. So those program updates are a way to keep you informed in what we, what we call our blocks of our programs because it's ultimately related to work planning and budget. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I, I also am cognizant of time. And so as a facilitator, can I put a little ball on this for us, man? Anybody, is, is there anything yeah, else? Yeah, just one other thing is like, how do we tie the CIP to what everybody quotes is this $44 million of trail maintenance backlog? So when we're looking at, and, and everybody like, likes to use that mm -hmm. very daunting number, but in this plan, you're addressing it in your operating plan. You're also addressing it in your CIP plan so that we can speak to the community about how we're, point. how we're addressing that. Mm -hmm. um, because um, people just tend to throw that in as like mm -hmm. a grenade and like, you're not addressing the, the trail maintenance backlog. And I'm like, actually you are, we just don't, it's not really right. connected for us to, to actually be able to like art articulate that to the community. Brady, before you do that, can I just yeah. uh, please jump in uh, real quickly? So Lauren, I think uh, as we've talked uh, in the past several uh, board meetings, you know, the uh, the importance of funding sources, uh, I think uh, the board would uh, benefit from, you know, kind of a, a brief discussion of them. Um, and the, the one, and I, I don't want to sound like sour grapes, but the, the one that is most recent is the, you know, lottery fund. And, um, you know, the 
staff's decision to forego the 480,000 or what 450, whatever it is, annual lottery budget. And I will say, speaking from you know a long time, the you know the defense of the open space fund has been ferocious uh, over the years, and I'm just a little concerned that you know we still are seeing you know city, and I. I, I mean, big city, um, you know, looking at our budget and just like what we talked about earlier on, on carryover, you know, you, you didn't expend all your budget, so you got, you know, several million dollars, uh, you know, so you must be able to, you know, help, you know, fund some other, you know, city project. And I think the board uh, should be involved or at least informed of those kinds of uh, you know budgetary issues or or decisions actually because again the history is that uh, the open space fund especially has been sacrosanct uh, as far as its use for the open space program and um, I think the staff and the board would benefit from both entities both uh, groups uh, making sure they understood you know, kind of uh, the status of the various funding sources. There was an extensive report on that on May in the PAC, I believe. But you're saying a heads up if yeah, things going to change. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think um, the finance team has been doing a great, they have a, you know, new team there. And obviously the city managers, what, a year and a half or something like that. So they've been coming in and looking at how is this done? We're very focused on like our fund and how do we manage our fund. And they're, you know, coming in with the citywide look of what is, what are expenditures look like across our funds? What is our fund structure? So they had asked us in the spring maybe to do it, to do an inventory of all of the charter language, uh, ballot language, everything that we had that set up our fund makeup. So we provided all of that. We collaborated with parks and greenways on the lottery fund structure. And then uh, Brian and Dan have been super integral with uh, the climate tax. So we gave all of that as inputs to decision-making. We had no change in practice at the time we were coming to you for a lot of you saying, hey, here's the two projects that we think we're gonna ask for lottery funding for. Up, we, we, up until now, we've gotten 42% of every year's allocation, something around there. And so we, you know, we were proceeding as usual. And so they, they were doing that background work um, of assessing what is actually in the language and what level of flexibility do we have across the city. So uh, when we got that decision, that's when we put the email out to you all a couple of weeks ago, like, hey, this is, this is the change. This is what we heard. Obviously it was after the fact. So we're working very, very closely with finance and talking about how can we be more proactive about communicating those things in the future if, these, if there are these citywide looks and, and processes. So that's certainly the intention. I mean, the, the climate tax will be similar, where in year one, we were in a level of readiness. Like, if you give us this year one funding, we're hitting the ground running, we're ready to spend, we can hire these forestry crew members. And now it's really going to be okay across the whole city, what are the biggest priorities? And those are the things that are going to get funded. So I think for both of those funding sources, that's the way of the future. Um, and then the open space fund has been a dedicated fund, as as you're well aware, of course. And so that's that's sort of the base budget that we work within. But right. yeah, I mean, I think there are questions about what it like what open space work is happening outside the open space department or what non-open space work happens within the department as we participate on citywide initiatives. So those are all those have all been internal conversations. Good. All right, I'm gonna give myself the last word if I'm at <laughs> um, keep trying so, anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I wait long enough will be the last. Um, so one one just observation. i have also in in addition to enhancements, I'd like to know what the reductions are. Mm -hmm. Like what mm -hmm. didn't work? Are we making you know it, what what are or what are we moving money away from? What didn't work? What was a grand experiment? That we took a, we took a smart risk on, and we learned that you know what that just wasn't the best way to spend money. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to hear mm -hmm. those stories and those those lessons and changes too as a part of this process. I think we have an opportunity to combine touches in the spring. I, I think the fall deep dive on having a discussion about this, we're talking about your strategies, that, that the, a generative discussion would be great. I, I Again, I so appreciate, I think you got a lot of props for tying things back to the master plan, well earned. I so appreciate all the thought that you all put into those touches in the spring. I think we have an opportunity to maybe combine some with the fall meeting. And I also like to see them being a little bit more generative like I, I really do read the packets and, and I and I make notes and I, I, I Google the acronyms or I go, you know, like I do my homework and I come prepared to discuss them. 
And and so I think you know having brief presentations to kind of recap the highlights and then opening it up for us to to talk would be great. And and I have a recommendation. You know what happens a lot in in other types of boards is not everybody in the board is is has the energy or the time to to dive into financials. And there's usually finance committees. And I don't think we need to have a standing committee that has a bunch of responsibilities outside of of this board. However, I think as we're putting together or you all, I should say, are putting together the touches for this board as a part of your board process. Having one or two board members as a, as a, as a committee to work on helping craft that and, and trying to help it be as generative and productive for both the staff, this board, and the city council would be great. I, I volunteer to be part of that when, at a time when it makes sense for you. Um, Michelle, I haven't discussed this at all, but mm -hmm. if there's somebody else who's interested in being a part of that, it could just be one or two meetings. Um, but anyway, just put that out there. Is, is that preparing for the spring touches or? Yeah, as, 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 we, pre as we prepare for how the board is going to engage with, I mean, again, it's up to y'all when, when you would like, but I just think having a work group to dive in a little deeper and be thoughtful about how we're going to best kind of prepare this board would probably be, be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Okay. I also like that idea. Anybody offered to us uh, to do an acronym quiz and see what's in the past? I eat up the final say. All right. That sounds great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank, um, thank you. Fall touch. Is that something uh, uh, perhaps try to build it into a re the retreat? Would that be inappropriate? Because it's the perfect time of year for us. I think in the future, yeah, we kind of. No, I know, right? Right, oh, right, right, right. I mean, yeah. No, I think that we makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we'll, this year. we'll yeah. probably have, have to do it a little disjointed this fall, but uh, I'm just thinking maybe if we knew that we had two hours at every retreat or we're going to dive into it, then that might just be helpful for us to know. But, or, or alternatively, we could have a, a half day retreat or, you know, a two hour retreat or a study session, you know, kind of a, a number of different ways to handle that. Okay. I think in a way it doesn't work as well in a retreat setting because if we're talking about the board's priorities for how the budget gets spent, you know, looking at what Brady got from city council, one of our important functions in at least one council person's mind was to give the public a chance to, to see this and, you know, to see how to vet all of this. And I think maybe in a regular meeting or in a even a special meeting, or special more, study session, regular meeting. Okay. Yeah, there might be more. What do you guys think? You know, and also, I, I, I think that it, would, it might have the problem problem of hijacking a great chunk of the retreat, which right. makes the retreat more of a working session than an opportunity to check in with each other. Um, just my thoughts. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. Open in. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we we'll take these notes back and. Absolutely. Yeah. Together. Thank you very much. Mrs. Chandler, not in favor of more meetings. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but longer, longer retreat. Yeah, yeah, longer and later ones. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, I think ne up next we have a little break. So uh, we've got some coffee and some food in the back and rest. Okay. So we are back on. Great. Well, I will uh, uh, move us to the next agenda, um, which will be talking about uh, our uh, planning framework and the future thoughts about how we do our planning. And Michelle is going to be our facilitator for this hour session. And there is a less than a five minute sort of context setting slide deck that the staff prepared to get us started. But I don't know if you want to say anything. Opening remarks and we go over the questions we're asking. Yeah, so um, this is a topic that has um, been, I don't know, introduced in the last couple of retreat um, ideas or planning sessions and thought we'd try to tackle it this time. We have a pretty complex plan planning framework um, a really good one. I think it's sometimes difficult for uh, members of the public to follow along all of the different planning documents that we have. And so this is a topic that's meant to kind of explore what, what, what plans we have out there. And I would love to actually just touch a little bit on the history of, of our planning um, documents. If, if either 
you're <laughs> ready to do that or um or even dave would like to do that i think that's really helpful context of why we have so many plans today and um and we're gonna like touch on like um what are all the just take an inventory of all the plans that we have um some of the questions are are like how do they relate with to one another um and um or is there some sort of hierarchy in some of the plans? We, we, we get a lot of program uh, updates throughout the year, and there's a lot of reference to the different plans that are guiding the programs and the work <clears throat> that the staff is doing. Um, and uh, yeah, it just would be nice to, to understand like how things are connected. What is the shelf life of the plan? Um, and you know how can we keep them as living documents, but but ones that the community can follow along with. But I think this particular session is really meant to just explore, educate, and possibly lay groundwork for subsequent conversations. Not that we're um, intending to answer any big questions today, but just explore that. Yeah. Great. Um, there's a, a slide a slide deck. Like I said, I think that. Uh, <clears throat> The idea, idea of revisiting OS and P's planning framework, it did come out of the master plan. And one of the uh, central questions you raise is why so many planning documents and then how do they relate as well? Up until 2019, we did not have an overarching master plan. So I think some of what's uh, spun out of that without that large guiding policy document, we had a whole bunch of individual plans. And so now the dynamics have changed a little bit with this overarching master plan. Um, I think more important than ever is how do individual plans relate to the master plan? How could the, what is the master plan's future role in updating some of these policy questions that are embedded in various plans uh, uh, underneath the master plan now? And then how does the master plan talk above it? Like how does it relate to a future citywide strategic plan or the Boulder Valley comprehensive plan? So there's this up and down sort of nature I know what from a staff perspective, I can tell you the interesting sort of, there's two interesting elements that we've been really <clears> wanting to explore and, and was glad that this sort of came up as a topic area is how can we keep our existing plans more dynamic? Uh, they, as you know, many of you know, within organizations you develop a plan of body and, and you know, it could sit on the shelf and you have to dust it off now and then. <laughs> When the fact of it is, is even if you're looking at some of our older plans, the 20, uh, 1999 FIMP plan or the 2005 master plan or visitor master plan, there's a lot of implementation that's being done under those plans. There's even some policy changes that have been made uh, that have re relate to those plans, yet the plan itself tends to stay static, even though the world around it has been dynamic. So how you know can those intertwine? So some of these uh, upcoming <clears throat> slides will just point to that and then we can get into discussion. The master plan explicitly called out to update the planning framework, ref, uh, realizing that the master plan is a new kid in town and how does it relate to all these other plans? So we recognize that in the master plan uh, to have uh, a focus beyond, do we need to refine our planning methods and products to better inform and prioritize the efficient use of limited funding? So if we could uh, go to the next slide. So, you know, this was sort of staff who think about this stuff. We, we kind of pose these questions without answering them. But uh, what does updating the master plan look like? Uh, how do you sunset and update plans? Can building out in more detail the master plan take the place of some of our other plans or portions of it? Maybe our system-wide plans. What, uh, what about our system? Uh, it, what about our system is more static and what is more dynamic? Should we have more, more or less plans than we have now? How do we plan so that we can be more responsive to the dynamic situations around us? Can the community understand all of our plans and process? Who else reads them all? What types of information or level of detail should we go into each type of plan? So again, that's just you know us ruminating on the interesting questions we think about when we talk about our uh, building up a uh, planning framework. Next slide. So OSMP, we have a number of different plans. We have over 20 uh, on this list is not included now. Some of our recent site plans, our, our future four chambers plan, our Gephardt site plan, our Gumbill Hill site plan. Uh, so we're adding to the list uh, as we speak. Um, um, but uh, so, and, and of course the master plan up on top is, 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 is one of our newer overarching ones. 
And uh, obviously, uh, you like to get into a rhythm of updating plans, but when you're dealing with 20 to 25 different plans, updating them, and, and, and as some of you know who have been involved in Dave in particular, uh, something like uh, the agricultural master plan or resource plan or the grassland, that's a huge effort, not only from a staff level, but a community effort. I mean, probably thousands of hours of staff time and and you can't possibly repeat that every year with a whole bunch of different plans. So just the sheer numbers of plans creates a little bit of a capacity challenge for all involved. Uh, but ideally, you want these plans to be you know, kept alive in some form or fashion. Next slide. Or absorbed. Or absorbed. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, to the point of here's a, a <clears throat> listing of a number of our different plans over in the left. And now we have the new master plan over to the right. And, uh, you know, uh, is, there, is there absorption opportunities within this? Uh, if not, what are the uh, parallel lines crossing into each other? How do they relate to one another? Uh, um, and uh, uh, the master plan tends to speak more broadly. Uh, the plans uh, tend to speak more specifically, but yet there is policy direction within our plans and if we look, is our master plan more of a policy document? And if it is, should it kind of carry over some of those policy elements? And when you update the master plan, you're updating central parts of other plans. Mm -hmm. So just questions that we've been tossing around ourselves uh, as an organization. Uh, next slide. And uh, I think just to, you know, to be fully transparent, this is the one that I'm most intrigued about is how to keep our, our plans more in a dynamic state instead of a static state. And uh, one, uh, you know, I, I've been mentioning even implementing plans is you, we have tended to have a history where we don't take the implementation and go back and feed that into the plan as an appendix, as an addendum. Mm -hmm. And so if you open up the plan, for, I'll just take the 2005 visitor master plan, if you were a member of the public, you would just read it. You would think nothing in the world has changed about that plan in almost 20 years. Well, well, and in fact, uh, we're doing a whole bunch of mad management area designations. So 40 new properties are going to be done. Uh, the e-bike assessment was uh, related to that. We're doing a fee study. Uh, fees and fees was addressed in the visitor math plan. So we're going to do fee study. Like, how do these new things get incorporated into a plan, and how's that plan? see more dynamic. FEMP, the uh, forestry plan, we've done it. Uh, I think 80% of the implementations that were called for are done. Shouldn't that be fed into the plan in some sort of, so if you open it up, you can track where implementation's been done. So just a couple of examples of trying to make our plans more dynamic and less static over time. Uh, and, uh, oh, you can leave it on that slide. The other thing too is uh, part of the question here, and I'll leave it with that is, uh, sort of the scalpel approach is oftentimes we could look at a plan and you could say, you know, 80% of this plan is still working great. So if we want to change it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to say, okay, we need 15 hour, 1,500 hours of staff time fine, because we're going to update this whole plan. It could be, well, maybe it's just an element of that plan that needs to be updating. We actually made that decision with the um, uh, management area designations, the MADs and the fee studies. We can do those as one-offs within the plan. But if we do that, then how do we go back and keep the plan updated so the public and everybody knows that, that those elements of the plan have been updated, even though we didn't take the full plan and say we're opening it all up, because maybe a lot of that plan is still working for us. So that scalpel approach as far as in terms of every time we want to update, we got to update the whole thing. So just uh, those are a couple of things staff are interested in exploring a little bit with y'all. Thanks for that. Um, you know, and I understand from talking to Dave. Nothing's built. Uh, <laughs> Two phones and all computers fizzle. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know how these plans came to be. So I, I know that Matt, we in the past didn't have a master plan. So, but you did. You needed management direction, and I think we're about to to to, to build another plan around the wildlife interface. So, right, is that right? And so we're going to build another plan. And so is that, is that what we're, where we're headed for that? Management okay. guidance. Management guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if it's going to be called a plan or if it's not going to be called a plan. <laughs> but then we're going to build on top of that again. And so I understand the need to have direction and have that documented so that staff has like a set understanding of what they can do in particular situations. 
and then they can apply a particular situation to this 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 um, guidance that you've all developed to understand why it's kind of being it's it's um, helpful for staff to, to know these things. I think that the challenge is for the community to be able to follow sort of over time how we have scaffold things, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not I think I'm actually in support of that concept, and we probably just need to say it out loud as a board that we support that approach versus a massive overhaul. You know, one of the, of, for example, the, the BMP, you know, when I joined uh, and applied for open space, I was, I was advised to read the charter, to read the master plan and to read the visitor master plan. I didn't know that there were like 20 other plans out there <laughs> <laughs> until I actually joined, joined the board. And so a couple of uh, instances like with prairie dogs, I, um, I was like, okay, that that's guided by you know multiple plans, the ag plan and the grasslands plan, and then this whole process around prairie dogs. And I was like, it's just hard to follow, it, even though I, I am an insider. Like, okay, what is our guiding plan here, or or, or is it a, a few different ones? And we take pieces of it, and so understanding if there is a hierarchy and maybe there's not a hierarchy in all of these plans other than the master plan um that i think it just would be helpful so that that you know the prairie dogs was one example um the other example that came up recently is the paragliders like the paragliders want to um, revisit launch sites like is there is there a real clear way that we could guide them you, yes you could talk to staff but like Hey, go read the VMP and also read the master plan and get study up a bit. Do you also need to study up on the North TSA plan as well? <laughs> because it's here up in the north. So how do we guide them to um, just understand what, what policies exist? And then with the e-bikes, I found um, you know, just reading through a lot of the comments that the community submitted to us, which is like, it just seemed to be some confusion in my mind, and I'm very a very literal person, but um, some confusion in the community about well, the charter says this, and then well, actually the VMP says that, and the VMP is a you know a policy document that can be changed, and then um, you know and and we saw that happen in this last year. But if somebody were to come back five years ago and say, oh, I'm confused, I've read the VMP and I don't understand how we got from this point to that point, having some kind of like footnote to in 2023, BRC blah, blah, blah was changed to allow for e-bikes on open space and see, and that's it, just, just to like have a footnote to it. So I don't know if this is something that's, um, just unique to me, <laughs> mm -hmm. or if you all feel that same way about all of these plans, and I know you've all been involved in different planning processes, and then, and and just you know, if like I said, I don't think that we're going to have any answers today, other than you know, can can we just you know talk about how we understand the plans and where we might be going with them in the future, potentially. Michelle, would it be helpful if I took yeah. just a couple minutes to kind of talk about the hierarchy or the history of this, yeah. of the planning effort? I think so. Um, because that might help, you know, shed, shed a little more light on kind of where we end up headed. Mm -hmm. So when I first came to the Open Space Department in the early 90s, there was absolutely no planning whatsoever. Everyone, it, there were, weren't very many staff. There were probably 10 staff. And everyone did what they thought they should be doing. And so from my perspective, coming in new, it was like, well, you know, we probably need some guide, guidance, guideposts, you know, sidebars and things, not only for the staff, but for the community so that the community would understand, okay, you know, here's what's happening and here's, here's why it's happening. And, and so uh, not all of these plans are equal. Um, some of them were instructive in the early period uh, just because staff was not used to doing any kind of resource management planning. And so they were kind of little pieces that we chunked off to kind of get better at, at planning, knowing that, you know, in the future, they were going to be more extensive, bigger uh, planning efforts. And so the long range management policies came out in 90, 1995, and they were kind of the policy document, which was a summary of, okay, 
you know, here, here's kind of the context for, you know, management of, uh, of open space. And Mountain Parks was not part of the open space program at that time. And then the North Boulder, or North Boulder Valley and South Boulder Creek area management plans were more, you know, came after that in, in 1996, maybe 97. And they were meant to be chunks of the system and, and kind of, okay, when we're looking at the system itself, what, is, what does that actually mean? And how, you know, how do we do that? And so, again, it was kind of getting, you know, more experience and, and preparation on, you know, kind of what, what do we need to be doing, you know, in the future as far as uh, guiding, you know, our, our uh, management. And then uh, it struck me that, you know, there's some, there's some really extensive ecosystems uh, on, on the open space and mountain park system, you know, the forest ecosystem, the grassland ecosystem, wetlands, you know, and so, in the context of plan effort, we probably need to look at, you know, resources and resource management. And that was the genesis of the forest ecosystem management plan was to, again, try and get our arms around, uh, you know, kind of managing resources on the system that actually transcended, um, you know, political boundaries or, you know, or uh, manage or, yeah, management or planning boundaries. So they were more of the resources. So the, the forest ecosystem plan was the first one. The grasslands plan came along. The agricultural management plan came along, and and so those those were the intents um, beginning in the late '90s of trying to get our arms around. Okay, how do we manage, protect, restore, preserve, um, you know, large ecosystems? And so, in my my notion was that the area management plans weren't necessarily something that was going to provide a lot of future instruction. They were more tra training documents such that, you know, we'd be more sophisticated and more knowledgeable in the future on plans. And so um, that, so I'm, I was never wedded to the fact that those area management plans were going to continue, you know, having import or impact on, on the, the management. Um, but then it dawned on some of us that with the increase in visitor use, that we probably ought to, you know, have a start looking at a plan for, you know, kind of, okay, how are we going to manage increasing visitor use? And so that was the genesis in the uh, early 2000s of starting to look at the visitor master plan. Actually, it's called the visitor plan then. Um, and also it struck us that we needed more information. And so we were kind of saying, well, you know, if we get better and more extensive and comprehensive information, you know, that will help not only us, you know, know how to manage or what needs to be managed or whatever, but also the community. And so that more information equal better management. And so we, we started doing, you know, the, the, uh, resource surveys, the visitor surveys, you know, kind of all of this initial data collection effort in the late uh, 1990s and, and early 2000s to support the planning effort with the idea that, you know, the community and the staff, the department would benefit from uh, knowing more specifically what was happening on the ground and what perhaps needed to happen in the future. And so the, the visitor plan kind of morphed into the visitor master plan because, again, at that time, the city said, well, each department should have a master plan. And we were involved in the visitor plan. It's like, okay, we're going to call it the visitor master plan. And it'll, it'll serve as initially as the master plan, even though its intent initially was never to be, you know, an overarching master plan. And then out of that, um, that whole public process came the trail study area uh, notion that, um, and this was again, was an attempt as some of you probably remember or know that there was a, a lot of uh, conversation about you know, visitor management and, and what that meant. And so this was an effort to involve the community in more of you know, a specific planning process to provide, you know, uh, recreational access, but also protect, you know, the natural resources and stuff. And so 
the, those TSAs were a direct result. We had the community groups, we formed community groups. And so there was a real community effort in developing the TSAs, which were, again, somewhat like the area management plans, it kind of came back to focus on specific areas of the system and, and our notion that one size doesn't fit all. And so the visitor master plan provided that overarching context, but the trail study areas were looking at, okay, what specific recreational uh, issues or concerns do we need to address and, and uh, resolve in particular areas? Uh, so anyway, that was uh, that was basically the planning effort. Some of these other ones, the acquisitions plan, again, the acquisitions for the open space program were, were completely opportunistic. Well, maybe not completely, but mostly opportunistic historically. <coughs> you know, it was, here are lands that we think, you know, we are interested in and, uh oh, if they're available, you know, now we go. And so there wasn't really... Uh, an, an overarching plan to acquire land. It was it was more like, well, here in general are the, is the area we're interested in, and if these prop if properties become available, then we'll we'll be ready to go. Um, you know, based on the acquisition plan and uh, the new property plans. Um, we kind of early on finessed that there was no real, you know, specific property planning, even though Boulder County actually did that. Um, we really didn't feel, or the department didn't feel we had the, the uh, wherewithal staff wise to do that. And so we saw some of, you know, the, the uh, trail study area, the visitor master plan kind of being that overarching uh, those overarching plans um, as far as the direction of specific properties. And that was with the understanding that or the knowledge that, geez, in the future, we, we probably ought to be focused on, you know, specific property management as well, kind of more finely tuned um, in, in that regard. So anyway, uh, that was a, a, a long way of saying that's kind of how the, the planning effort started. And it was a an attempt to gather data, you know, good information and use that information in a context that informed and directed our management efforts uh, in the future. So. That's helpful. I mean, I, I think that knowing that history of how we came to so many plans <laughs> was really helpful. Um, but I think we, I, not, I, I think the, a monster has been created, and that that is uh, that is here. Is that you know that we really in a, in kind of a sophisticated environment shouldn't have so many plans. And, and Michelle's absolutely right. It's now it's rather more than informing the community. It's you confusing right. now, <laughs> you know. And so I think it's incumbent upon us as the board and the staff to. Uh, refine or define, okay, you know, here's exactly kind of what the plans that we're going to be using and, and here are some, you know, potential plans that we'll need to do in the future and so that there's a more clear relationship uh, that's established so that people kind of can better, more, quick, more quickly and more uh, completely understand the relationship between uh, all these plans. Absolutely, exactly what you just said, um, that, especially that last sentence. I, I, I think that um, it is still bewildering, and I know that staff knows how to use them. When we, we come to a program update, there's references to all these other plans, and I'm like, dang it, I didn't read that. I don't have the ag plan memorized. I don't have the grassland plan memorized. I'm like, am I actually making the, you know, the right recommendation here, having not read all of these other plans that impact um, how we manage prairie dogs? But I, I guess for me, the, the the overarching question is how do we how do we reconcile um, sort of what we've told the community and, and the community's expectations, and and maybe that's just going through a process and saying it out loud, and saying that you know we are, um, you know, we, we promised the community an East TSA, and we I, I don't know of any plans to actually produce an East TSA, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe we just say that out loud that we're 
we're not going to do one. Yeah. Well, I would say a couple of questions on TSA. So when we look at a TSA, which is a big effort, Dave, as you know, as long as we have all the staff together, let's look at some other things too, restoration opportunities, education opportunities. So we always call them site plans now, more than like a, just a trail study area. We It's beyond trails for us now. It's like uh, uh, um, Heather and her team, what are the restoration opportunities here? Uh, Janelle and her team, what are the educational opportunities here? So we tend to call them site plans now. As far as East TSA, yes, that, that when I came in and I was looking at, oh, East TSA is, is on deck and we just finished North TSA. Well, let's get a sense of the dollar ticket associated with these plans. We're still only halfway done with West TSA. NTSA just got adopted. It's like, it's turning out that these, 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 you know, they, these could be up to $30 million plans that we're adopting. Would it, how gen, disingenuous would it be for us to say, okay, now we're going to take on East TSA. And after you give us your guidance, we'll be back in about 10 or 15 years because we're still implementing those other ones. And by the time you do that, you tell the community, oh, we're, we're doing that. And because 15 years ago, you said to do that. And they're like, well, I wasn't even here. 15. So then we we put a pause on the idea of a grand ESTSA because we're just starting to hit, you know, getting the ball rolling in NTSA because we were knee deep in West TSA and we have the trail maintenance backlog, which is just routine trails throughout that need love and attention. So that's the thing on the East TSA. But in lieu of the East TSA, from a management perspective, what do we need to answer? We had some issues out of Gumbill Hill, Gumbill Hill, which would have been in the East TSA. We have some issues at Gephardt, which would have been a part of the East TSA, and we have four chambers. So instead of doing the grandiose, we are doing a few lighter touches that are reasonably implemented in the short term uh, while we're continuing to implement the bigger plans like West TSA and NTSA. So quick answer to the question of why not right now a big grand East TSA. Um, but it, that does point out to or trying to get a better, before we say yes to something, what are the parameters? How, you know, we could say, yeah, let's just create this plan. And we end up walking away with a $40 million price tag to that plan. Should we instead start to look at what that price tag may be before we go in? So we, we could set some parameters and scope around a, a future planning effort so we can be responsive and we're not sitting as a department thinking, oh, we're laggards. We're just, you know, we can only put so much in our budget every year to implement these plans because they're some of them are big ticket items. So just trying to balance out future work planning, future budgets with plan implementation and how all that timing works out too is also on our minds. Yeah, I think that's important to know. I mean, you live in East Boulder. I mean, I live in South Boulder. Um, and then you live in North Boulder. Like, we were kind of, um, we're kind of covered. Do our East Boulder people, are they aware that we are actually tending to their needs, even though we have not put a price tag onto the, the body of work that, that would be um, associated with an East TSA plan? I know you're doing site plans. So I, I don't know if the community really understands that you're tackling smaller issues rather than a big plan. Mm -hmm. And in lieu of just, I mean, basically you're not ignoring East, the Eastern part of Boulder. Um, we know that, um, but it, it may look like on paper that it's missing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think when I joined um, OSBT, we were actually talking about updating the VMP and then potentially calling it a recreation for yeah, I think it was a recreation. We threw around different names for it, a recreation plan, um, just because people continue to reference the VMP, um, and a lot of those those components have been updated. And so, it, I you know just to be able to point people to the right direction. Oh well, yeah, the VMP is kind of the guiding document, <laughs> but there have been updates to it. But you know, because we ref they you know we're talking about a document that was that's we said we were gonna refresh every five years. It's not possible to refresh that every five years. And we haven't touched it in 18 years, right? It, so it, um, well, it's, I think it was published like 20? 2005. 2005. So, you know, we haven't touched it in that time frame, at least explicitly. 
it, we, we've we've tackled different components of it, and that's, I think that's the right approach. It just it is it just as confusing. I don't know. I'm I'm interested in other people's perspective on this. I know. Um, so we do have a plan for plans. Like, is there a master plan of planning? I mean, is it like okay, this one goes here and here, and we're going to do this with this one? I mean, it, it's very meta, but I, I'm not being uh, cute here. Like, is do, do we have a? We we do not have a schedule for when. FEMS being updated, your cultural management plan is updated because we don't want to assume that that's how, what we want our approach collectively to be. Um, are we going to continue to uh, carry around 20 to 25 plans and update them every so often and let's put them on a schedule? If the answer is yes, we'll put them on a schedule uh, that would be able to be work planned in and supported through a budget. If we have a different approach, let's call it out now and, uh, well, or let's call it out and uh, develop more of a specific plan for what that new planning approach may be. I, I think, you know, just, just shooting from the hip here, I, I think staff putting together a, a proposal on this and, and for, for us and the public to react to uh, would be great. Um, I think the, the if you're getting one consistent direction, I mean, and, and, and from Dave, who's been here from, from from you know day zero at least in terms of time planning. immemorial yeah time immemorial <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah when when the first plan came out online and he 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 feels like he's living in a slightly dystopian planning world now yeah. with too many so I, I think I think that's a key insight and I think that would be on whatever time frame makes sense for you this isn't you know tomorrow but I, I would say a plan for plans and and figuring out okay where does the VMP fit in with the master plan all these things and then us reacting to it and then figuring out who else needs to react to it. I think that would be great. I think in the meantime, um, if you've got an intern who needs something to do, <laughs> um, annotating these, I can imagine the VMP, you got, hey, this is the VMP, you know, it's it has not been touched. This is the 2005 version. Here's the annotated version. And it's a bit of a mess, but you're in there and I don't know if it's a PDF with a bunch of notes and references, but there's some version of some of these key planning documents that have notes to the public on like, okay, well, we made this decision, you know, council did this about e-bikes and here's the link to that decision. I don't know. Again, I don't, I wouldn't want it to be a make work project for some, for y'all because you're overworked as it is. But if, if this was a nonprofit thing, I'd, I'd find a really smart intern to like, do this. I don't know. But, you know, it's, and it's kind of a, Again, just an idea, but it's like it's like a, it's like an intermediate step between them being living documents versus these things ensconced in amber that, mm -hmm. that apparently haven't changed. And I think the other question I have is: Are there legal, cultural, or political implications <laughs> for messing with these plans? Mm -hmm. Out, like for example, let's say we've decided the five of us, hey, let's just go back into the West TSA, and. Um, I mean, mountain bikes and Mesa Trail, not a big deal. Let's just do it. Um, obviously, that would <laughs> that wouldn't work. That's an extreme example. People would cry bloody murder. But what is if we made a small tweak to it? Is it are we within you know staff and board? Yeah. Are we within our bounds to do that? Yeah. Are we morally, culturally, or politically bound to go back to the public because there was an implied promise to them during the West TSA <clears throat> process? I think mean, these are interesting questions that I don't know the answer to. Yeah. And Brady, those are the that's where we start as a staff. It, exactly with that. And and in fact, you know, the uh, Prairie Dog Preferred Alternative, we we started off with uh saying what is the scope of this project of looking back of what's working over the last and then as we determine what was working and what means refinement, we actually then kind of cause it call the time out, asked our legal counsel, Janet Michaels, who is our open space CAO rep and brought her in saying of all these refinements that we want to make how much is a management decision with it with that's within the purview of the policy direction versus what we might need to revisit from a policy standpoint that staff in and of itself and the board does not have the authority to say heads up on. and that's where we land where heather working with janet michaels to determine that it's the geographic scope that needs to go back through a council approval process that's just one example i know yeah. it's just but that's, yes, we, we do that. And then there's also more of this, uh, what's good business practice? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, we this probably is a management decision, but we need a day like this. I mean, a small example is just replacing that sign 
up at, uh, oh, oh yeah that's one we we, we could have done there's no policy that says that you all or the council or community needed to weigh in at all on that but we just said you know what with that one i think we need to bring that out so there, those decisions are they're sort of being thought about all the time but yes it, some are legal questions like is this a policy change in which got in const in const through council action and that's where we work with our CA, cao throughout the year on different issues so yes there's all those questions need to be asked um you know I, I think the notion of keeping a annotated plan or some sort of updated appendix or something uh i, th I think is interesting because to anyone going back and reading these plans right that have changed a lot the, the BMP is the one that comes to mind the most, uh, you know, after reading through it when we were talking about e-bikes, you know, there's quite a few things in there that I feel like have changed or out of date. And, you know, if someone was to go pick up that document and look at it, they're going to be like, oh, you know, they're going to get a very different impression from, you know, the reality on the ground. Um, so, it, you know, it, I don't know if we need to create that or updating the document, but right now, having gone through it, right? It, it feels like there's a lot of stuff that's out of date in it. The e bikes didn't exist back then, so mm -hmm. the world has changed then. Yeah, I think the department has certainly gained some experience in another field of, of what Brady is suggesting as far as, you know, looking at annotation of, of plans as kind of an initial step to uh, clarify, you know, both the their content as well as their relationship. And, and that is uh, in microcosm, the library, because historic, it, the Department of Library, historically, there, you know, people had, there were tons of documents, reports, books, papers that every staff person had and, and used, but no one had any idea about what it was, you know, extensively, and that was, the, again a, a decision and we hired or not we the department hired someone uh, or a number of people i don't know was heather uh, who was i think uh, intimately involved in that but a number of people that worked on creating a, a and i'm using this word slightly uh, carefully a workable library and so that there was kind of a central repository of information on you know open space and mountain parks system that would be available to staff and even to the public under you know certain circumstances and, and then it all went online yeah, yeah. right <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. i'm still going around my printed version right now. <laughs> right. but, but that that was a, a deliberate concerted effort i mean that that didn't happen organically it, it happened because you know people said gee you know, we need to know what the extent of uh, what we officially have as information for this system. So I'm going to try to bring this full circle because I'm, I'm just going to be aware, conscious of time here. But um, it sounds to me like there is OSBT support to consolidate and simplify and annotate the, the planning process if that's something that staff would like to take on and um and, and present a, a proposal to do yeah. so and and then we can just you know get that process sort of like stated in the public so that we're like i said saying it out loud we're saying out loud that we're not going to go through a, a giant bmp process um a bmp update process um that we are going to take this scalpel approach and we're going to be transparent with updates that we make to policies and that have been um updated so um mm -hmm. i think that's the direction that we are that's uh, we have consensus around that mm -hmm. can i just add something i you know i i think um so often in in public uh, agency life the planning process is this Herculean effort. And then after the planning process is over, you have this shiny plan, which kind of lives as a dusty ball and chain or an occasionally employed hammer where, you know, it's, it's just there and you're not really responding to it, but it's nagging, you know, we spent all this time working on this plan, it's up on the shelf, or, you know, you pull it out every once in a while, you know, and strategically purpose the plan as the hammer, you know, this policy is not being met. So we're not going to, 
do this or this policy is doing this or we are going to do this. Um, and that's cherry picking parts of the plan. Whereas what I see OSMP wanting to do is use plans in all manner of different ways as frameworks, living frameworks. You know, that's the best possible outcome, I think. You know, this is how we guide our expenditures. This is how we guide the, you know, work choices that individual work groups make, that, you know, the director assigns and all that stuff comes back to the plans. And so, I, I mean, I wouldn't be saying this if it weren't for, you know, the way that OSMP behaves, which I think is incredibly forward thinking and different from, from a lot of public agencies. But I would suggest having listened to this conversation, a vision and take it for what it is, you know, it may or may not work for you. Um, but, you know, taking Brady's idea of absorption, what if some of these plans do get absorbed into the master plan, but only at the policy level. I think that's the important level for absorption. So, you know, you take facilities management, you know, it's got a plan, but, you know, we're, we're absorbing, you know, a big policy like, you know, new trailheads should be built to, you know, consider climate change, right? Um, there may be an implementation strategy under that policy, like Michelle said at the last OSA, meeting about how shade structures are really important in modern trailhead design, right? But that doesn't need to live in the master plan. That needs to live in the facilities management plan that only exists as, you know, sort of a guidepost and, and a set of strategies for facilities management. And I think the, the radical portion of this is that it, it definitely considers the public's input at the policy level, but it really extracts a lot of the functional stuff out of the plans and leaves it at staff level, leaves it more malleable, leaves it more able to be adaptively managed at the staff level without a whole lot of public process. So, you know, and there, there may be people listening who, you know, think this is awful. Um, you know, personally, I think it's awful to, you know, spend hours and hours in the public process developing, you know, individual implementation strategies. I don't think, I think that's best left to the experts, but that's, that's just where I live. Um, so I guess my, my notion would be, then you have these, you know, you have the policy stuff absorbed into the master plan and then any individual plans that could still exist, but not as public policy documents. You know, you have a staffer or work group that owns a plan, and you know the plan guides their work. The plan's regularly updated where implementation items are completed. You know the plan might contain functional guidance, like you know first this plan is designed to implement the following master plan strategy. So you tie the you know the work plan back to the master plan, and then you have you know the implementation strategies. This is how we get to the outcomes, and then you have specific implementation items. And when they get done, they get checked off. So the plan is, is more of like a living document, but it doesn't have to be updated every five years. It doesn't have to be brought in front of OSMP necess or OSBT necessarily. Um, and it also allows for that adaptive management. So you might have implementation strategies and then you realize, well, that one doesn't work. So through adaptive management is the staff that's actually working that plan. Maybe we take one of those implementation strategies out and maybe we, you know, and when I say we, I mean OSMP changes it. You know, that's that's my thought is is let the policy document be a policy document, and and I think the outcome of that is that the planning frameworks are more living and more useful to the people who actually work those plans. The master plan is more comprehensive and understandable for the public, and you don't have to go flipping through fourteen different plans to get to an answer. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Just to make sure I'm hearing correctly, <clears throat> I heard Brady asking for a, a plan for plans, almost as if it's kind of a schedule and overview of like, here's our existing plans and inventory. And then when do we propose updating those? Or when is one going to go into another? And, okay. and you could you could adopt Harmon's idea, which is basically like 
one existing plan maybe branches out and a few things shoot up into a policy document Great. and other parts of it shoot down into an, a site specific implementation document that isn't a policy governance Great. world. I mean, if, if I heard you correctly. Yeah, yeah that's so, that, so that's clear. So we may say instead of updating the ABC plan, we're actually going to kind of, it's going to be obsolete, but all the nuts and bolts of it are going to be integrated into this new. Yeah, or maybe one or two policy things elevate into the, the master plan. Yeah, and it doesn't have to happen all at once. You, know, like you, you don't have the staff resources to do that. But, you know, I think if I had to choose between a plan that was, you know, part of a big, robust public process gathering dust, or, you know, let's pull that plan off the shelf, take, you know, the really useful policy direction out of that plan, inject it into the master plan in a, in a robust public policy discussion, and then strip off all of the, you know, the functional guidance, implementation strategies and goals that, fo that flow from that policy stuff. And then, you know, that goes into, you know, sort of an internal staff guidance document that is really just meant to implement what we all agreed on or the policies. And that plan's gone from something that has to be updated and cataloged and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And Michelle, with what you stated earlier, does that align with, because I think what you said is, can we as a board start to coalesce and agree on, like, let's take, let's kind of more adopt this scalpel approach instead of this, is that aligning with what? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So out of the spirit of transparency, I've just made a running list of plans that have recently are hot off the shelf and we're starting to implement or things that are coming down the pike in the next few years. and. I've already got a list of 12, 13 different things. It's, you know, anywhere from 40 management area designations, HCA activations, some uh, decisions on HCAs that have yet to been activated. Uh, look at the fee study, uh, the preferred alternative prairie dogs, updating the FEMP and with the CWPP coming down the pipe. There's a big change uh, that's coming our way. Four Chambers, Gap Park, Gum Barrel, Chautauqua, Trailhead Site Plan, uh, survey and data collections that are ongoing, uh, climbing access management trails might be a thing that's coming down the pike in the future. So like those are just next three years, but yeah, that's a lot of stuff. And what I'm hearing is, is you're getting a six year peak at the CIP. Maybe here's some scalpel approaches that we're going to be looking at, including another site plan we want to get working on, including there's all these other things and just find a way to daylight those. And out of that might become some discussions or some thumbs up or some yeah. You know. Do you see a way from where from here to there though? A way from where we are today. <laughs> with your, you got like, okay, this is all coming down. Yeah, I think, the, do these I think the challenge is is if we all feel like these these scalpel uh where we need either management guidance or policy uh, when we want to do these things on that left list I just referred to, how much capacity can we put towards annotating and updating the existing plans that maybe isn't even right for revisiting, but a lot's right. happened and they got to keep them. So how, how much can we bite off and chew of keeping an existing plan dynamic if there's no call to even do anything within it in the next three years? Like what's that capacity balance look like? I think that's going to be the challenge for us. And I think, you know, it's, it's not dissimilar to kind of the initial effort with the area management plans, which was Kind of okay. Let's pick a place that you know we we know and that we can use as kind of that trial, and you know and, and see how things work. I think in this case too, uh, we we ought to be surgical in selecting. Okay, what you know what really makes sense initially, which will give us both the experience or expertise and and uh, guidance to be doing this in the future. So you know there's. It's it, there's kind of a trial and error component, but it's on one that's relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. And I think staff probably needs to talk about okay, what what does that actually end up looking like? So you're not kind of wrestling around with biting off far more than you can chew, but you're saying okay, here's what we want to here's some where we want to focus our initial efforts and see how that goes, and then we can transpose what works well uh, into the future and learn from what didn't work so well. Okay, so 
uh, I think we'll 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 try to daylight what's in the future of of plans for you all, and then also maybe staff could talk about which ones of these existing plans can we try that annotation kind of updating with and is it the BMP is it the FEMP and which a number of like which ones would provide that good template for this is what looks like taking a static plan and suddenly making it dynamic without really even doing anything other than incorporating new information that's come to light and then we could come forward and have a discussion of does this feel right does this look like I think that's interesting I, I think I think my personal opinion is, is what Harmon proposed and, and this the kind of plan for plans and having a, a vision for the, for the for how the plans are going to, how is it going to be less mm -hmm. is it going to be a more policy one and then I, I think that is probably in my view probably the most useful expenditure of time is getting a real clear view of like what is what is the planning framework we want to live under in 10 to 20 years where there's not going to snowball, and then we got 40 plans or 60 plans, and and they never sunset, they never get absorbed. You know, I, like I said, I think the annotated plans see, sounds good. I, I would put that on, you know, give it to your smart intern. <laughs> Whereas I think the real critical work is like, what is what what are what what do we want that to look like in 10 or 20 years, and and how does this not going to just keep snowballing? Mm -hmm. Maybe we need a nomenclature change where, you know, the master plan is a plan, right? But, you know, if you if you put the policies in that plan, then these framework documents, at least the ones I'm envisioning and proposing um, that guide a particular functional group within OSMT, maybe we call them programs. You know, this becomes Jeff's facilities management program. And, you know, that is the living document. It's guided by these plan statements that are, you know, we, we, we took the plan we, you know, worked the plan and took the policy out of it, agreed on where the policy needs to be and elevated that into that facilities management section of the master plan. And we pull to make the facilities management program, we pull those plan policy and strategies down into the program and say, this program is guided by these policies, which can be found in the master plan. And here are, you know, our priorities and here are implementation strategies and here are our measurable goals under that, you know, that's kind of a, yeah. and I, I just bring up the idea of calling them programs or calling them some other name that, that you would choose um, because then you, you know, you clearly demarcate, you know, this is a planning document and this is a functional document that lives under that plan. Yeah. Yeah, I get one of the, uh, yeah. This is, this could be a classic time for consultants. And, and as a former person who ran lean organizations, I don't like pulling consultants in, but when you see, an executive like yourself who's looking at 20 things coming down the pike at them and it's just like whoa i got to get this stuff done in the next year sometimes that's the time to management consulting to say like okay we, we, we can pull some experts in it's just an idea I mean, this mm -hmm. is, pull some experts in who helped other cities who are in a similar situation you know we, we it's going to cost a little bit of money but you know the, you all can keep working on keeping the, the things running and then we have somebody on the outside coming in with more dispassionate kind of look at like, well, you've done some amazing things. I can see how this is all sort of evolved. And now it's time to be a little bit more intentional about how these things are going to work. And here's the, here's a, here's some ideas for a flow chart. It, it, it might be a time to, to pull in an outside expert to help us with this. Would you approve that in the budget? <laughs> uh, I mean, if, if you all say we can pay for, I mean, I, you know, yeah, it would. It's just a thought. Yeah. Or master once the master plan update was scheduled for next year, right? And now 25. 25. Yeah. yeah. And just so to, we're in the just, flux. Of yeah, just to let you know what's going on. So the citywide management team, led by our city manager, we are in the process of developing the city's first strategic plan, mm -hmm. which is sort of the, we have the Bowl, Bowl Valley Comp plan and then we have department plans, and there's nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And our city manager feels strongly and, and, and talking with our leadership team made up all the department directors that we need something between those two documents. And so we're in the process of, uh, and Lauren uh, referred to it as developing a strategic plan at the citywide level. So while we're doing that, uh, the city manager asked us just, hey, if anybody has a new master plan on the horizon or an update, can you just call it time out on that until we get this new flow of, Oh, annual work plans, three to five year work plans, department master plans, 
citywide strategic plan, Boulder Valley comp plan before that whole triangle gets filled mm -hmm. in. Uh, so right now, the idea of updating our master plan, you know, but that's that's sort of a short term horizon of it. Can we call a timeout on that? Not, 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 don't time out on implementing them, but, and so just to give you a heads up, we'll, you'll probably hear more about that citywide effort of a citywide strategic plan. And we also probably are getting away from the nomenclature of master plans. Uh, we've heard that from an equity perspective. So they're probably gonna be called department-wide strategic plans eventually or something like that. So just a couple of things up to float already up in that regards, so. All right, we're ready to conclude this section. So and uh, so next, <laughs> next we can put a bow on that. <laughs> okay, but try to. But um, let's take a five-minute break if that's all right. So I'll bring us back a six-minute break. That would bring us back at eleven twenty-five. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. That was yeah. a, a good conversation, Joe. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, I think we can get started. All right, um, I'll just I'll just go ahead and start. Um, we are going to enter this section called uh, OSBT Rules of Procedure Review and Update. Um, Dave and I are going to co-facilitate this particular section. One th um, great thing about OSBT is we have this document, and it's something that we make um, very visible to the public. And it's also something that we consider to be a living document. So it's really something that we all can um, lean to when we have questions about how our board um, attacks business every month or, or regularly. And um, we have, at least in my two and a half years of being on the board, this has been something that we've, we've edited every year. And I think it's a good practice. Um, this year, we thought that we would open it up again we have a couple of new board members, and um, we've also had some challenging experiences this year. And we found ourselves in um, a place where we didn't have as much guidance from existing BRC code than what we had hoped for, um, and it, to navigate that particular situation. You know, that situation aside, we, we realized that you know this you know, revisiting this document, which is basically an agreement of how we are going to work together, um, just, you know, and, and establish some norms. Um, and then um, in this process, you know, tighten up some things that may be redundant to other documents. Um, and, and therefore, again, confusing that, that kind of ties into that conversation that we had earlier about master plans is like, let's, let's let the, the, the um, guiding document carry. Um, and then let's, fill in um, what, what might not be there for us. Um, so any other like opening words, Dave, that, that you have for this particular process? Well, I am thought we probably should go through, you know, article by article and get people's um, suggestions or comments on either revisions or or whether everything looks okay. Um, I, I think Michelle and I, were uh, specifically wanted wanted to focus on board functions and responsibilities so that we would be clear, as Michelle said, in light of kind of some of our experiences this year, that um, this document uh, provides enough uh, guidance and clarity on on both the procedures and uh, the responsibilities. And I know Brady, um, you have uh, some suggestions as. Um, as far as uh, meeting uh, process and things like that, a consent, you know, the proposal for uh, putting a consent agenda, you know, as, as part of a board function. Um, so we will give you an opportunity okay. to talk to that um, whenever that's appropriate. Okay, well, if um, we're in agreement that we're gonna open up this document, there were some suggestions that were emailed to Dan. Um, that we wanted to incorporate here today. Um, one big one was really about um, board participation and you know what are those norms? 
um, there, there's a tiny little piece to it because I, I decided to open up um, BRC 2-3-1 and 2-3-9. Last night, or actually on Sunday, and, um, and and just to see where we had overlap with our particular document, and um, you know, yeah, a, a, around sort of conduct, and so most of those things are really not addressed that we really wanted to talk about here today. That they're not addressed in this particular document. There is a reference in here that um, in two dash three dash one um, about you know, respective boards and commissions rules of procedure. So I, I think that it is within our purview to, to address, you know, what are our expectations of, of each other basically. And some of those things that came out in, um, in the feedback had to do, shoot, um, had to do with, you know, how, how we, um, how we fulfill our duties to the public. Um, and that has, um, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, what is our expectation in attending business meetings, study sessions, field trips, and open houses? Um, and, and, you know, what do we do when there are regular absences? Um, and um, what do we do when, or, or actually how do, how do we treat one another? Um, in terms of, and, and not just each other as board members, but also with staff. Just, I, I think that it's valid to be able to just say out, out loud that we expect one another to treat each other with respect. Um, so and that's big, but I, I think, you know, that's one of the things- hasn't been the case. That, that is not always the case. So I, I was gonna suggest, oh, sorry. I just think a purpose statement sometimes is really important. Like if you say, you know, that it is important that we have an open and collegial discussion, you know, and in order to facilitate, in order to promote that openness and collegiality and, you know, freedom to, you know, kick ideas around together, you know, we think it's vital that board members treat each other, you know, collegially and with respect and, you know, so if you just set up what the reason is for it, why do we need to be respectful for each other? Because, you know, so much of debate is not based in respect. It's based in adversarial dialogue so that you get to the truth, right? But if we say we're not interested in adversarial dialogue, we're interested in cooperative conversation that results in, you know, good ideas. So in that regard, I was going to ask Dan, um, whether we should, and I think your suggestion is a good one, Armin, whether we should have as Article One kind of a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so that includes, uh, you know, board responsibilities or I don't know that we say behavior, but board um, decorum. decorum. Uh, and then we, then the current Article One is on officers, but then so that would become Article Two would be then the procedural you know, election and uh, selection of officers and that sort of thing. So that uh, I think it is a, a good idea to have a purpose statement because I, again, I don't know whether the public, if they look at this kind of wonder, well, what's the point? Um, or whether it's inherent and intuitive, but I think even if it's inherent and intuitive, we should say what it is mm -hmm. um, to be clear. And I think, um, the suggestions right now is uh, as far as how we interact with each other and with the public uh, are good ones and we should record those. I think there was suggestion on, you know, the, well, actually the meeting time may go, actually go under meetings, but, um, but there may be some other things that we want to put in a, you know, in a purpose statement or, or, I don't know whether we say board responsibilities or, or something. So it's duly noted that, you know, if you're on the board, here's, well, here are the expectations. Yeah, of, yeah. I, in fact, I agree with that word. I, whether it ends up being a purpose statement because the purpose of this is different than the purpose of, like the, so maybe expectations right. might be a word within that heading that might be good. Like what are the expectations that we're all, right. 
expecting of one another. Let's just see what all goes into that paragraph and then we can determine, mm -hmm. is this a versus purpose statement? Is this an expectation statement or what is it? Right, yeah. okay. But, in my notes, I just took a, a shot at trustee expectations and conduct. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if that's like too harsh, but I think when you join the board, this is a document that you're gonna read and you're mm -hmm. gonna agree to follow. Mm -hmm. Um, some of it's very tactical about meetings and such, but I think just having that agreement that we're, we're going to do certain things. Um, one of them I thought to clear up like what for, uh, as a bullet point, and it would allow us to clean up the rest of the document would be trustees shall conduct their duties in accordance to the open space charter to BRC 2-3-1 and BRC 2-3.9. So the expectation is that you read it and then you um, conduct yourselves according to those guiding documents. So any that, opposition that to that? Fine. Is, yeah, has anyone um, read those dash documents? Yes, I, I have when I joined the board, <laughs> but uh, it was Maybe. tough for me to find them or to know what to read in some cases. So I think having that guidance very explicitly like Here's the, here's the section well, you should read. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, would, would be helpful. And to add on to John's point, you know, in the course of one of the uh, actions that we had to take this year, uh, we had to utilize, um, you know, those provisions in the BRC. We did, unfortunately. And, and we have them bookmarks now. <laughs> so, so I think it's good to identify those uh, because clearly, those are kind of the, the important, or, um, that's the important direction. I'm wondering if this consensus that we're going to add an article here, do we want to also assign an author or a group of two as we go through these things? Because I view this as a trustee document rather than a staff document. So uh, typically what we'll do is in November, we'll probably bring all the refined language and ask for thumbs up to officially amend this. So we would need, as we suggest sections if we could get some volunteers too to kind of work on it that would be helpful as, as we go through this well i'll admit that i took a stab at a lot of these things already but if the, I, i'm not assuming that you're all going to agree to these things so i can project if you want me to i'm not probably the best secretary i want to be able to contribute to the conversation yeah. so do you want me to just send you what i have Whatever you're more, either way is fine. I'm happy to capture it, or if you'd like to just share, that's okay too. Is that okay? Can I ask a yeah. process question, yeah. Michelle? Is the is the goal here to come up with language real time and approve a document today, no. or is no. the goal to flag? We can't approve here? it today. Good. <laughs> the goal is to flag certain things and get direction, and then draft, and then look at it again at a later time. Well, that could be the goal, Brady. Uh, I think an alternative goal would be to get at least some consensus today on language, such that then that can be in the draft that comes before the board and official. It just meeting. makes it a little more efficient if we have just at least we're writing stuff down. Okay. But yeah. We don't have to, we actually can't approve it yeah. today. Right, right. right. But are you I just don't want to write here on my committee. Yeah, That's I right. think there's this yeah. micro wordsmithing yeah. versus getting the concept. Is this yeah. kind of saying it yeah. now? We could build out some wordsmithing yeah. on after the meeting. But would yeah. you like to? I'm, I'm just happy to be on the I think that'd be great for draft. I'm sure. And do we want, um, Michelle? Do we want to include if we're doing the two threes? Do we want to just do the Chapter seven in Title Two, which is the General Code of Conduct. Mm, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So that's two seven. That. Doesn't want me to file something. So to get closure on the, this, Michelle, are you okay? Uh, you and Harmon, if we need to have further language drafted, uh, taking a stab at that. Yes. We were okay. great. Right. Right. So great. But we would still. But we're still going to try, try that as a, much as a we straw can. person. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Straw dog. Straw dog. Straw dog. Straw dog. Straw dog. So I think <laughs> is everyone in agreement that we should uh, make a new article and that article should be article one? Is there any? That sounds good. And I think so, hyperlinking to the relevant code okay. would make you know, life easier for everyone. Yep. So the title of the article would be purpose or expectations of, of board. 
yeah. members? Something like you know, expectations of trustees. Okay. Semicolon decorum. Is the subject heading or something like that? Right. Something to that effect. Um, okay. There we go. For participation. Oh, you don't see my stuff, huh? Hmm. Oh, I reshared what? Yeah. I, 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 I took a, 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 a maze, but yeah, I started. Did you, you sent me something? Yeah. Because it sent. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right, anything after one? Mm -hmm. I'm in CPUs on the room right now. It's just what? Standing. What? <laughs> just the number of devices running <laughs> this room right now. How many do you have? I have like four, four. in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> You're the main offender. All right, here you go. All right, thank you. Mine are all talking to each other just fine, however. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Okay, nobody's seen this. This is just a brain dump that I that I just tried to um, start here, um, and we can wordsmith it or not, but or just agree to the principles here. Um, I think the first point we said that we we're also going to add the the reference to code of conduct, but I don't remember what that one's called. Yeah, it's just in uh, BRC two seven. And I think on the charter, Leah, we ought to uh, put the specific section. Yeah. Was it section seven or whatever it is? Two point seven. Oh, yeah, the BRC is what? Two, 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 two dash seven. Two dash seven. But then the charter, I should know this, but the charter is wh whatever the yeah, citation, the general section of the charter. Can that up and make it Yeah, it was okay. We'll add it later. Yeah. The second, I don't know if they're, yeah, we'll link hyperlink those. Um, there is a hole in the two in um, two dash three dash one B eight that refers to um, allowing virtual attendance if our rules of procedure allow it. So I think we we just need to say that we allow it yeah. in our rules of procedure. Would you say that would be under purpose or under Article 2 meetings um, that virtual attendance is? Didn't we say we could figure out where these go? Mm -hmm. OK. Later. OK. Yeah. But yes, I think it's probably goes there. On the virtual attendance, I think we should add a, a, a partial statement that says, upon notification of the chair and the direct the department director and approval, so that uh, virtual attendance is permitted upon notification, so that um, somebody doesn't just dial it in. Right, time. right. And and again, well, we also have meditation, meal plans, and all that, but. Um, Trustees are expected to attend meetings in person. Um, Something like that. You know, yeah. So we establish that as one of the expectations. Maybe right? that's the lead in sentence. You know, sure. if if personal, you know, physical participation is impossible, then you know, make the request. You don't have adequate child care. Right. Yeah. Okay. Not feeling yeah. well. Um, out of town. Right. There are a lot. 20 different yeah. reasons why that might happen. But yeah, I think I think putting in a we prefer in person somehow. Or is preferred instead of expected. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, can it, you guys can you guys can words with that. But yeah. yeah. And and I think notification seems sufficient rather than approval. Mm -hmm. Um oh, yeah. uh, I know you're suggesting approval, but I, I would be more comfortable with notifying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm sick. I'm gonna take the call from home. Don't have child, you don't have child care. I'm like, I'm on, that's what's happening. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the Zoom. Right, this is what's happening. I will be there. I'll be remote. Right. Um, you know, uh, no, that's yeah, that's fine. I again, I, I may be uh, uh, still thinking about some past experience. I think we are all thinking about yeah, that experience. Yeah. Yeah. 
want want the record to be clear on kind of what the situation was or is. I think it's the most important is this document serves us looking forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So what happened happened. It was unfortunate yeah. and right. hard. And this is going to be one of the services in the future. Right. So I'm I'm fine with that with that proposed language. And, and there's the you know we are a five member team. Quorum is a big thing. Like right. if we have somebody out of town, then somebody doesn't at the last minute. That notification is important right. just in case quorum yeah. we're backing up against that and we have a vote that night and all that kind right. of stuff. So right. I mean, as long as people act like adults, you can use general terms. Like, right. You know, mm -hmm. right. The attendance in person is preferred. Timely, you know, if you can't attend in person, timely notice is required. Mm -hmm. right. You don't have to say within 48 hours of you know, timely is enough. And we hope that people don't abuse that. And then we can revisit it if people do. Right. I mean, I, our experience, you know, in the last year has been that several times that, you know, asking about people who are absent and saying, well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a situation that you don't want to be in uh, for our formal meeting. Um, I don't think so. There are just a few sections here. Um, okay, so virtual tenants, and then um, statement three it is expected that trustees shall fulfill their service to the public by attending business meetings, study sessions, field trips, and open houses. Should rate now, this is a, a sentence that's that I wrote very vaguely. Should regular absences occur, the board may vote to recommend removal of trustee. To city council for non attendance to duty. That allows us to make a recommendation. Doesn't mean that city council has to take us up on it, but that at least opens the door for us to take action. So, Michelle, I think that ought to be a separate number. So, that should be number four. And then we should again refer to the BRC. That's right. Yep. And whenever we say that, you know, again, I'm keep going back to like a purpose or reason that, you know, these. Business meetings, special meetings, and field trips are an integral part of right. service yeah. to OSBT. You know, failure to make these meetings, you know, it, it's included in, you know, the prohibition on missing meetings, regular meetings. It's it's part and parcel to that. It's the same as that. We look at those two things similarly. Right. Yeah. yeah. It is like if you miss three meetings in a row, there are consequences under the code. Mm -hmm. So we're saying these qualify. As me, we yeah. could do something like that, mm -hmm. and that's what I feel like we're trying to do here. Is there was some question when we had trouble with this of whether you know field trips, study sessions counted as meetings under the BRC, and I think what we're trying, I feel like what you're trying to say here is like field trip, study sessions, etc., count as meetings mm -hmm. under that. At least we're we're kind of agreeing as a group right. that you know that that would fall under the. The like meetings because there wasn't clarity there. There wasn't clarity there, and I guess I'm trying to make a separation between the code because the code is problematic. Mm. What we discovered is it's problematic. Like you have to miss um, yeah. three consecutive meetings business and then you meetings. business meetings, and then you can come to two, you miss two, and then you come to one, and then you can miss two more. Right. And, you know, and it's like we don't want to play that game. But this is more like what are our expectations of each other? Maybe we can't like force it down. And actually, you know, according to the code, have somebody removed, but we can make the statement that we believe you should attend all of these kinds of meetings to whatever percentage we agree that is, or just leave it vague. I mean, well, of course, life happens. You're going to miss There's a provision it. for inattendance to duty. And non basically, yeah. non-attendance to duty, basically what we said was like, okay, it may be technically the, the three business, the three consecutive business meetings wasn't met. However, the conduct hit the threshold of inattendance to duty. Therefore, goodbye. And so, in that sense, the code did serve us. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong in that? <laughs> um, are we are we out of our depth here? It was not really clear during that particular process what the what qualified as non attendance duty. We we got there, but I think we're trying to say more openly, like you know, missing a study session counts. Missing a field maybe, trip counts. Maybe we just say that we you know we consider regular absences in attendance to duty mm -hmm. and we just we say that we just explicitly say 
that in, in when it comes to this board, if you're missing regular or you know special meetings on a regular basis, it can be considered any kind of study or even use each other. See, that, that would be my preference. And it, actually, my preference would be that we refer to the above uh, business meeting study sessions, field trips, or open houses in that so that we include all of those in this mm -hmm. statement. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that we're talking about the series of, of meetings that the board is responsible for. Uh, I like us having a little bit of flexibility. Let's say somebody has a major family emergency yeah. and they're yeah. just offline for three months. I would like this board to have the ability to determine whether something is or is not an independence to duty. Right. And I believe there's provision in the BRC for the chair to grant an extended leave of absence okay. to someone right. in those right. okay. circumstances. There is. Right. So maybe we can kick this to the, the drafting committee to <laughs> resolve and be really smart. I think about. we have direction. Don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's I think suitable. ultimately we probably want the Janet Michael's. Yeah, yeah. Look she, at this. I think every year she'll take and a final us. look before you all give. Right. Yeah. On yeah. This. Sure. So, so what if before we waste the rest of the board's time, Michelle and I drafted a set of red lines, sent it to Janet first, and then brought it to the board? What's what's the process? Um, last year, I believe we used a two-step process. There might have been two different ones where you all looked at it. We don't have to do that. We could, you all could go all the way until the November meeting, which I think we have 35 minutes set aside yeah, or something right. like that. So November would be the deadline, but yeah, I mean, I think before you all approve something, go, oh, and final step, we'll go back to Janet. And then Janet says, ah, actually that's not good. I would reach out to Janet before you bring something back. So work together, uh, yep. um, go through Janet and then bring it back to the board for approval. If the board wants it that way. Okay. I, I guess I my recommendation would be for us to basically do what we're doing now, provide the guidance to to both of you if we need further you know wordsmithing, and then send it to Janet. My feeling is is that Janet needs to know what the board thinks. Oh, oh for sure. She, will, she should react to something rather than right. help you're saying you, you want them, you want Jen to react to something we've all seen. Yeah, I, I think saying. that would be more appropriate. And basically, then you guys would wordsmith it, send it out to us. I agree. I agree. We'd, we'd take a look at it and say, yeah, it looks fine. Goes to Janet, she can do yay or nay comes back to us for then final consideration. So, so because this isn't a you know a, a matter of you know, public policy, can we do that by just sending it out as an internal you know no. board communication? Mm -hmm. No. So when when board need when board takes a look at it before it goes to Janet, it's got to be in the October meeting in public. Well, I mean, yeah. if you all want to, memos are due in six days. I would just say, I mean, what I would suggest is we, we put a November and a December hold. Mm -hmm. November is you're going to be 90% there. Mm -hmm. You're going to get, and you're going to get the board's thumbs up. December, it's like final clearance from CAO, micro changes, then you approve it in December. But November is still the meat of the meeting, but the semantics of final approval probably would happen in December. Right. In October, the October meeting is not a good meeting for us. To do no, this. I don't even know if we would have notes from this meeting assembled yet. I mean, just because of the short turnaround, but right? Because uh, memos and packets go out next next Wednesday, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I just think it's it's important for the for us today to kind of provide as much guidance and, and specificity as we can. Then you guys kind of fill in the blanks, and then, um, I don't know, Dan, are you suggesting then it goes to Janet or it comes back to well, us? Well, I think you guys said you so wanted to one see last, it first. Yeah, one last look. So all the wordsmithing is done over the next five weeks, it goes out in the November packet, you right. all look at it, make any changes you want, then the committee takes it back, works with Janet, and any final right. changes, and then December it gets ready for approval. Does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Great.
Let's do that. Okay, so we're gonna Keep comb going, through this right? a bit. We're gonna so. <clears throat> And, and there aren't, I mean, I'm, there are not a ton of sections, so should we drink some caffeine or drink a water? No. So. <laughs> <laughs> Something stronger. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, I, I mean, if we're okay with those other, like, bullet points four and five, trustee, shall we um, treat all of our board members and staff with respect at all times? We can move on if there's no comments on that. Uh, should we add the word staff in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's um, there. It says there. It's there. Oh, it is there. Sorry. I didn't hear it. I just wanted to make sure it was there. Yeah. And I skipped over that. Um, that's all I have for that section. Any additions, subtractions that you want just conveyed right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So are we calling this article purpose or expect? Okay. Is that, are people okay with that title? Mm hmm Great. Trust the expectations and conduct. All right. Hold on. Yep. Something along those lines. Great. Okay. Um, let's move I on. might change it to expectations of trustees because otherwise, it might be what I expect of you. Or right. what you expect of me. <laughs> that is a good point. Okay. Um, next section under officers. I, I didn't see anything there that needed to be updated. Anything there, Dave? Okay. No. Under so, so uh, Leah, <laughs> that I think is Article Two. Oh no, yeah, she got it. Article, article two. two. I right. know the track changes are tricky, but that yeah. is two. I'll make okay. sure. Yeah. yeah, great. Okay, and then under meetings, that section, um, I wanted it. Oh yeah, I already did. Um, that that was your input, Brady. What's that? Just see the, the red lines. Or Reminds us. Do you want to talk about the consent agenda idea? Or... Oh, well, okay. okay. So I didn't. So there's one about three hours. Well, okay. So um, whether this is the, the time and the place, I'm not sure, but let me just make a few mm -hmm. comments. I think we've, we've made good progress on, on any meetings on time ish, uh, and which I think is great. I think there's an opportunity for us to either have a, a consent agenda. Uh, the staff put together excellent packets that have got great information. And in the vast majority of times, when you make a recommendation, it seems to me that this board is you know, not going to have a problem with it when it comes to things like the example of putting conduit in a ditch or having it being open versus drilled. And, and in, in instances like that, where there's extensive information in the pack that I think having that as a consent agenda would be one thing we could do to just kind of speed things up or we change the cultural norm whereby the staff presentation is three minutes. You have this in your packet as a review. This is the issue on this piece of property where this is the, the line, you know, and are there any questions? Can we vote? You know, it, 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 as opposed to half an hour giving it either a consent agenda, which is like, we just vote it up and we don't even talk about it or it gets a five minute window. I don't know if we need to sconce that in here, but I think that would help us speed things up and and um, and, uh, and have more generative discussions and, and honor the work that the staff has done. And, and, I, and with the obvious caveat that when we have a public hearing and when there are issues that are controversial, sometimes we have to start from ground zero for the sake of the public and everyone calling in. And the presumption that the board read the packet is insufficient because the public needs to be brought up to speed for a public right. hearing. That is obviously the case with, with the bigger issues of the day. And so again, I don't know what that means for this here, yeah. but I just think we have an opportunity um, to become more efficient, to more generative discussions as opposed to passively receiving PowerPoints and hopefully end on time more often. So I'm going to make, I agree, and I'm going to make a suggestion that, Leah, that uh, some semblance of what Brady just said becomes number four under Article 3 meetings, and then uh, number four becomes number five, and we put uh, a, a new D under four, which would be consent agenda, and in parens, it's uh, upon approval of the director and the chair. 
so that we've got the the paragraph uh, for this, you know describing what we think the consent agenda is, and then on the new five D we have where it happens on the agenda if it's approved. I could just provide some still some fuzziness in my mind. So without without a, a consent agenda section, we used to use the written memos as sort of the way that we would like to inform you on something, but wasn't planning to take agenda time doing that. Last year, we made the transition of, because there was all, often questions about what was in the written memos, it was sort of, no one knew when something was gonna be raised, so we didn't have the right staff person there to answer it. So now we put this 15 minutes of every meeting as, do you have questions on the written memos, which we were viewing as AKA the consent agenda? in which we weren't expecting to have a discussion on it, but then it started to happen anyway. So we created 15 minute block to talk about. So now if we're gonna create something between the written memos and the formal presentations and call it consent agenda, you know, I, I, from a staff perspective, I want some more clarity in exactly how that, those three sections are gonna differentiate between presentation and thorough discussion, written memo, and now a consent agenda. Well, maybe, maybe we don't need it. Consent agenda per se, but maybe we just need the acknowledgement that there are certain items that the board has to vote on, i.e., relatively minor disposals or other things that that can go at the beginning of the regular agenda and have five minutes. So it's almost a de facto consent. So and, express it through time allotment. Yeah, like is there? We we need a board motion on this. You've got an extensive packet. Here's the issue. Are there any questions? Yeah, voter up or down. Dan, okay, moving on. That's my. My feeling is a consent a consent agenda has action items the, of the board. Yeah. The exactly. the, the memos okay. uh, are are informative, but there's no action required of the board, no official action. So consent consent agendas mean the board takes a vote. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Only yeah. for for action items requiring right. a vote that are right. not controversial. And right. There's lots of language that we can steal for for you know consent agenda. Every code's got, you know, what kind of items go on the consent agenda. The big issue with consent agendas, I think, from from a sort of game perspective, is what's the game on how it gets called up? Does anybody get to call it up? Does staff get to call it up? Does one member of the board get to call it up? Do you need two members of the board, like a minority of the board, to call up a consent mm -hmm. item? You know, so I think that's what we ought to talk about to yeah. guide the I think think drafting. Help me out with that if it gets because I have an operator, I know a council, if it gets called up, it's it no still longer consent, right? but it's no longer on consent, right? But it can still be addressed at that that meeting. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's been agendized. We just would packet. blow out the probably the time allotment for that meeting. So, right. Case. And and I think that going back to what Brady was saying about trying to keep these rather non-controversial items short. You know, if it doesn't have to be necessarily in the rules, but if the culture is, look, we put the putatively non-controversial items on the consent agenda, we allow them to be called up by any member of, you know, the board, and um, you know, then the, the staff presentation is kind of expected to be rather brief and mostly about answering questions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you you've got your whole, you know, whatever normal staff presentation you would make is in the packet. For everybody to read and then if it doesn't get called out we vote yes on consent it's proof mm -hmm. see i think it, we ought to follow exactly the council's mm -hmm. procedure on that um you know i think that's well established and we just you know rec replicate that mm -hmm. so it's right in the code right we can do it yeah all right so you all craft something on that okay does, this, does this sound like an extra complication or is this what i, I get a sense that you're a little um well, I've just let you, yeah, I've just, it, up until now, I mean, it, it sounds like, I, 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 I know staff's excited about the idea, so I want to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. I definitely do. Is that true? I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's an appropriate caution. I think there's a lot of places where we're trying to interpret it with Janet, with the role of the board. So you're pointing out acquisition and disposal. There's also stuff around licensing and access agreements, and even some commercial use permits where we would like to inform but there's not a mechanism necessarily right now to do that and so i think 
you know, in a brainstorm, like those are the places where we felt that's attractive. That doesn't mean there's not going to be a whole bunch of, you know, complications, which you're right, you know, like yeah, sensitive yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it could work fabulously with this iteration of the board in five years from now, right. our consent agenda, we could have them all called up at almost every meeting and it could just get, we, we might go back to what we're doing now, but I think we should give it a try. And I think, uh, you know, the notion of the, the board chair and the department director kind of making that call addresses some of those concerns. And so if, if, if it looks like if that's not working well, then, you know, there's a conversation about, okay, you know, how can we make it work better? But, but there is a decision-making process that's in place uh, to determine whether in fact an, an item gets on yeah. consent. And in your three month calendar look ahead, we could make note of, hey, in three, two months, right. this is what we're thinking as consent agenda. Mm -hmm. And if you all see concerns two months ahead of time, you could certainly let mm -hmm. the, exactly. the board know that just so you know, I'll, I might be calling that one up or right. whatever. Right. So. right. And a, a single male board member may call it up. That's the other thing I think we want to make sure is understood. So we're senators. Huh? We're with the Senate. One, yeah. one of us can Tommy Tuberville, you mean? Well, yeah, but, but, but then one can call it up, but then, then you vote on whether or not the board calls it up. Yes. Like one person decides, and then you all check in, and it takes three of it to actually do it. Oh. Yeah, and whatever the, the council does, the council's, council's in majority council. that has to approve. The yeah, call. I mean, I think one person could suggest that they would like to. Call, call it this up. up, but then right. the board, the council as a whole, would vote on whether or not it actually does get. Oh, right. so I think, I think that, that's how put it works. that in a majority then of the board has to approve the call up. I think when we look, when we talk to Janet, yeah, she's going to read 177 and she's going to say, you know, the um, approval for disposal may be given only after um, a public hearing and a permitted vote. And then there's this little addenda at the bottom that says the section is to be construed liberally in favor of providing opportunities for the citizens of the city to refer measures proposing the disposal of any open space land. So, you know, are we really meeting when we talk about disposals, disposals do they belong is probably, on consent at all? Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that's what Jen it probably yeah. doesn't, but it still may if it's hey, we can't bore it, so we have to trench it. And mm -hmm. it could still be that like really, three minute yeah. <laughs> yeah. staff presentation, so turn things over to the board. Consent. But there's no, I understand. Yeah. It, so might, it could be it might be a it, 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 it could call. have a hearing. It could still be consent. Because consent's considered a public hearing, but I think, you know, like I said, I think Janet's gonna mm -hmm. want to read this and, and puzzle See, it over. See, in her mind, there are maybe disposals and then there are disposals. What are that's true. Um, there's disposals and then there's disposals. Right. right. Yeah. And so some of the ones that we just kind of do do routinely. You know, um, well, I don't know. I've worked, I've working with Janet on disposal mm -hmm. since 2016, and I would say she would say a disposal is a disposal. Is okay, a disposal. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so the disposals yeah. don't count on the consent agenda. I mean, she might, she might make say that they interpretation, do. I mean, but she might say they don't. I just want to leave it up to yeah, yeah to her to talk about it. Yeah, right. Okay, understood. But I think directionally, I think we're more or less aligned. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, um, and I don't know if in that number one leads me to strike what I had added there, um, which can read that first. Oh, sentence. the three hours. Mm -hmm. I just think we should we should try to end on time, and, and if we need to budget five hours, sometimes that's fine. Let's just try to keep it to what we say. You know, I I, I don't I don't think I I, I don't think it's a thing set time threshold is necessary because sometimes we're gonna have a big old hairy public. Well, in October just, we're gonna have one. Yeah, I mean it's just you know when when Steve South and other things come up, we're gonna buckle up. It's gonna be a long night. It's okay. One of the things the planning board does that's interesting is um, it, it, one of our policies on planning board was if a matter is going to after ten o'clock, the board has to vote to start a new matter on the agenda. Mm. So you know if you don't have majority of the board saying we're willing to stay to finish up this meeting the last item you heard that ended after 10 is the end of the meeting mm -hmm. yeah. council used to do that i don't know that they do that anymore <laughs> i don't think yeah. they do um, um, <laughs> one other thing we could just put you know under agendas uh, article three agendas is the director and chair shall strive to create an agenda 
that is of reasonable time expectations, aka mm -hmm. three hours if feasible. Like mm -hmm. just just so once a culture gets established, you know, that can continue as we all rotate in and out. And mm -hmm. we could just have it as a reasonable expectation if feasible. An agenda shall be created that is, I mean, but that, that allows meetings to end in a timely manner or something like that. Yeah, we could define it under meetings and agendas and just put it as striving. I trust, I trust the, the, the drafting committee to get this right. But I, I think, I, I'm, I think that all sounds good. I think giving us the provision to have occasional late nights when there's a really important matter before this board is. Um, Perfectly comfortable. Um, and, and that what you just said, Harmon, about um, it's not necessarily an approval to continue the meeting, but it's under agendas number three, the director and chair may postpone or reschedule certain pending items until a sufficient meeting time may be available for the board's proper review of such product, uh, mm -hmm. topics. I, I think that implies that if you're at 10 o'clock at night and we don't have the time to take it on. Yeah, yeah. We the, can make that call in. The difference with that is, I think the pending agenda topics. Oh, maybe that is like in a real time meeting. I was thinking of we sent the packet out. This is the agenda. Yeah. But then we pull an agenda before the meeting. But I think I could read that both ways now. Yeah, I think that's that could be way better for sure, especially with the word postpone or reschedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we you struck that three hour part of it, and then. Um, we added the consent agenda language in there. Is there any okay, anything on was four and about? It's now five and about. Are we still in two meetings? Yes, still in um, two meetings. Are we still in meetings? Okay, uh, four. We have made a change over the last year. Just giving it a shot. We've moved matters from the board up to right after public participation. Oh, right. If we like that, we could just make that change here as well. I mean, it's this is semantics at this point, but number F could become number D. Uh, if you all like that change we made last year for the first time. And the chair can reshuffle these as they want or uh, as they feel necessary, um, might be necessary. Yep. yep. And that's why we felt like we didn't need to make that change last year, even though we were going to, but that's good. Just leave it then. That's fine. Let's say just leave it. <laughs> don't change the order. Yeah, I, I don't think it's necessary. Because sometimes we split matters from the board that are related to written documents and then other things that we actually just want to bring up later. But it could be in both spots. It's not that's what I've seen recently. Okay, um, if we're all right with moving on. Oh yeah, because it's however the agendas may be adjusted at the discretion of the director. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what was five, which is now six, um, just to avoid redundant language and confusion, I thought we might end this section A after the first sentence. Because those are all things that are, I think, in BRC-3-9. Shall I actually have a question about that? Because yeah. I don't think that 5A is correct. Because um, it says an affirmative vote of at least three members shall be necessary to authorize any action. The charter says three members for a disposal, a majority of a quorum for any other action it could be two out of three. Mm. Quorum's three, majority's mm. two. Yeah, the three so is specific to disposals. Yeah, I think yeah, that's I think wrong. That's right. Five A. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we're mixing disposal action versus other types of. Which just underscores action. Michelle's point, which is why are we restating code when you have the built when we're misstating code. code. We're <laughs> misstating code. <laughs> yeah. When code changes, we have to change this. Right. So we're just want to just refer to the code. Because the quorum is defined in the BRC, and also, yeah. An affirmative vote is also defined in B. So maybe the whole thing goes. A and B can go. And yeah. just you're saying leave five yeah. and take A and B out. Because there's nothing new in any of that. No. Is there a reason why this is in here? For snippetiness? I, I think it's just always been there. 
<clears throat> I think that's true. So are we feeling like it's okay to strike both of those, A and B? Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to be clear, we're not in any way saying that we don't take disposal as seriously as no. we did before this was in here. It's just that the code is clear. And that's why we led with that in the top of the document, that we are going to follow these guiding documents. So one thing we could do is um, there's a there's a um, organization and procedure of the board. Um, <clears throat> it's one one seven section one seventy four, and then there's the voting procedure for disposal, which is in one seventy seven. So we could change it, Michelle, to just say um, five all or now it's six. All meetings of the board shall be open to the public and publicly noticed by any reasonable means prior to each meeting, <clears throat> comma and the meeting process shall be as prescribed in charter section. And hyperlink it again. 174 and 177. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rather than trying to rewrite what it says and then rewrite it wrong, we'll mm -hmm. just hyperlink the code itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. <clears throat> All right, so we'll move on to public participation. Um, I think this is. Uh, yeah, so anyway, take a look at the number C, the, the highlighted yellow, I thought we could remove that, but um, I think the, the meat of it is bullet C. What, uh, where are we? Uh, it's the new seven, the old six, new seven, C. C is new. So new. Harman, I have a question for you, and actually it was posed by our good friend in the public. Um, do you think, the what I said and did at the last board meeting was a violation of the First Amendment. No, because you know, what the, the public well, I mean, I'm not a First Amendment lawyer, no, but, I know, but the public is entitled to notice and an opportunity to comment. She had right, and um, and I think you know, they're not entitled to. Personal attacks, invective. You know, there, there's there's a lot of law about what folks can and can't say. It goes beyond their First Amendment right. So if you made a judgment call as the chair that she had crossed the line, then I think the judge would probably agree with that. Okay. Probably. Yeah. I, I would. Say this would be one section for the drafters to to definitely work with CAO on right. crafting right. because. Do we have guidance citywide on this? Because we should. Yeah. Because this particular person comments hey, a lot. Yes. I mean, we read it at the beginning of every meeting before public comment, right? That's isn't that the city guidance mm -hmm. on it? Yeah. yeah, the implementation of the guidance is a trickier, right? And in fact, earlier on, I got advice from the city attorney's office that what was stated in public comment, and this was at a couple several meetings ago, but I think uh, we're several board members were personally identified uh, was unfortunate and but did not violate their what the attorney said was the First Amendment rights. I from my perspective and I'm not a First Amendment expert either the free speech doesn't entitle one necessarily one to have an audience and so the fact of the matter is that the board chair, in my estimation, can excuse the board if, in fact, we have to listen to the opinion, can excuse the board from doing that. And the chair can uh, stay at the table and represent the board um, in that context. But I, I don't see that we have a requirement to listen uh, as a First Amendment. I had a conversation with the Council member recently who just lamented the fact that the rules of decorum in the federal government and in our state house are so much, or at least just the norms are just so much higher right. than, than what they have to suffer through at the municipal level. And I don't know if that's, I don't know why that is, but we are not alone in our concern. Well, and I think we ought to put whatever language we think is appropriate in here and have uh, an attorney. Yeah. Uh, so examine. this was just throwing out an idea. Let's try to work this a little bit and then we can help the attorney. So what, uh, I'm, yeah. what I'm hearing is, is like, is there guidance that we could provide the chair within this yeah. of, of what the expectations are when something 
comes up like this and they right. try to craft some wording around it working yeah. with the yes. CAO. Because we're not we're not expecting the public to read this. We're really trying to tell the chair you can cut off public comment if the following items occur. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And that should be something that should be ideally a civil citywide policy, not just the right. whole microcosm of all right. the So for scribing purposes to help me, Michelle, maybe just like put in a piece that says you know, the chair may suspend public comment upon the occurrence of the following you know events or whatever okay. we'll figure it out for them, okay. just to make us remember yeah because personally I, I don't think that any of us needs to or should have to tolerate um, that kind of commentary if people want to con criticize the board it, its actions or whatever that's fine you know, I don't have a problem with that, but if they call out individual board members for criticism or attack, I do. And they need, if that is their concern, and I don't know, maybe you guys, uh, this is the other proposal I was going to say, is that there are two options if people want to criticize individual board members. One is to um, have a meeting with the chair to express their concerns and reach some kind of understanding on how to proceed or um, more appropriately comment to the city council who is the appointing authority if they have a problem with any board performance board members performance and so it's not like we are we are we're immune to criticism from the board or of the board mm -hmm. but to call individual board members uh it is not appropriate yeah. And there are ways to deal with that if that's necessary. I, I would rather leave that part vague because the future chairs may not want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're listing that as a possible avenue and the, the chair does not want to go down that path. That's I, true. Then they can, then we should just say that they can address the city council as the appointing authority. I think the drafters have the spirit is like, mm -hmm. is there any sort of guidance that could be put in here? when it comes to uh, suspending or uh, public comment. And I think just as a joke, it's funny to Brady talking about the federal government. Um, as we all know, as people in the room who do local government, local government is where you're face to face with the public. I mean, it's where all the rubber hits the road for just about everything. And federal people make big policies and don't often engage with the people in those policies impact the way local government does and then so that's just kind of put on your helmet you know this is what we do <laughs> right. and then the second thing is um is that we're there's different law around our rights versus elected officials rights. right and we are protected as because we don't get paid for this and right. we didn't get elected by the people and so there's a higher expectation of decorum right. in the board meetings where they're appointed boards than in city council. They have to sit through stuff we don't have to sit through. Right. You know, I'm reminded of uh, Everett Dirksen, who was the senator uh, in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s from Illinois, a very uh, uh, well-regarded senator who made two statements that are well-known. One is on the budget, he's, he intoned that, well, a million here and a million there, and pretty soon you're talking real money. <laughs> and that was in the time when a million dollars meant a lot. Right. Um, the other thing he said is all, po all, all politics are local. Yeah. And all local politics are personal. Mm -hmm. And and I think that um, you know, we get to experience that, but we don't have to experience that to the full extent of uh, what some people think are appropriate or is appropriate. So, anyway, good old Everett Dirksen. Um, if I could <laughs> just make note, uh, it's yeah. okay. Um, and lunch is here, right? Yeah. yeah. If we we could borrow some working lunch and just bring lunch in, and we already had a working lunch, did we not? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, well, there's I, I think two okay. more minor things. Let's go. Um, as you said, we're ready to conclude there. We'll, we'll take it on. Ask one thing. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I just kind of picked this up late, but um, the limitation of 10 minutes on pooling, hmm. 
I think that sometimes when you have like a big group, you know, say there are folks who you know, are all coalescing, there are like 16 people who want to talk. There's no point in limiting them in my mind to 10 minutes just because they're pooling. I think it's better to sort of have a pooling schedule that says, this is my opinion. Uh, when I say it's better, I don't mean you all have to agree that it's better. You know, one person's three minutes, two people's five, three people's seven, four people's nine. You know, you, you give that schedule and then you say, you know, the, the chair can limit the, you know, the length of, you know, any pool presentation. Um, so like if staff's going to make a 20 minute presentation and then the neighbors who are in favor of the Preble's jumping mouse want to make a 40 minute presentation, the chair could say, well, I don't care how many people pool, you're not going to get more time than staff, keep it to 20 minutes. But, but I think 10 is a little short, given what I've seen on other boards. I don't know if you guys have ever had 10 or 15 people in a pool in an OSBT. Uh, I have never had that. Most of the people pool are two to four. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. No. yeah. Well, and that works functionally. Yeah. yeah. And usually I see them struggle to get even their two people to show up their pooling. Right. I don't think I've ever even seen four, but you yeah. know, this is similar to how council does it as well. I think they limit it to like three people pooling yeah. together okay. at right. once. We used to get vast presentations at the planning board where mm. the whole neighborhood yeah. didn't right. want this project right. would do a PowerPoint and they'd want 25 minutes and we'd give it to them because they had you know 19 people pooling or whatever. But if that's not an issue then don't do not plan that idea. Waste, waste, <laughs> waste no more time on this. Yeah. Um okay so that's that section that I had um just extracted from the comments that we had. And then one other one that I picked up is under agendas, that's now Article Four, um, Section Five. It just it seemed like it was in a weird place. I, I keep it, but board mm. field trips may be scheduled by the chair and director. It, it just seemed weird to, for it to be under agendas and not meetings. Mm. So oh. I would just suggest moving that to mm -hmm. the meetings section. Like that. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a good suggestion. And then I think that was it. That I yeah. Again, I was just trying to extract from the comments. Any but anybody else? Everybody wants to eat because I can smell it. Okay. <laughs> I think we need to decide what we're going to do with this agenda that is now a little bit out of whack. Uh, maybe we can make our working lunch. Uh, we, we got three facilitators wait. for the working lunch. So yeah, we, wait, we'll be triple efficient. Okay, okay, okay. We'll see what time we can make up. Okay, we're all set. Awesome. We're going to take a look at the priorities for the board coming up. Uh, it's on page 22 of your packet. Uh, I'm going to take a look and have it up. It'll be handy uh, for this process. Uh, Jeff and Janelle are going to lead um, the process here so I can participate in it. And then I'm going to get up at the end and kind of look at uh, everyone's input and feedback and lead a discussion around it. So mm -hmm. I'll yeah. let Jeff take it away. Yep. 10 seconds. Uh, there's one topic item that I failed to capture. As you know, the uh, POBS, the Public Opinion yep. and Visitor Survey, is due for a full comprehensive report. I didn't capture that down under the, in the second quarter. So make note that that's there if you were thinking of bringing it up anyway. Okay. Yeah. John's really going to be the, the facilitator here later when we start prioritizing going through it. But as you mentioned, uh, we just want to get a pulse from the board about what topics are of interest or importance. And we've already heard a bit of that today just through our agenda items for this retreat, such as you know budget touches and that sort of thing. So what we'd like to do is while you're eating lunch, use the sticky post-it notes that are provided in front of you. And you should have a Sharpie marker, each of you. If you don't want to write that small, there's some larger sticky pads in the middle that are a little bit bigger. The larger the sticky doesn't necessarily mean the more important it's just you know, clarity. But yeah, if you can go through that list um, on page 22 and think about which ones are your top priorities. And, you know, think if you want to label them one through 10 or one through five, just kind of look at them and think about what would be your preference. Now, the way we'd like to organize it is Janelle did a good job of putting up these flip charts, Q1 through four. If you looked in the left-hand column, you can see which, like the quarters that we're proposing. So to be as simple as possible, if you can just look at each quarter and kind of list out which ones you think would be your 
preference or your priority and write that on a sticking. So for example, I'm just looking over Michelle's shoulder, Flagstaff nighttime parking update, Q1. If that's the most exciting thing, you know, you want to certainly hear, put that on a sticky and put, you know, Q1, um, number one, like the top priority where if you're like, oh, it's okay, and I'll put number five, it's not that important. So on and so forth. So just go through each of those. Um, now keep in mind when you review that list, there's some items on here that are just got it, got it. We got to do it no matter what. And you can say what you think, but you know, new board member orientation, budget process, like we just talked. So don't feel like you have to write those in. In fact, we might put a put a sticky up just so the placeholders, but those are going to happen regardless, just by trusting you know the role of the board. So you want us to write on the sticky the the topic the topic name yeah yeah one topic name for sticky yeah and then a then a priority like one through five um, so do we have five uh, stickies or do we have forty stickies no not right? forty <laughs> well you are you channeling your inner Karen so <laughs> yeah so <laughs> <Should we're> we <laughs> vote multiple times yeah and then. You know, I think the other thing too is if there's something that's not on this. Yeah, list, I was going to raise that. Mm -hmm. Now we don't want to get wild. You know, we've only got so many meetings in a year. But if there's a, a topic that you're like, yeah, I'd really be, you know, put that on. So it, it can be multiple stickies. And if you do come up with a topic that's not listed here, <coughs> think about what quarter that might be appropriate. Yeah, and put a little star in the corner or something yeah. on that just to call out that it's not on this not list. On if I could just add on to that. So what is not really filled out here is field trips. We know we want to do three or four in a year, but what the subject matter is, is we would like your think like, so is there a, a, a type of field trip subject matter? Uh, feel free to kind of put that down as well. And those program updates, you know how we rotate around and we give you a trailheads update. Like if there's a program area uh, that's not captured here, that you would like to get updated on a program area. Uh, we talked about even program areas having more of an enhanced budget connection. Feel free to list a program area too, if because uh, those are routinely things that we like to identify. We just don't know of all the programs. You know what is what yeah. is on your mind. Yeah, and yeah, be be free to. I mean, don't feel constrained. But, you know, if there's something at all that you, you know, maybe up to and, ten, if you really. But yeah, trying to think. I'm looking at five to ten. Five to ten. Newer board, you know, Harmon, if there's, I'm oh, just really curious, you know, feel free to just write it down. We'll see how it shakes out. Sure. Like, Dan, we do have the the flip chart here for field trips. We were mm. actively engaging, Great. you know, want to see this trail, want to see the trail, want to see this area or this part of the system, or learn about this program. So, uh, it is 1245. Uh, what do you think, John? Give them. Ten minutes to think and yeah, ten minutes. Okay, so twelve fifty-five. Well, if you can, as you write your sticky notes, uh, just come up and post them. Again, the quarters are just a way to start capturing. Um, you think it should happen as if you know, you can do that. Can you tell us a little more about this climbing area trails and project mm -hmm. update? Yeah. What, what, I, you alluded to it earlier. It's in it, it's in its concept form, but feeling like it might be a Q3, Q4 uh, ready to daylight. But yeah, if you want to just give a 30 second. Yeah, generally we've had mixed guidance through the years of how to handle climbing trails. And currently they're not designated trails. Um, some of them still um, require it get maintenance done to them. And there's a variety of ways in which they are signed or are not signed or, and so this is really looking at that and coming up with the best approach moving forward as far as designating or not designating. If designating, what does that mean? Um, and working with the climbing community to come up with a good sustainable. So right have they already been involved in this conversation or yeah. have, have they already been involved in this conversation? Yes, yeah, yeah. Lisa Gonzalo has, has reached out to them initially to get thoughts. Um, and then this is gonna be a 2024 project. So we haven't gone beyond that because the, the staff team hasn't really started working on it yet. 
that's a good example of like we talked through planning. I mean, the West TSA talks a bit about this it's in our own designated trail discussions. It's taking more of a scalpel to kind of clean up some of these certain areas. Yeah, just mm -hmm. put like a number on it in terms of like how you prioritize it. You know, it Jeff, is one is high, five is low in yeah. priority. Yeah. And if you don't know prior, you know, just even just listing the topic through discussion. So, how do we differentiate with the quarter from the priority? Well, just, just well we just put them over there by nature. Yeah. yeah. But you could you could also do Q1, P1, or Q1. These are all Q1. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a couple of Q1. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and if you have something that you don't even really know the that name for, so feel free to yeah. write as much as you know, and we can talk about what program or what the topic might be for that. Three more minutes.
Well, it's kind of right in the. What was it? What was it? Odessa? Or that one. The big one. Here's my uncle. I <laughs> want to see my uncle. That's like hilarious. For real? Great beard. That is so I commissioned this as a high school art student. This is not AI. A high school art student did a digital oil painting that I commissioned. Yeah, have your uncle? Of my passed away uncle. And then I made stickers for his memorial service. Oh, wow, amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, cool. I have to tell everybody that it's not AI. You know, a human being did that. When, when we just have talent, that's human. Mm -hmm. Supporting local artists. Every day. All right, one minute. I hate to know. Mm -hmm. John did so we you want to Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fire Joe, you have to run up. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm not ready. <laughs> Mom! Why go to school? That was this morning. Thank you. <laughs> 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 if you didn't suggest any field trips, feel free to suggest some. It looks like maybe only two of us threw them up there. If you think of any, feel free to toss them up here while we're going through the rest of this. Yeah. And, and Dan, should I give her more? Too? Should I give the caveat? We're just kicking off our annual work planning stuff for 2024 and beyond. There might be some stuff that bubbles up from our staff over the next several weeks as we go that like, oh, that, that warrants a touch with the board. Yeah. There may be some subtle changes. This isn't the last and final no. but point in time, basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll start over here at number one, and what I'm going to do is try to cluster these where I see, you know, multiple board members have written the same thing. I'll kind of put them together. So, let's see, wildfire. Do we need to put that in Q1? I know we had a bunch of topics on that in Q2. Oh, is that me? Yes. Yeah, did you mean for that to be Q2? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, with hotel HCA, South Boulder Creek, South Boulder Creek, Prairie Dogs, River Relations, we'll put that in there, South Boulder Creek, South Boulder Creek, Black Staff Night Management, and Prairie Dogs go again. So, 
if we look at where we have clustering here, we have uh, prairie dogs here. There's five folks interested in talking about prairie dogs. So it seems like uh, I'm seeing stickies from all five members in terms of talking about prairie dogs. Or actually, four of us. Uh, I threw kind of neighbor relations in here as well, it's related to prairie dogs. And someone was interested in talking about neighbor relations. So I'll kind of put that outside of it because this is a, I think this is a topic that's, that was not on the proposed items. That's right. coming in November. It's coming in November, and then we have the community meeting in December. So it could be a straggler leftover conversation, right? Yeah, so a lot of interest in talking about prairie dogs in Q1. The other thing I see four different board members is South Boulder Creek in some way, shape, or form. I think there was three different topics for Q1. Well, we I don't know think, if that means we're going to cover it in every meeting in Q1 or... Uh, it's right now it's looking like three touch three touches in order to give it the time it's going to be moving. Mm -hmm. and when, I think, when is the vote? When is the disposal vote going to happen? Well, we're going to finalize it and present utility staff will present it in at the October meeting. But what we're thinking is is that it'd be like a March vote, but we'll start in January and have uh, three different touches. And so the the when you all are cons um, Deliberating, that will just be the only subject that day. The public hearing will be held before and the that. And the deliberations in and of itself would yep, be a yep. separate meeting. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the two big themes out of the Wonder Prairie Dogs on South Pole Creek that the board wants to focus on. Um, any board members want to add any other context to their stickies for those two topics? Nope. See, it seems like pretty strong consensus on those. The two up here that uh, sit alone uh, at the North Foothills HCA, was this yours, Dave? Yeah. You want to comment on why you think that's important for us to dive into? <clears throat> well, I think the uh, recreational use of that area is going to increase dramatically once the trails north guy done, yes. And so I think uh, we should get the HCA designation in place and what the expectations are for the visitor use uh, in that HCA. Yeah, it's it's um that that is going to happen in Q1 because the trail will likely open in early Q2. Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. And the HCA designation should happen either exactly the same time or right before the right. trail designation. So it will be a Q1 item. Right. That was my hope and thinking. Okay, I got a field trip. I want to propose for Q1 to the North Sky Trail. All right. Oh, nice. I was really tempted to go yeah. past the sign. And There's a special field trail. So, yeah. Uh, and, and brave that $2,000 fine. But, uh, <laughs> for board members, yeah. I think it's $4,000. Yeah, <laughs> as a board member, don't do it. If, if I have a name tag, am I good? Yeah. Yeah. That's $6,000. Right? Unless you're on a volunteer project. Great power. Ooh, great you possible. could be even uh, up in the building trail. Board member not only gets fine, they get the paper. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, your picture taken. Um, Okay, uh, that was that was a good one for discussion. Uh, I've got Flagstaff, Nighttime. Uh, Michelle, any context for that? They're a mouthful. <laughs> I took a bite. Um, you know, we have been revisiting this topic and um, the, the permits that are <coughs> going to either be allowed to be used or not for climbers and how the um, how that system is going to work in this upcoming season. I think that's just some regular course of business we ought to, uh, staff has promised to already like, yeah. update us on. Yeah. Um, moving on to anyone, anything else in Q1? <clears throat> All right, moving on to Q2. Uh, there's a big cluster here around wildfire. It looks like four different board members <clears throat> talking about wildfires. And I think there were a couple different wildfire touch points uh, already in Q2. Yeah, mainly around the CWPP. We're thinking that that might be a, a critical time frame for the CWPP. It might it might be just an update. We might be seeking something from y'all. I'm not sure exactly what, but I imagine that we some sort of update on the CWPP process. Okay. Um, uh, another one here, cultural resources update. Yeah, no, I just, I'd like to know what's going on. That's often been suggested as a field trip might be the best way to 
Here by mm -hmm. God to some sites. Have so, to move it over. Oh, yeah. Do you want to write, write that down for the field trip board? Mm -hmm. We could just move the yeah. sticky over to the okay. and the strategic plan is waiting on the <clears throat> uh, and the MOU being executed. So that be yeah, no, yeah. Um, revisit and review ag planning budget. That was. Handwriting is on the board. Oh, my terrible oh. handwriting, yes. Uh, uh, ag planning budget. I just, I mean, this this may be out of context, but you know, we've, we've done ag planning, it's been a while. Um, it, it sure looks like there's a lot of land we have to manage, and I don't know if we have enough people to do it. I just, you know, maybe a deep dive on that at some point makes sense. That was something that kind of came out of some of the prairie dog discussions. Mm -hmm. Like a program. Okay. Uh, and if this sounds like it's, if this feels like it's out of left field. No, I'm just trying to tell, like, I, I could see us <clears throat> visiting three different agricultural tenant sites that's diversified farm, traditional, like, or if you're looking to get more into the something else, maybe it is a better business meeting. It kind of depends on what the interest level is of how, how we might structure that. Some of this is a result of the meetings that we had with our, um, our neighbors in the northern areas, uh -huh. feeling that we own lands and we don't have the resources to manage them to the to their satisfaction. Right. Now, I'm not saying that's right. Yeah. I'm just saying that's their opinion. And I would be interested in learning more about that from the board perspective. And and again, if it's just my statement. If it doesn't make sense, yeah. Um, or if there's a time, a better time for it. But a number of issues came up that I'd like to be smart on and yeah. and, and, and and be able to speak to. Mm -hmm. Yep. I I added a field trip sticky note for that one. But that was a great suggestion, Dan. Um, because that's an area I would like to get smarter on, and I know. Like with prairie dogs specifically going on those field trips and seeing the land really has you know yeah. allowed me to become a lot smarter on that issue and yeah. agriculture is an area where I, I have little to no knowledge and you know right. and we don't want yeah, to be well, critical of the prairie dog uh field trip we went on before because that was real memorable <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, i'll be leading this tour <laughs> but I, I would also say that in some sense the prairie dog management issue is sort of overshadowed mm -hmm. our full comprehensive agricultural program. That's right. That's right. And it's a little bit unfortunate. So it would be great to actually focus. Mm -hmm. We could do something separate on prairie dogs, but if we bring prairie dogs into it, we'll probably be focusing on that when we could be bringing okay. forward more of the whole breadth of the agricultural program. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think as part of the prairie dog conversation, there's been a lot of misconceptions that have been shared around the broader agricultural program. So I think being able to share on some of that and where the product just fits into that would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's awesome. Do it. Uh, David, who's wrote SBC flood mitigation staff? Uh, that was uh, the, the item, the staff uh, report or staff, uh, what is it? Uh, staff presentation, I guess. On, on the SBC? On the, yeah, the flood mitigation project. I think staff review is, is going to be Q1. It should be Q1. Okay. Yeah. I'll move it yep. back. Staff presentation will be probably February. Okay. Awesome. Well, looks like for Q2, we'd really like to see some talk about ag planning and wildfires. All right. You guys don't want to talk about budget in Q2. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 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 touch. Um, Q, moving on to Q3, if no one else has else anything on Q2. Um, so Q3, when we look at the clustering here, we've got three here uh, for climbing access. Uh, it's a lot of interest in that. I've got two here for paragliding access. Hmm. Was this one on the agenda or was this a? No, it'd be a, an addition. A okay. A star on it. Um, any of the folks who suggested this want to comment on? Why, why we should add it? Um, we had that brief meeting about it previously. And um, I know, I, as a former member, not terribly current, <clears throat> they're going to me, I know they're very eager to be um, exemplary user group. They had some proposals for where they'd like to have more access. 
and we, I, my, my feeling is we gave them initial reasons why that might be problematic, and then it just kind of stopped. And I think um, <clears throat> the next year we owe them, in my view, uh, another look and in, in a, in, in a path forward for how they can be the users of the system that they want to be and supporters of it. And I mean, personally, I'd like to give them a, a, a path to what it would look like if we were to allow them to open up a new launch set on open space. This, yeah. And this would be for me too. I'm wondering too, like if, if going out and actually seeing a site where, like on paper, it's one thing. It's like, oh, that would be problematic because of this, this, and this, but actually going out and seeing something. So one idea, we could talk about at the staff level of whether or not we wanted to visit a site to kind of talk about all the complexities to it, but you can leave it where it is, but there might be different ways yeah. of bringing that up. We can take them up on their offer to let's jump with them. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no. Update your good, uh, <laughs> life insurance policies. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, we've got the Junior Ranger update here. I would have written that as well. It's always one of my favorites. Uh, but I ran out of sticky notes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, SPC OTC deliberation. Um, that's Portland. Well, no, then not the yeah. not the deliberation. Or the PG2. Uh, right now we're penciling in as March. Okay. Q2. Q. Q no, late Q1, latest Q1. Like March. We all flood SPC flood. But is the deliberation for voting on what it? we're thinking right now <clears throat> is there'd be a uh, an initial January touch, a February touch, and a March touch. By March would be the deliberation. March would be the deliberation. So I'll put it right, on, right at the beginning of Q2. Um, I want to be sure not to miss that, Dan. Well, that's why we put it on there for you, Dave. <laughs> All right, <laughs> it was a special session. <laughs> um, so yeah, for Q3, it looks like a lot of interest in talking about climbing access, uh, talking about paragliding access, and the junior ranger update, uh, everyone's favorite. Anything else in Q3? Once, twice. Q4 looks kind of lonely over here. There's only two stickies. Um, we've got budget priorities. Mm -hmm. That's got a star That's on it. That's what we talked about earlier about looking at um, budget priorities in fall. That I put it on Q3. Do you think it should be four? Mm. Well, I just thought of fall as Q4, but it okay. could be if you if, if that's captured there, that's great. Okay. We're in the cost. Mm -hmm. You might just keep it in four. Oh, well, the more if you guys would. Oh, yeah, we might build some level. Yeah, we'll do some planning. Yeah. Um. I, I wrote one down. I would love to hear how the rollout of allowing e bikes on open space. Can maybe get an update you know, on how it's been impacting users and how well it's been going, or how well it's not been going, uh, either way, depending, and uh, just get an update on that. Um, I think it's a really good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I put in Q4. I didn't, it didn't necessarily have to be Q4. I just kind of threw it right. far out just to you know, give time to collect data and yeah. feedback from users. Um, let's keep four in terms of field trip suggestions. Um, we've got North Sky Trail field trip. We put this one down. I did. That was soon. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, I mean, I don't know. I, just, I, think, I think walking the alignment before it's open and talking about it and thinking about, hey, this is an HCA. This was controversial years ago. I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, maybe we'll try to do it before the HCA activation comes forward. Yeah, it, it's 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 a it's a big deal. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's kind of a big deal. And just to see the infrastructure, the bridges will be completed. If nothing else, fun trip to see. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. Um, I put SBC flood mitigation and disposal field trip. Mm -hmm. Um. I think it would be really valuable for the board to go out there and walk the land and see, you know, here's here's the land we're talking about giving up, mm -hmm. and here's the land we're talking about um, getting out of the disposal and kind of seeing it in person mm -hmm. and walking it with uh, some of the experts mm -hmm. here at the open space department. I think mm -hmm. would be really valuable. Mm -hmm. And that that might need <laughs> might be kind of cold in January, but uh, we're tough. Yeah. I have my down jacket already. Or, like or maybe even a Q4. 
No, I just wrote down question mark. I mean, this year. Yeah. It yeah. is a little tough to see much resource wise in the winter time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If that's the only time that's available, we just have to do it. But Maybe it's pretty, season, it's, Maybe it's pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. I'll, I got it down as trying to see if it's possible to get out there sooner than later. Yeah. yeah. Um, I put the prairie dog field trip down. I've, I've always enjoyed that field trip. Um, Although it's going to be hard to top the one that we had this year. Um, I think, does this say Raptors? Mm, yeah. After monitoring, I have to go out there and see what all the volunteers do. Keep some birds. Also, oh, Cliff has to go. That'll be fun. Uh, board meeting on open space before trash bash. Oh, yeah, just um, like us getting out into the community. We've talked about this a lot in the past. And actually, Pratt did it um, for a number of years. I don't know if they're still doing it, but to have a meeting out in, in you know, in spaces on open space, a trailhead or something like that, if it's technologically possible, but also just to be out in the community where our people are. And I, that was an example before the trash bash. That's the the um the event that happens, I think, every fall that um, climbers get together and pick up trash and then they give away prizes and, and have, a, have a meal. Yeah. yeah. Presentation. Awesome. Uh field trips with you non-native weeds. Uh, are you suggesting we go to a marijuana dispensary? Yeah. <laughs> well, that would be good. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we have and will continue to have a proliferation of uh, non-native species uh, dominance on open space and that the board needs to really understand uh, what that means on the ground. Well, maybe in the same light, maybe it's pulling some weeds as well right out there. Oh, do, yeah. do Maybe pull in some weeds while you're out there. Yeah. Bring yeah. We could yeah. do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, if you get that plant identification app on your phone and just start walking around, yes. you just realize how bad it is. It's it's very bad. Yeah, I, I I would plus this one. Plus one this one. I think they could learn a lot about what what's non-native. I'll you know see a beautiful flower, and I've got a friend who's always like, "That's not a beautiful flower. That's a non-native invasive species. We don't want that, right?" And, <laughs> I, I would love to get more educated on that. Um, we moved cultural resources update over here as a potential field trip, uh, which I think was a good suggestion. Um, and I also, when we were standing up talking, I wrote down ag sites uh, field trip, which I, I think would be good as well, based on our previous discussion. Um, and just talk about ag and leave prairie dogs out of the picture. Anything else on field trips? No? What's the process now? So we got some ideas. Those, those are more than we can do. Um, um, <clears throat> I would say the field trips is probably more than we could do, but actually I would say 80% of this is something we've already were planning to do. So I don't know if we're at that point. Okay. Uh, staff help me out if you think so. I don't know if this needs to be prioritized, but maybe the field trips, just so we know. Like one per quarter. Like if we, if we did four, yeah, and we doesn't mean we can't try to do five or six, but yeah. if we did four, what would they be? Yeah, I'd say the filter there is what are the ones that are going to be the most useful to inform possible policy decisions and discussions we'll be having in the near future. Like what? The, the North Sky and Advanced HC conversation mm -hmm. might be helpful. I you know, the Creek probably would that. happen before this, but maybe not. And then the ad, if, if you want to do like a program over, like you were talking about Brady, and go out and see something in advance of that conversation for staff to kind of really describe. And you can put non native weeds on that, on the coattails of that one too. Probably. Mm -hmm. like the, yeah. Maybe you all, if you all could take that list down and make, give us five, and that might help. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, do you want to write uh, one through five down on sticky notes and then attach them to? And it doesn't mean that one we could make into a into a business meeting or something rather than a field trip, yeah, like because yeah. you can almost go. People want a bigger. Yeah. 
Sheep yeah. for their ranking Daniel's pleasure. Dot or, yeah, maybe dot voting. Why not just use a pen this? or something and you can Yeah, do... just bring your marker. Yeah. Oh, just so everybody gets four votes, five votes. Let's do four because four. they're seven. Can we do rank choice? Or eight. Yeah. <laughs> what, is that? what is that? That's how you're going to elect your okay, mayor. Four votes. Four <laughs> votes. <laughs> yeah, just do that. Yeah, that little check mark a, or a circle. Just put a like, just a little dot. And John, make sure they're not voting more than one. Yeah, four, four total. You only get four. Four total dots. Field trip. Okay, so we've got all the folks up here, and it looks like all five board members voted for the North Sky Trail, unless someone put all their votes on that one. <laughs> uh, North Sky Trail had five votes. Um, uh, three runners up were South Boulder Creek, um, Ag Sites, and Non Native Weeds. Field Trip all had four votes. Uh, cultural resources update had three, and then board meeting on open space, maybe before trash batch had mm -hmm. one. So, uh, not as much love for the raptors and prairie dogs this time around. We might, we might be prairie dogged out. Mm -hmm. So, those were our four? We can have such thing. Yeah, so I think, yeah, the four is North Sky Trail, Buffalo Creek, Ag Sites, and cultural resources. Or we wait, no, they did weeds. We, we have five, but we can do five. Well, if we squeeze in SBC. This quarter, then now, then hmm. cultural resources move. <laughs> yeah. we'll does, that, does that sound right to yeah. you guys? Mm -hmm. yeah. does that sound right? That's enough to go That's perfect. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks everyone. Hopefully, this helps. Uh, hopefully, we made up some time. I wasn't, wasn't paying great attention. Job, yeah, great. Yeah, great. Thank Thank you. Um, we're going to take a, a short break before we go outside, but Brian and I and Paul, we want to first inter um, introduce Paul, but then just provide a little context for where we're at with this uh, sort of new initiative that we have, and then kind of go out and look at Wildland Urban Interface, because it's we're here. Um, I, um, so first of all, I just want to uh, uh, introduce Brian, um, Senior Manager of our Science and Climate Resilience Programming in which wildfire sits under. And then Brian, if you wouldn't mind introducing Paul, that'd be great to start off that way. Hey everybody, this is Paul Denson. Paul, what, week two? Week two. Wildland Fire Senior Program Manager. We're so happy to have Paul on board. Uh, you may remember meeting Carrie Webster. She was in Paul's position uh, for a few months and has now moved over to Boulder Fire Rescue. And Paul is now in, in that position. So welcome, Paul. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. As he said, I'm Paul Denison. I'm happy to be here. Uh, very new to the position. Before accepting this job with USMP, I worked for the Four Mile Fire Protection District, which is one of the mountain special districts just west of Boulder. I was there for 10 years, started as a um, seasonal wildland firefighter, and uh, for the last five years, I've been managing their wildland fire program, uh, which includes a fairly robust wildfire mitigation program. And my one of my proudest accomplishments there uh, was a recent one. We recently completed a, a rewrite of our community wildfire protection plan. Um, and uh, that has really enabled me to look at wildfire risk reduction through a variety of lenses. I think we're gonna talk um, mostly about hazardous fuels reduction uh, or vegetation management while we're outside, but uh, there are 
a great number of complementing strategies that I hope that we can employ uh, at Open Space and Mountain Park. So I'm very happy to be here. I look forward to meeting you all uh, individually outside. Good to have you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, one more minute and then we'll uh, use restrooms and we'll meet outside. So that will be sort of the thing. And do not use the outside restroom, I'm sure you've heard. Will this door, uh, or will this building be secured? Do we have all our computers here? Um, we can lock, we'll lock or it. Staff. People will be in here. We'll, we're staying, we'll lock it. And okay. we'll um, yeah. um, so why we want to focus on the WUI right now is, as you all know, Bold, the city of Boulder is developing their CWPP. Boulder County is developing theirs. There's all, all rural fire districts that are also, I mean, the whole front range is updating their CWPPs, it seems. But one of the focuses is where are those priority areas within the wildland urban interface. And then for us as land managers, the land management aspect is what is our, going to be our enhanced strategy around the wildland urban interface? We have some larger overarching plans like our forestry ecosystem management plan and our grasslands ecosystem management plan. But we don't have a lot of specific, almost like parcel by parcel guidance on what uh, is our management tools that are going to be best employed that uh, uh, look at fuel mitigation while looking out for our other charter purposes, such as weed management and uh, biodiversity and uh, uh, native plants. That sort of like, what's that balancing act look mm -hmm. like within the wildland urban phase? And where could staff have more enhanced guidance around what management tools we bring out, when and where and why? So we're uh, in the process of putting together a framework for that and thought it would just be a great opportunity to kind of just talk about the wildland urban interface because you're going to be hearing about it more uh, in 2024. So uh, with that, why don't we get ready? Why don't we, if you're all ready, let's go outside. If you have to use the restrooms before we go, probably we'll be out for about a half hour or so. Recording is done. Okay, um, I'll just jump in real quick and turn things over to Harmon. Uh, we have two sub discussions today, sort of all around sort of more of the future of open space uh, and uh, topics that are on your mind, concerns, uh, opportunities, all of that. And we thought that uh, uh, during the first discussion that Harmon will facilitate we could look at some of the value statements and some of the outcome statements that were the community helped us develop as part of our master plan as a way that if, if you want to use some of those to kind of select a specific topic area or whatever that resonates with you or that maybe you're concerned about, you can borrow them. Those are slides 27 through 31 uh, as a reference in your book. But with that, I'll turn over to Harmon to kind of get us started. Sure. So looking at the master plan, the, the values, community-based values are the values that guide our vision and the outcomes, our aspirational goals for OSMP, um, describing the overall desired outcomes in each focus area. So we've got the focus areas in uh, slides 27 through 31, as Dan just said, and to queue up the, um, the question, I have two. Um, the first one is... Um, give us your perspective on which of the value and or outcome statements most resonate with you and why. So you'll see the value statements are the, the big block on the left and then there are outcomes associated with each value. Um, so I will not nominate a trustee to go first. I will wait to see which one of you has <laughs> a friendly amendment. Yeah. Should we also have them weigh in on their second question or do, would you rather do it two round robins? Well, so the second question to preview it is which are you most concerned about when you think of this system, the SMP system 20 years, 30, 50 years down the road and why? So if, if you just want to say what your, what your uh, most important or most resonating value or outcome is, um, that's fine. And if you want to jump to question number two, that's fine. I think we can mix it up. We've only got about 20 minutes. Anybody want to start? Okay, I'll go. Um, so I'm going to go with the value statement that says, using the best available science, we protect healthy ecosystems and mend those we have impaired. And I think the, the part that resonates with me is that, you know, this is a open space mountain parks division of the city government 
has so many different purviews, um, but to always apply the best available science and always do it for protecting um, and creating healthy ecosystems is a really important value statement. And, and I guess my hope as I look down the road is that um, for today and tomorrow, that the best available science also includes um, the kind of uh, anecdotal input that you can only get from community members. Because while that may not be scientific, the user experience is a big part of the charge of OSMP. And so, um, you know, checking in with the community around um, you know, their reaction uh, to the best available science and what that dictates is important. Who wants to go next? I'm going to start assigning. I'll go next. Um, I agree with you mm -hmm. um, on this. And I'm going to, uh, in, I have later this afternoon, I'm going to pick up on, on that and follow up with that. But I think uh, in, in my hope that, you know, this program has always been a leader in, um, you know, land acquisition, land preservation, um, a local community taking, you know, the responsibility of, of protecting its environment. And I, I, I want to encourage us to continue to do that. And, and one of the ways that we can do that is have good, solid, you know, information. And um, I want to talk about kind of our notion of uh, healthy ecosystems and kind of what that means in the, in the current environmental situation. But for, for me, uh, this is the number one priority uh, for the department. I think, you know, when the open space program was first established, that mountain parks are a little different. Mountain parks historically were, were designated a long time before the open space program. And, and so people have this notion of parks and parks, originally and still today consist of, you know, kind of forest lands, the mountains, it, it's, it's kind of um, the backdrop of Boulder. And so the front edge is not so much uh, considered until the open space program started acquiring, you know, grasslands. But historically, the focus has been on, you know, the west, the, the mountains and what that we all think of as you know as parks and and my concern is that we have not promoted the importance of grasslands and the importance of you know the whole myriad of ecosystems that constitute this area and so when you have the notion of the great plains and you know the great the great actually denotes expansive it doesn't denote significant or importance. When Stephen Long, who was one of the early explorers out here in 1825, when he came across the Great Plains, uh, he termed it the Great American Desert. Mm -hmm. And so it's always been, you know, a place to get across as soon as you can, or as easily as you can, in order to get to these verdant, green, well-watered, you know, impressive areas. And, um, it's only more recently have we really figured out that, you know, it, it's, it's the interplay of those ecosystems, um, you know, on a large landscape scale that is really most important. So I, I don't want to get on the soapbox, but um, I think the key thing for a program like us, like the, uh, the Open Space and Mountain Parks program is ensuring that people in the community understand the significance and importance of the cross section of, of these lands. And the fact that, you know, environmentally they're, they're um, what makes us, enables us to actually survive here. And one of the things I'm concerned about is that, and we talked about this a little, just a few minutes ago, that whenever there's a, a natural phenomenon like a fire or a flood, we always see it in, in a human perspective and it's a disaster, it's destructive, it's you know harmful. And so we want our environment to be safe and convenient. And you know the fact is is that in our interaction with wildlands, 
um, you know, a lot of these phenomena are natural and the, the earth is fully capable of recovering and restoring itself you know, after after that, and it it's it's significant. I think it's it's necessary for us to um, look beyond collecting information because, as talking with Brady uh, when we came in, you know, one of the things on the planning and data collection effort, I thought a long time ago that if you collected enough information, that it would be persuasive for people and they would understand the basis for management decisions and management actions. Now, I don't, I, I think collecting good information is important, but I don't think it's the primary reason that people um, relate to, to natural lands. And the primary reason and we found this in the political environment we're experiencing right now is emotional connection. People understand and relate and, and know, you know, the importance of those lands. They have the experience of interacting, connecting with those lands. And so for me, that's the most important thing. And um, so not only is ecosystem health the key thing, it's the education and the bringing um, the community together to understand the significance of of these natural and wild lands. So, so if anyway, I, sorry. If I heard, no, no, please, sorry. It's great, great talk. Um, so if I'm hearing you, the value statement that resonates with you is the same one that I picked yes. using the best available science to protect healthy ecosystems. But you had a really nuanced view of this, which actually is mirrored in all of the, um, the action items that flow from that value statement. like. You were just talking about people's emotional connection and learning from each other, and that's the EHR.D informed shared stewardship right. in a nutshell. So I thought it was interesting as you were talking, I was looking at climate action, diversity of native plants and animals, and restored resilient habitat, the other three, and thinking that everything you were saying was really, you know, part of a focus. Well, not everything you were saying, but there was a lot of correspondence between these focus areas, right? And what you were talking about. Yeah. Happy to go next. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, mine would be uh, community connection, education, and inclusion. Uh, the value statement is together we build an inclusive community of stewards and seek to find our place in open space. Um, specifically, um, you know, uh, engaged youth inspired by nature and promoting equity and inclusion. I was very privileged and had the opportunity to be involved in the Boy Scouts, like I mentioned earlier, and I got to go to all these awesome places to go camping and experience nature and hike in Philmont. And not everyone has the privilege that I do to you know, go off to all these places and see that. But in Boulder, we have the opportunity to you know, allow people that live here that may not be afforded those privileges to kind of experience nature in a way um, that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. So uh, what Open Space does is really powerful to me in that regard. I love being in nature in our fast paced, you know, high technology environment. I love to, you know, go out on the trails, go out amongst the trees and just be away from all of that. And for me, it's it's amazing for my like mental health to go out and do that and hike in the trails. And I think it was an amazing asset for the community in that way. And I think by exposing to the community to nature like that and, you know, giving them access to it really helps um, educate them around it and it helps build a healthy respect. For it that they might not otherwise have or, or get the opportunity to have. I'll jump in on that one because I, I, um, I picked the same line, John, um, and a, for a lot of the same reasons, but I'll just add that, um, <clears throat> you know, that um, we also, in, in the one with, uh, that relates to engage youth, we're playing tomorrow's stewards that way. It's not going to all be on your shoulders anymore, Dave. And you've done an amazing job over the years that you and the people you know people like you. And but we have to pass that torch on to other people who are who are going to do that. But the only way they are going to do that is if they are exposed to it and if they care about it, they have that emotional connection to it. And so building tomorrow stewards is going to require diversifying the folks who have access to it and um, to that particular privilege and build that bond to our public lands. 
that's why I chose that. And yes, the kids need to get away from their screens. It's going to be better for all the mental health, but particularly these kids who have carry around four devices to a meeting. Kids today, right? Was that your segment? Much less. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was nice. <laughs> My good punctuation point. Um, I chose two because they, they interact the ecosystem health and resilience and also the responsible recreation, stewardship, and enjoyment. And um, I just to cut to the chase, like what am I concerned about 20, 30, 50 years out? I'm concerned that the uh, polarized political environment that's been happening at the national scale is going to continue to um, exist here locally. And I wasn't around for the e-bike discussion. I watched it. I know it was divisive. Um, and it really doesn't matter hardly at all when it comes to ecosystem health you know like it, 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 be, it became this big flashpoint like i like riding my e-bike um but in terms of like whether or not these ecosystems are going to be healthy it, it, it has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not there's a there's a boat a bike with a motor or not and and i'm just worried that those sorts of things are going to distract us from the, the bigger importance and, and when i first moved to boulder the the uh, kind of conventional wisdom was that the, the nature preservationists hated recreation. Like if you if you weren't walking and looking at birds, you were doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was kind of borne out in some of the initial community processes that I participated in. And one of my motivations for joining OSPT was to be like, listen, my full time job is conservation, and I also recreate. And I used to do recreational advocacy, and the two do not need to be at odds. In fact, they absolutely shouldn't. And so, well. <laughs> We can all have reasonable disagreements, and I don't mean to belittle the e-bike discussion. I mean, it was spirited. We all have our own opinions. I get it. And if we're honest, when we look at the big issues of the day, it just doesn't matter. Um, it, it, it matters to us as citizens, but in terms of ecosystem health, you know, the, the, the bio, the climate change, the biodiversity crisis, it's a non-issue. And so we have to struggle with these things locally because. People care and we want to manage these things well, but if we lose our ability to come together and agree on the more important issues, it's, that's my, one of my bigger concerns. And um, Dave and I were walking out talking about wouldn't it be cool if we did a, a restoration project right here uh, by Wonderland Lake and tried to restore natural grasslands and be controlled burned right next to these homes and people would freak out initially but then over time, when they saw the landscape change, you know, if we do it kind of anonymously way out, you know, near the ag agricultural land or some way away from everybody, people won't notice. But if we did something big, kind of dramatic, and over five or 10 years, people saw the, the change and started to appreciate, hey, I, I like how it looked before, but this is actually much better. And now I understand. It'd just be interesting to do some of those restoration activities in, in ways that bring everybody together, no matter what side of the of the local political fence they might be on. Thank you. So I want to jump back to Michelle and John about what your concern is um, in the stewardship, you know, the inclusive community and stewardship area that you you were resonating with the most. How how does that play out 20, 30, 50 years? down the road in, in the system, in the OSMP system. Um, in terms of how it's, what I'm concerned about yeah. or what you're concerned about yeah, as and it, it plays out. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned about making sure we're educating the next generation of you know stewards of open space and nature to Michelle's point. Um, and I think, you know, focusing on this as a mission and you know what we do with this is going to, you know, educate that next generation. And, those kids, you know, that are in the junior ranger program that drew these posters, right? Some of them, them may be sitting on this board in 20 or 30 years um, in our places. So I think, you know, the work that the department does, you know, in that area is really, really important. And if we don't, if we don't do that, you know, there may not be those people that have that, you know, respect uh, for nature to sit around this table. Thanks. I'm, I'm 
you know, alluded to, and I'm not teasing you at all, Dave, but, but really like we see from those junior ranger program or the, the people who come out of that program, some of them develop careers in the conservation community. Mm -hmm. And you get somebody on the other side of their career, like Dave, who served you know, multiple decades doing conservation work. And it's just so valuable. Um, so planting those seeds early on in our kids or, or the, just um, the, the youth around this area, not necessarily just Boulder proper, um, and making sure that access is like, and those kinds of jobs are available to a diverse group of people. It's just gonna expand the ability for this important work to get done down in 20, 30 years, uh, investing in those people who will carry on that work. I think we probably have a couple minutes if anybody needs last words after Dave, but failing that, I want to give Dave <laughs> last words, not only to make sure that he gets a couple shots back in on Michelle, <laughs> saying that he's over the hill or something like that. Well, well you were saying goodbye to us earlier. <laughs> really? Why are we about it? Brady wouldn't let him get away with it. <laughs> but if you, um, if you want to talk about it down the road 20, 30, 50 years and where your concerns lie in that interaction between science, community restoration and best practices. Great. Well, thank you all. I think uh, that is a good foundation for what will be the concluding conversation uh, for uh, this meeting and, and today. Um, the one, one thing I want to start with was explaining uh, what I saw as the value of the opinion piece in the New York Times on Sunday by Robin Wall Kimmerer on um, the backs of turtles. And, and the fact that um, we need, to, and here, so here's my concern, and I think that's, this is what the, uh, her opinion piece spoke to, and that is a, a lot of our management is human focused. And so it's it's basically what can nature do for us, you know? And so it's it's a place that we derive enjoyment or entertainment or performance or um, convenience or commercial commodity. And in her piece, you know, it was important that here's a species that has been around for 65 million years or more and it's coming into, you know, where we live to do things that it, you know, instinctively does. And are we paying attention to that? And part of, part of it is the irony is that I disagree with her statement of, of kind of what, how the kids in the, at the research center handled it because from my perspective, here is a species that is coming to, you know, lay her eggs in a place that her eggs have been laid for, you know, eons, and we turn it into a volleyball court. And so, for me, if that had happened, it was it would be like, well, look, we either quit playing volleyball until the eggs hatched and the the hatchlings are on their way. Or we move our volleyball court because this is an important place for this particular species. And, and so the concern I have is that we are looking at management, and we just talked about it in a human context, and we're really not turning that conversation around and saying, okay, what does nature need from us? What what can we do to really, I mean, and we and so I don't mean to make a blanket or uniform statement because we have talked today about a number of things that we can do, but my concern is that that isn't the conversation that's really out there. Uh, the conversation is that's out there is how do how we view wildlands, wilderness, uh, wild nature in a in a human context, and so. Um, my question to us, and um, Harmon has, has kind of already um, gotten the conversation going, is what do we think we're doing? Um, and that's as a board, what, what do we think we're doing? And is what we're doing, in, you know, for the next 20 or 30 years, how is that going to affect people who live in this community and and this this region and, and this country for that matter 
And I'm talking, I'm looking at you, Michelle, but I'm talking about all the people that, that are here. You know, what, what does that really mean? And I'm going to shut up in about two minutes, but I do want to say that when the open space program was founded, and this is where language is so really. Just let, let us know. Are we, are we, did, was that a smooth uh, yes. transition? Yes, we did a smooth transition. Yeah. To your sub discussion yes. number two, which you're leading. Yes, yeah, not right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to not be leader anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, okay. yeah, no. I just, yeah, it was just like, now that you've told the joke, I'm going to make sure everybody got the punchline. <laughs> it made it not funny. I'm so sorry. You did a great job and I messed it up. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so for me, you know, what started this program was what's what brought all of us here. It's the be beauty, the natural beauty of the area. And so, um, you know, several, a couple of generations ago, people thought, well, you know, we ought to protect the backdrop. And okay, how do we do that? And this community came together and they said, well, you know, we're going to set up a program that does that. And, and they called it open space. And I think at that time, um, you know, what they meant was it, it's not going to be developed. You know, there, we, we won't see houses or industry, commercial or anything like that. We want to protect the backdrop. They didn't so much focus on the, on the forefront, but they did de definitely focus on, on the backdrop. But in that, in that nomenclature, the language is so important. The notion of open in their minds, it was beautiful scenery and, and really, you know, um, the, the natural beauty really spoke to people. But the word open, I think, has been interpreted to mean to a lot of people that anything goes or uh, we're, we're, we can do whatever we want. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, I don't think those, the people that founded the program really intended that. I don't know that they knew exactly what, you know, should happen, but they knew they wanted to protect that, that scenic backdrop. And so they depended on the community to come together and, and make sure that that area, that whole scene, the natural environment was protected. And so I'm asking us, you know, in the next 20 or 30 years, how are we going to do that? And are, are we in a place that we think we can successfully do that? So, um, and, and I am, the, the human focus for me is, is the, the key element, I guess, I'll kind of uh, let the cat out of the bag is that, look, um, you know, is there a way in our collective thinking that we can look at nature, the natural environment around us and talk about what it needs rather than necessarily what we need. And so if we can do that, how can we do that? Brady, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, <laughs> you brought a few interesting concepts. I mean, one was deep ecology, which is at its core the concept that all life has value and that that value does not derive by human utility. Right. So that's an interesting one. And I think when you split that out, if, if it's true that all life has value and it doesn't derive from utility to humans, well, what are we talking about? Are we talking about individual animal rights? Are we talking about the prairie dog's individual right as a single prairie dog to live in that particular hole? <clears throat> or are we talking about the species generally having a, a general collective right to exist in a sustainable manner on this planet maybe not in that particular place at this particular moment. And I think that's one of the places where we get confused and we start fighting because we're not clear about, are we talking about the specific rights of these organisms in this place? Or are we talking about it generally? Because I feel like a lot of the times here in Boulder, we have these battles as though the future of the biodiversity planet was going to hinge on what happens on one particular piece of property. And that's just not true. And I think, well, I would say in a lot of ways, I identify as a deep ecologist as, as well. Maybe you do or don't. And, and I think that's a key insight. I also think we live in a wild and urban interface and that some impacts are in, inevitable. And if we're going to have productive agricultural lands, we're probably going to have to kill some prairie dogs. And, and there's other trade-offs. And so I think we have to be really clear-eyed about what truly is at stake. I think the beauty of these places are at stake. 
the future of the biodiversity planet probably isn't. And so it's going to always be a balance between human interests and the interests of the individual creatures and the species within our area. And if there's critical habitat for a critically endangered species, then that's that's different. But that's why I thought the North Sky Trail was a good idea. You know, it has more impact in that environment, but it is going to be spectacular. There's going to be more people who really appreciate that part of our system because they walk from Joda Ranch into town. And it's just, it's going to be breathtaking looking down at all the expanses in a way that it wouldn't have been on the east side of the road. And so, you know, and it was that putting people first, maybe, but also I think they're going to get great experiences and we're probably going to love the system more. And so I think as we go forward, we got to be really clear, what are we debating? When are, what are the trade-offs? Reasonable minds will always be able to disagree. And I think one other thing, Dave, it, you know, I think you, you are the originalist on the, on the board. You talked about the founders' intentions and that they didn't intend for this. Uh, for, for some of the things that are happening and, and open didn't mean open to anything and everything. And I think we always need a few originalists to keep us honest. I also think that the world changes and it will continue to change. And we have to take our inspiration from those who have the vision, but then implement it in a way that's you know, relevant in the day and the age, but not to the extent that in 50 years, the system would be unrecognizable to us. And so hopefully we have the wisdom to, to do that. Thank you. That was nice you said. Michelle, do, do you want to jump in and, and add anything? No, I don't. I think um, this is a really healthy debate and discussion. I'm not sure I can add more value to it. Well, I think you could, but we'll, uh, we'll give you a flyer on that one, and then we'll come back. John, do you want to uh, add? Your sixty-four thousand dollars. <laughs> I'll, I'll add two cents. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I I think there's a there's a fine balance we have to walk there. Like if we just were to fence off all of the natural areas, I think eventually people are going to say, well, why is that fenced off? Like, you know, fifty years from now when we're all gone, they're going to say, well, why is that area fenced off? Let's build something there, right? Like part of letting people experience nature and thinking about humans in the equation is like giving them a respect for it. And one of the things I enjoyed from the New York Times story was, you know, the kids taking, moving the, it was unclear if they moved the volleyball court or moved the eggs. Uh, moved the to, eggs. They moved the yeah. eggs. Yeah, they moved the eggs, right? But like, because that was there and the kids, you know, got to experience the nature, right? I, I imagine they have a lot more healthy respect for it. And I think in a lot of ways, us opening trails, allowing people to go out and be amongst nature, right, gives the community a respect for it. And so we're not saying we have this big area where no one can go or touch, right? Suddenly they're like, I've, I've been there, I've seen that. I understand why this land is important and why we need to protect it. Um, obviously we can't let everyone go everywhere. There's sensitive species and sensitive areas, you know, that we do need to protect. But in my mind, you know, there's a fine line we need to walk there and that there's, there's some happy place in the middle where we're allowing people to experience nature so they have a respect for it and want to protect it, but also, you know, thinking about nature as well, to, to your point. So how do we do that? Are, are we doing that? Or how, how, how do you think that should happen? That conveying a respect uh, to people or the community or the visitors, or, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very subjective. and. You know, I think it's part of our job as a board to help, you know, guide the community and make recommendations, you know, in a responsible way to, to help find that happy medium. Because it's a, it's not an objective thing. I, I don't think, I don't think there's any like quantitative thing you can put down and say like, this is too much or too little or, you know, um, I, I think it's always going to be a gut choice to some extent. And I think that's part of the reason, you know, city council has asked us to sit here and, and work with open space and understand things and, you know, give them guidance and recommendations on stuff to, to help find that path. Armin, what do you think? Well, I think kind of mixing the my second question and your question, looking into the future, which I think is implied a little bit in, in the sub discussion topic too. Um, you know, and agree agree that the, the dichotomy that Brady set up, you know, is an important thing to think about. And we've always had this um, 
going back to Muir and the preservationists against the conservationists and you know are we doing it for nature are we doing it so that we can touch it um and, and conserve it as well and uh, and so I think you know there's certainly always going to be that and and I think with five and a half million visitors this year which is more than most national parks receive in terms of visitation OSMP's got to realize you know this is a pretty well visited place mm -hmm. and and well visited places sometimes need a little bit more infrastructure and I think that um it's I think in some ways you got to just embrace it. I love how the National Park Service has embraced it. I, you know, I remember there was a huge hullabaloo about 15 or 20 years ago about a $330,000 bathroom at Delaware Water Gap, which is a national recreation area. And it had a copper roof and it had, you know, beautiful field stone walls and traditional uh, construction methods were used. And there were only a couple of construction companies in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York that could do that kind of construction work, hammer that copper, lay those stones and stuff. But, you know, you're going to get several million visitors a year having a timeless bathroom actually matters. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think that, you know, we've had a lot of sort of rough and tumble trails in, in our system. And, you know, as the times change and more people come, you know, maybe it's time to start thinking about building some more really heavy duty, beautiful, timeless, you know, right, really like almost just historical infrastructure that's durable and can handle that kind of visitation. You know, I think we can do a lot of things that are both, you know, like that and also maybe much more innovative and new. I think going out to the ag land, for better or for worse, we own it. And, you know, finding tenants who are interested in trying new agricultural techniques, promoting that kind of tenant selection, you know, not just using flood irrigation, thinking about micro drip, thinking about doing stuff to conserve water, um, you know, trying to do pilot programs that, you know, show the world a different way of doing things. The stuff we talked about today, forward thinking in the wooey like we've never done before. Um, you know, I think it's, it's all on the table and with enough heart and brain power, you know, I think it's gonna happen. And if it happens anywhere, it'll happen here. Great. Well, thanks. I, I was just going to suggest a field trip out to the porta potty uh, <laughs> so that, to confirm. Uh, so we should put a copper roof on that thing. Yeah. Call it a day. Yeah. Call, call, call it an outhouse. <laughs> uh, no, well, thanks. Uh, appreciate that. Yeah, I uh, and Janelle, I'm going to ask you to jump in and help us too. But I, uh, I. The concern I have is is that we not see nature in the abstract. That we we see it as as a connection. Uh, you know that not, well, not only do we respect it, but we know it. That we connected to it. That we have some kind of emotional connection um, to it. And I think what all of you have said it is absolutely right on. That the concern I have is how. You know how, how do we do that in the in an urban context like this with the number of visitors that we have, which I think are are probably underestimated actually, which is a sobering prospect. But um, and I think that's going to be the the real challenge for boards in the future is you know how, how are we going to really you know kind of take care of, of all of this and. Janelle, um, I think this is an opportunity mm -hmm. for you to jump in and, and talk to us about some of the uh, educational and outreach mm -hmm. things that uh, the department is doing and kind of your sense of uh, enabling boards in the future to address some of these needs or concerns. Yeah, well, I'm going to reference um, the Presence on the Land presentation that was last spring. And, you know, one of the things is the team over the years, I feel like our department has put money and budget and resources towards our education and outreach and ranger staff intentionally because we want to be able to be the front line and be that face in the system to connect with visitors. So our staff is one tool in the toolbox. Um, and last year, reminder, 2022, like we're really proud of this, between education and outreach staff, our volunteers and the rangers, they made over 131,000 contacts in our community. So that's, that's a lot, you know, and those connections are, they're trying to do exactly what you're saying, Dave. It's 
even if they have a tiny little sound bite of time, they're trying to make that heart connection really quickly. Like when you're heading down the trail, take a look at this, enjoy the fall colors. Like, hey, there's leash laws. You know I mean? They are trying to connect in those couple seconds. It's either safety or that heart connection or natural history, like trying to blend those things together. So I think that's one tool we have. Um, another one is our partners, our partnerships, right? We have partners with, with Thorn. They're doing programs for us. We have partners with um, uh, YSI and with um, Amistad, and we are trying to really bridge the gap there because we can't be, I mean, we'd have to hire less than 5.5 because it's visits, not visitors, but we'd have to hire right millions of people in order to have a one-for-one -one ratio. So we're going to leverage that with our partners, with our community partners. So love to hear more about that. How can, you know, what's on your mind? Where are we, where can we extend the reach there a little bit more? An example, I know Michelle with last year, um, our staff went and did raptor presentations to the climate community, right? And that's been going on for years. So we think trash dash. Um, and then also social media, right? People are, I mean, you look at our Instagram pages, people love that stuff, right? Again, going to your scenic, the point about scenic, like that captures people again, that inspires folks. And so knowing that that's how a lot of people get there, not all, but like that's a, a really powerful way. So I think those three pillars are pretty good foundation we have so far and always, always, always willing to, to hear more ideas for sure. Mm -hmm. So in hitting diverse audiences, different ages through our programming, featuring the Rangers. So um, we're always looking at, we're going to COSA, you know, we go, we go to conferences, we're always talking with our other land agencies to see what they're doing to try to reach visitors. I think signage as well, you know, trying to be really creative with our signicades and our sandwich boards to reach people where they're at. Um, I think all those things. And I will put in a pitch for nicer bathrooms would be great. <laughs> Have some really good signs in the bathrooms. <laughs> Well, I don't uh, know if that helped. I know that. Helped. Yeah, thanks. And I, do anyone uh, have any questions or comments for Janelle? I guess one of the things that I'm going to use an example of Sombrero Marsh um, that I think uh, has resonated with this board and with previous boards as well. And in the future, I'm sure it will. And that's an example of, you know, a, a tiny tiny area in an urban context surrounded by development and yet uh, it's maintaining um, it's you know it's most of its natural values and a lot of that can be attributed to the open space department's uh, management you know the acquisition of, of the land the cleaning up it, it, well, the school district some of you may not know but use that area as its primary dumping uh, locality. And so, as I'm recalling, the Open Space Department spent about $280,000 uh, in the mid-90s, right after we, the department acquired that land, to remove all of the dumped material, which were blackboards and desks and tables and chairs and just, you know, just years of accumulated trash. Um, and then started a, a, a really uh, aggressive uh, restoration uh, element for, for the marsh. And, and so when I'm talking about the importance of some of these areas, uh, you know, the conversation that was a concern for me is that I'm not convinced, and I've talked to Janelle about this, that the school district, for example, understands the importance of that little piece of you know, a natural area that's right adjacent to, um, you know, their, their main facility. And, and when the, uh, the warehouse proposal for the, uh, what the, the modular, my, housing modular housing factor. came up, um, the concern I have is that this is an example of where the, these areas just get eaten away with tiny bites. And, um, you know, now there are going to be two more houses on kind of the west end so that um, that area now will be surrounded by, uh, by developed land. And, and to think, and this is my uh, considered opinion, but to think that the school district would think it was appropriate to have uh, haul trucks on that road right adjacent to the marsh it just baffles me and the concern I have is that they think that. Um, and so 
I I see the the open space department and and the board itself being you know kind of leaders in this community and trying to you know get the understanding and connection um, to some of these remaining places the importance of them and and you know sombrero marsh and its main importance now is educational you know the fact that we can get you know hundreds maybe thousands of school kids out there talk about wetland ecology the importance of migratory uh areas for migratory birds you know and all all of that stuff um but you know the the concern i have is that we just keep, keep getting eaten away and that um that that can't be good for us as a community or us as a species either and, and uh, that's just a kind of a trivial tiny example but um the other thing that i'm going to ask you to jump in michelle is is on you know kind of we've made a concerted effort to reach you know minority uh community members and you know how effective are we doing that and are there some things that you know we should be paying more attention to and um you know so that as you know minority populations in the community grow that we can build that understanding and connection um with those uh, folks as well well um we only have five minutes left <laughs> and um and i know we want to do a quick debrief but i'll, I'll just try to do that a little bit or try to address that question a little bit Janelle um, has an amazing program. I mean, we got to keep doing all the things that we're doing in her area um, and, and try to reach out to, to folks. We also need to be aware of the micro things that we do to include or exclude people. They can be micro, I mean, if you may not, you may not know that you're doing it, I'm not saying you as individuals, but we as a community may not know that we're doing it increasing parking fees for, for, for camp. There are people who want, and also of diverse um, backgrounds, who can't afford to pay that, um, and, and eliminating free shuttles or things like that. Or just talking about like the community input process and, and saying that people who don't live in this very expensive area don't get an, a registered opinion, um, or, or their opinion counts less. Or, um, you know, just not acknowledging that, you know, saying that we want to have diverse visitors, but actually not enabling that to happen, mm -hmm. really. Um, so, you know, I would just encourage us all to think about that in a really holistic way. Great. Thank you all. Uh, does, does anyone feel compelled to have uh, the last word? I'm this. personally curious to know what Dan thinks about. Just something's <laughs> got to be on your mind. This is your day job. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, well, you're going to leave me one minute. No, <laughs> that is nothing. Dan, you got 35 minutes. Uh, I, I've always had three words that sort of have been my bellwether, whether it's uh, as far as my professional work and my recreation enjoyment work, and that is viability, quality, and wonder. And I still think those three words really ring true to me. For instance, I want to, if we talk about agriculture, I don't want it to be a postcard. Yeah, yeah, we do it. I want it to be viable. I want that. If we have a, uh, an ecosystem, I want it to be a viable ecosystem. If I have a trail, I want to be walking through quality habitat. I don't want to be walking through invasive species. And then when it comes to wonder, I don't need to go everywhere. I want to see, I'll see that hill and if it's at HCA and it's off limits, that's great. That actually brings me more wonder. I kind of wonder what's there. And it's great to have that feeling. <laughs> I think of uh, Alaska. I'll probably never go to Alaska. I'm just so happy that all that public land is there. And it's I, there. no reason why. So it's, it's just wonder. So I always sort of, I, I like having quality recreational experiences, but if it's not through quality habitat, it's very much less interesting to me. Mm -hmm. So if we could strike that balance between, you know, quality, viability, and wonder, that's sort of the sweet spot for me personally, and sort of just been my sort of guideposts over the years is for my professional life. So quick one. So how are we doing that? 
in your mind. Uh, I'm uh, super excited about how we're doing it here right now. I mean, and I could get really boring on you and point to <laughs> asset management as our big focus and a big change, yeah. but how that translates into as you pull into a quality new trailhead and you instantly feel it. And if you if that trail is viable and quality, you know it. And if that habitat next to you is made up primarily of native species, your whole experience is enhanced, whether you know it or not. And so I think we're doing it every day. We got to do much more of it. We got to have our eye on the prize. We got to, we got to make asset management a, a primary focus, as well as the human element and the education and, and um, all of it. But um, it, it can happen in very boring ways through something like asset management, and it can happen in very... Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> and it can happen in very exciting <laughs> ways, like our lower Boulder Creek restoration, which we're going to see in a in a few in a few months. So it, it's happening every day. I get to see it every day, so I'm probably more excitable nerd about it. But I'm optimistic, despite everything in the world. <laughs> can all end tomorrow, but I'm optimistic okay. today. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, I I think we need to continue to think about uh, these kinds of things and, you know, try to figure out uh, our best ways to respond and, and, uh, and care for the, both the natural and the human communities um, that are, it's so important for that interrelationship to really occur in a, in a positive and sustainable way. And um, I, I see that Open Space Mountain Parks Department and we as the Open Space Board is, really kind of in this community in a, in a leadership uh, role and hope that, uh, and I, th I think that's what, how the board and the department has been viewed uh, both by the community and, and, you know, some of the members, the, the you know, and I'm talking about the interest groups, um, both, you know, for and, and, and for, for whatever they're for, um, I think, um, both recreational groups, environmental groups, uh, see this board and the department as extremely important and, and really value the work that we do and we should not let them down. Um, we should continue to do that very uh, important work. And so I wanna thank all of you and all of us today. I think the conversations have been very helpful, very productive. Um, and there's some things that we can build on, and I know we'll we'll do a brief debrief. Um, but I I wanted to extend my personal appreciation for all of your contributions and participation. I think these are important topics and issues um, for us to be not only mindful of, but to talk about and try and you know figure out kind of how we can best uh, uh, deal with them. And so. Um, from my perspective, this has been a very, a very good day, and thank you all very much for that. So, Dan, do you uh, should we do a brief summary debrief? Uh, I don't think so. The next steps is we'll uh, we'll prepare some meeting notes. Uh, November is probably going to be the heaviest time to uh, review notes, uh, bring back any homework that we said. So, look for November. We. Dave and I, maybe we'll even increase that time a little bit. We had initially set aside on the agenda to do a, uh, a check-in and, and take care of some business as far as a retreat follow-up. Uh, I just wanted to also just extend my personal thanks to Michelle and Brady for working with me over the last six weeks. I think we put together an awesome agenda. I'm thank you. Yeah, super excited you. about our day-to-day -day and mm -hmm. thanks for your work on that. Thank so. you. Yeah, um, I thought today came along really well, and I'm glad that we were actually able to get to this particular location. Thanks to all the staff who could come here, um, and, and it worked out perfectly for um, Harmon for you know one of your first meetings to be the retreat, yeah. um, and then also just want to recognize that um, some of us are not getting paid to work today. <laughs> so, and then it was, it was also, there's some things that weren't cooperating vehicles, children, all that. And so we all made it happen and we were all very focused. And I think that it was a pretty productive retreat. Um, and, um, at least of the three that I've done here at, at OSBT, I thought it was one of the better ones. And that, that's not just to say, <laughs> I, I think that you know the environment and um, yeah, being out, be out, being out here in this particular space, and 
being able to have a chance to get to know one another in a way that's less formal than council chambers. Yeah. And that's off Sam, Megan, mm -hmm. Leah yes. for making all the logistics happen. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of uh, quick kind of uh, follow-ups. Um, will you will uh, Dan? Will you send out an email um, to the board reminding us that? And now that I'm saying that, I'm I'm thinking maybe that's not what we should do. Um, so I'm going to ask Harmon and Michelle what they would like to do as far as the work that. Um, you've taken on for the rules of procedure um, as far as getting the board input. Um, do you need any further uh, feedback from the board or do you want to go ahead and kind of do the initial crafting of the draft? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think well, if we could get that, that document from you today mm -hmm. that you have from, um, from today, Leah, uh, Harm and I will set up some time to go through it and okay. then um bring that back to you all in the no well actually yeah into the november meeting right. and then get that to to review and then in the just if there are any of the tweaks in the december meeting we will talk about those tweaks we'll and or we'll hope actually hopefully we'll approve it then right we can try out the consent agenda <laughs> yeah, nobody's <laughs> screwed up. <laughs> uh, is there, are there any other concluding remarks or questions that we need to deal with at the moment? Seeing and hearing none, thank you all very much. Uh, appreciate it, and, and I, I hope that all of you uh, derive some some uh, benefit from, from our conversations. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome to come back next week. <laughs> <laughs>